Hello, hello, everyone. Hello there. You're live, so don't say anything funny. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> or whatever time zone you're in, hello. Of course, <laughs> of course, of course. Hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for Clancy, who we'll see in a little bit. All right, so welcome everyone to the exam. There's my camera, I have two, so I have to. Welcome to the exam expert day 2020. Um, so I think Tobias will be doing the introduction but I'm just stealing it away from him uh, because I'm so excited and I want to um, welcome you. And uh, we're going to have an awesome day. Um, again, I think Tobias will uh, tell you a little bit about the history, but we are um, um, a very local, well, little-ish event. Uh, and now we get to do this online, which is pretty awesome. Um, it's also sad because, you know, one of the big powers I think we had with our exam expert day uh, or expert day for examin, if you like, uh, is that we had a great vibe going and uh, it was all friends hanging out, doing cool stuff, talking examin and, and all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, the, the situation in the world forces us to do this, uh, which has some advantages, which has some disadvantages, but we will make the best out of it anyway, right? So, um, Tobias, take it away, and uh, I hope you will have a fun day to come. Tobias All is still right. there. I'll try to share my screen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Probably the most asked question lately. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, I'm behind the logo. Hello. Oh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> so I can see anything anymore except my presentation. So you'll have to tell me if everything's good. Fantastic. Perfect. Okay, then uh, I'll start right away. So for welcome everybody. I think uh, Gerald already said that. Um, for those who are here for the first time, um, and as Jell already said, uh, now from around the world, this event was very local before and uh, is available to everybody right now. We started out in 2016 uh, after um, uh, Zemrin Dev Day. Uh, maybe some of you rem remember those, and uh, a couple of uh, people um, thought about that we would want something like that, an event for people who already know a bit more about Xamarin. And it was first planned as a barbecue in the backyard of uh, Thomas, uh, another friend who unfortunately changed to the Flutter side. Um, but when we reached out to the community, we very rapidly uh, found out that the backyard of uh, Thomas's house would probably not fit everyone. So we reached out uh, to Robin Manuel Thiel from uh, Microsoft and uh, he offered us that we could use the Microsoft uh, facilities in Cologne, which we have been using mostly now in the, in the last years. Um, not this year, obviously. Um, yeah, so, but uh, that's how we started planning in 2016. And we had our first Xamarin Expert Day in 2017 at the Microsoft uh, facilities. We didn't have a logo or anything. <laughs> I think our timetables were only printed out. And um, yeah, and if I remember correctly, we had about 40 people back then. Um, yeah, but uh, since then we had uh, five Zem Expert Days. Uh, it's the fourth year that we're doing this. Um, so five because we had one year we had one in Munich and one in Cologne. And um, yeah, we've we've grown a lot. Uh, last year we actually exceeded the capacity of uh, capacities of uh, Microsoft in in Cologne, uh, and we had to leave some people out that were on the waiting list, unfortunately. So we actually thought about growing bigger this year, but then came this nasty virus and uh, changed everything. But on the other hand, we have the chance to uh, have all of you now uh, on the stream and uh, all the experts from around the world while traveling, which is also nice. All right, 
So we can start with the presentation. Thank you to our volunteers. Maybe you already saw them in the chat. Kyle, Luz, Mark and Steven uh, will help us out uh, today and uh, do the moderation in the chat. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Luz. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Steven. Thanks, Kai, um, for helping us. You probably already uh, saw the great lineup of people. We'll uh, hear James uh, in a couple of minutes. And you probably also saw the other speakers. It's a, it's a really great lineup from around the world. Um, and we're really happy to have all of you. Thank you, too, for preparing this. And there's another couple of uh, people that you might already have seen today. <clears throat> Glenn, Gerald, Carrie, and uh, me, we've been preparing this for yeah, pretty much uh, a year now. We're also happy this uh, came together. Um, but we couldn't have done it without our sponsors. Um, that's uh, JetBrains, MSG, Zinc Fusion, and Manning Publications. They will also give away a couple of, or we will give away a couple of things um, later on, on behalf of them. JetBrains uh, has given us some licenses to raffle away. Um, MSG will give away some water bottles. Uh, Sync Fusion has also a couple of licenses. And when we have a couple of uh, ebooks from many publications that we will raffle away at the end of the stream. Benny is also giving a discount for everyone on all their products, be it uh, digital or non-digital, um, with the discount code that I uh, underlined here. You get 35% discount today, and uh, I think it's valid for a month. Um, so checked out their their uh, their books, and uh, if you ever thought about uh, buying a book, maybe now's a good time to do so. Syncfusion will give away a um, full commercial license or rather three full commercial license for their uh, Xamarin UI controls. Um, they have a um, community edition or say an Essentials Studio, I don't recall the, the exact name, but uh, it is free for um, non-profit and I think startups. Um, today we're going to give away three licenses for the for the full-blown commercial edition um, that you can use for anything uh, in any size of, of company. So for um, the slides and everything that uh, you see today, we'll uh, put this together uh, on GitHub. Maybe if you've already seen it, if you're following our uh, account, um, we'll also display the URL again later at the end. Um, at Sam Expert Day 2020, we'll compile all the, the links, uh, slides, and so on um, after the event, and also where you can watch the videos. We do have a code of conduct. Um, please feel free to, to read it. Um, basically, as Jim Bennett put it at one of the uh, conferences, don't be an ass or we'll kick you out. Uh, it's the short version. Uh, be nice, behave yourselves uh, in the chat. And uh, we actually never had to do this. And I hope today is not going to be the day we have to start. Um, but yeah. And this is the link to our raffle. If you want to win something, uh, I think we'll also have it during the event uh, at some point if you missed to uh, get the URL right now. You can register yourself and we'll pick some lucky winners at the end of the event. And that's about everything I have to say. Enjoy the day. I hope you'll have fun and uh, I know I will. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to all the cool sessions from the speakers. Um, and I'll hand back to Gerald. Yay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I don't think there is anyone else, uh, anything else, basically. 
Uh, Luz already posted the, uh, I see a lot of great chat messages. Luz already posted the link from the uh, raffle. So be sure to check that out. It's going to be very cool. We are not using your uh, data for anything else than just giving you goodies. So that's going to be good. Uh, your data will be deleted right after because, you know, it's stored in Germany and they're very strict about it. So uh, it, it's it's not going anywhere. Um, anything else? I, like Tobias said, just enjoy the day. Uh, I know I will as well. It's going to be very, very awesome. Um, I also got a question like, hey, will this be available after? The full stream will stay available after this uh, uh, go live thing stopped at this exact URL that you're watching it now. Um, and later today, it's, it's my channel, so I will uh, cut them up, put them in a nice playlist, and you can um, review them there. So it won't go away unless the uh, speaker says, I did a terrible job. Which we're which which no speaker will uh, will do. Uh, they I'm going to have to take it out, of course, because they are the boss, you know. Uh, but other than that, they will be on there. Uh, did we do 15 minutes yet? No, we have four minutes. So what I'm going to talk about? No, I'm kidding. Let's just give those four minutes to James. I think unless uh, Carrie or Glenn wants to say anything. No, thank you guys. Enjoy the day. Yes, enjoy, enjoy. the day. And, uh, I'll hand it off to James, and uh, we will all see you later. Hello, everyone. Hey. Oh, all right. Is Gerald coming or am I just talking? I think I'm just talking. Sorry, I'm confusing you. Back. You're on. Let's Hello. go. <laughs> all right. See, it's a great way to waste those four extra minutes they gave me. Well, thank you guys for having me. And I'm really excited to be um, talking. Yes. That is exactly right, Kim. This is COVID hair. I have not got a haircut in so long. And yes, I am actually on Mountain Dew right now because I'm tired and I wanted to be awake and excited. So it helps. It really does help. All right. Well, I'm excited to be here. I'm really sad I didn't actually get to travel to Europe to do this talk. That would have been way more fun than instead of doing this in my office. But no big deal. It's how it is. All right. Um, so just a little bit about my presentation style. I'm not a slides guy. I don't like slides. I have an intro slide that has my name and stuff on it, but I'm probably not even going to use it. I might do it as the outro one. I'm paying attention to chat to the best of my ability. Please ask questions. Feel free at any point to ask what's going on and ask for clarification. I saw a question already, like, when will Xamarin support Blend? Probably never, I'm sorry, probably never, just how it is. So I'll be as honest as I can and answer as many questions as possible. My glowing Death Star is awesome, I love it. Thank you for noticing. Um, yes, I'm gonna reorganize my office, but I'm gonna make sure that my Death Star stays in camera. So yes, it is awesome. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about Maui, the topic everyone wants to talk about. and. I can take this as deep as you guys want to go. Ask as many questions as you want. And we'll ex I can explain as much as I can about the architecture and how things work, why. Um, I think the why is the important part. So I want to cover why as much as possible. So feel free to ask that. If I didn't answer it well enough, say why. And I'll dig in more. So just to get started, um, my name is James Clancy. I probably should have started with that. Um, MAUI is an acronym. It is for multi-application user interface. I can never remember. Um, but yeah, um, MAUI will support XAML, absolutely. And when can we do custom controls with Figma? I actually have a branch of Comet that shows custom controls in Figma. And we can look at some of that today because some of that type of things are some of the advent or benefits to doing MAUI. So, Super exciting. Um, all right, so let's talk a tad bit. Um, sorry, I was I was originally saying who I am. I should have actually started that way. I'm James Clancy. I'm a PM architect at Microsoft. And I've been with Xamarin since 2011 is when I joined the company. And Joe, of course, joined Microsoft through the acquisition. Um, I am one of the original authors of Xamarin Forms. I have done lots of random things at Xamarin and worked on pretty much every part of the product. So um, I can try and answer questions. Um, so let's start by Xamarin Forms, just to do a little bit of the groundwork really quick to explain what MAUI is and why, because we're already getting questions about that in chat. So let's talk Xamarin Forms architecture. 
Right now, the Xamarin Forms library has um, the Xamarin Forms core library. It's the one that you write against. It's the one that you do your XAML against. It has buttons, labels, pages, all the things like that you're used to. And it uses an MVVM pattern. On top of that, you have the Xamarin platforms layers, which are like Xamarin or that uh, Xamarinforms.ios, Xamarinforms.android.wpf, dot whatever, right? Those bring in this platform specific code, like how to present a button on those platforms. And right now, there's a the way that um, the inheritance is, is there's the core layer, Xamarin Forms, which has the buttons and things like that. XAML depends on that. And then on top of that, there's the platform layers that depends on core. MAUI is a brand new architecture. Now, the big thing is we're not moving, we're not really breaking a lot of things for you. Our goal is to break as little things as possible for you while doing this new architecture. So with the new you might, I mean, all you're really gonna have to do right now, the goal is to make it to where all you have to do is change a couple namespaces and your apps should compile. We should be able to write a script that'll do it for you. But there's a lot of big changes coming in Maui. The biggest one is right now we have Xamarin Core, um, the core library, the Xamarin Forms Core, which is the root library. And then the renderers are on top of that. With the new architecture, we're flipping that. It's complete turnaround. Xamarin forms is going to be a new layer the new maui layer will yes i will show code and show architecture i'm just trying to explain it a little bit first so forms in its current form is going to be renamed maui that's the plan and but think about you i'm just going to call it forms for now right because that's what you're used to your mvvm layer we're just going to call that forms for the duration of the stock so you're keeping your MVVM, you're keeping your SAML. If we rename it to Maui, it is what it is, but let's just go with that. So that's the forms layer. Now what we're gonna do though is forms is gonna now depend on Maui core. Now, let me share my screen and oops, sorry, I did not mean to bang my mic. Sorry if that was loud and obnoxious. Let's jump over to an, a Maui sample. Now this is all early, early stuff. The project structure is going to be even simpler. We're still waiting on .NET features from to make this better, so that way our project structure is better, so your project structure will be better. But this has eventually, inside of this MAUI, this MAUI core, um, this is the root. It has everything in it. It will have renderers. And actually, we have changed our mind and yeah, I don't know if, yeah, someone could move the logo. I don't know. I can try moving things around. Scroll, scroll. Oops, wrong hotkey. I can make things bigger. All right. Hey, thanks for removing the logo. Awesome. Really nice. All right. So we have this Maui core library. You'll notice this is, this is all early prototype stuff. This is not the exact solution. If you actually want to see the exact solution come into play, I will sh I'll put some URLs in here. We'll actually look at some pull requests that are making this happen now, which is pretty exciting. The pull requests are already starting. All right, so inside of Maui core, you'll notice right now there's renderers. We've already changed our mind and we're calling these handlers. So the new things are called handlers. Handlers is better anyway. All right. Now you'll notice in here, we have, oops, let me expand this out. And for in here, for a button, we have three different files. So this is the root project now. The button renderers are what Xamarin Forms buttons are gonna depend on, which is kind of crazy and kind of weird, but it allows a lot of new things, a lot of new things. Because of this, you can now you shouldn't have to create custom renderers. I am pretty sure that unless you're um, a control vendor and you're building custom, really crazy custom controls and graphs and charts or all the awesome Telerik controls, if you're not Telerik, you're probably not going to be building custom renderers. That is the most exciting thing about the new architecture. Custom renderers hopefully are a thing of the past, and I'll show you why. So we have this new button renderer layer, this or this new renderer layer. Like I said, we've already renamed it to handlers. If we look at a pull request, this is a current pull request for slider handlers. 
If we look at our slider handlers, handler, if we actually go to the handle, this is a real pull request, which is in right now. Yes, I will zoom in my code when I go back. So, um, but so yes, they're renamed handlers now, which I'm really excited about. Um, but let's look at what these handlers have. These handlers have this property mapper in it. And let me, is my code still too small? I can make it big. We can go big. Go big or go home. I'm already home. So we're going big. All right. So renderers or handlers, sorry, I'm going to call them handlers because that's their new name, even though my codes in front of me says renderers. Ignore that. Handlers. So handlers have this mapper concept. Mappers are awesome. So how a button does its thing and how properties work are all based on mappers. If you look at old Xamarin form code, old Xamarin forms code, you have that. Um, we actually probably have some in here. Let's look at, let's find a renderer. Hit enter enough, we'll find it. All right. So the old renderers, there's this. No, come on. You're not going to show me that. Hmm. He's not showing it to me. I was really hoping. Let's just open this file. Um, let's view file. So inside of a renderer, renderers have this big on element changed. They go through and they set all these things. And then they call all these update maximum, update minimum, update value, update slider colors, update tap gesture recognizers. Now, whenever a value changes, guess what we do? We have this whole little switch statement. So we're doing the same thing twice. Because when you first set it up, you need to call all these. When the properties change, and guess what? We have to call those again. So this new thing we have, the mapper, takes care of this for us. So if you have a mapper and you say, when this property text changes, call this function. This function is not platform specific. Notice it's all interfaces. So awesome. This knows nothing about forms. This just knows you have a button and you have a renderer. Okay. So now that you have a button and a render, what it's going to do is when you first set the element or it does that initial of tying a renderer to an element, it's going to go ahead and call everything in there. Because guess what? You need to. And now when any of those things change, it's going to call those as well. Now, this makes a lot of sense, especially if you want to do something custom. How in the world do you inject into this if you want to do something custom? You want it to call a property for you on your control when it's initialized or the element set. You have to come in subclass renderers, register them, do all that nonsense. Well, I have this new this little test project going on. I can go into a sample. Granted, this sample stuff is going to collapse down to be one project. We just don't have the work done yet to do that, but that's what's going to happen. Um, yes, it's dependency injectionist. You'll get some feelings of that, except nothing is magical. It's all explicit. So that's one thing I really like about it is it's very explicit how it works. So if I go into this My App, I can jump into here and I can mess with this thing. Right. So right now I have a button that's going to happen. What I can do is I can call button handler, not renderer, handler, but it'll probably be button handler dot mapper. We'll figure it out. And now in here I can say my awesome property. All right. My awesome property. And if that thing's a bindable property, you're automatically going to um, renderer view. Now, console.writeLine. Uh, do we not have system? All right, let me do hotkeys. Actually, I don't have keycaster on. I'm going to do this in case I code. That way you guys can see my hotkeys. I just got to do some funky things to get it in a good spot. That looks good. So you can see my hotkeys. I like learning people's hotkeys. All right, so we can do a right line in here. And now, hey, guys, this works without a custom renderer. All right. Now, 
This method is going to get called one time and one time only. The reason is we haven't hooked this up to a up to um, a bindable property or anything like that. Because if you do a bindable property, whenever that update fires, it's going to fire that as well. Um, yes, Keycaster is free and it's great. But guess what? I now just got this thing, this method that's sent, and it's going to pass me in the renderer. And if we look at this renderer. It's our button renderer. And this view is a Xamarin Forms button. Yes, it's of the type of that interface, but look, this is a Xamarin Forms button. It has every property you're expecting, all of them. And so now I'm given the native view, which is on this renderer. So I get this renderer and come on, debugger, show me the properties. There we go. All right, I can go into this and I can go to the native view and even to go to the typed native view, and it's going to be a UI button. I have the UI button, and I have the view right there in shared code. All right. If that's not exciting, I don't know what is. Now, on top of that, let's say you don't like how we handle something. In this case, in the old form stuff, how would you ever change update maximum or update value? What if you want to do some funky math in there for the update value or the slide colors? You want to inject in and do awesome gradients because that's how you roll and your app is full of gradients. What you can do, button renderer dot button mapper. Now do name of but um I button dot pick out any property you want. Background color. Thank you. I don't want you to set the background color. I want to do it because I'm building debug rainbows and I want to randomly pick a color for every single button. Do you see how much easier this would be to write a library like that? I just injected it at the renderer level. In my shared code library, this is not iOS app, guys. You'll notice net standard, iOS, Xamarin, I can switch between those. This lets you inject in without doing anything funky. And I can do if iOS or .NET standard or whatever. And if I'm in, let's switch this to iOS. Um, let's go to if iOS. Let me do that again. Now I get, now you'll notice I'm getting all my iOS completions. And if I can say var button equals v, um, sorry, um, we'll want to do r dot native view as UI button. And I can even bring in UI kit. Actually, I spelled UI kit wrong. Let's try that again. UI kit button. So now, at that point, I have a native button. I can do whatever I want with it. I can set background color to an image because we don't support images. But guess what? I do, and I know that that interface, I can even do a check if if I have my own button type, I can do if, or I'll just do var my button equals V as my awesome button, because I created my own subclass of button, I now have that type. And I can say if button is, if, my button is not equal to null, do that, and then I can grab off any properties I want, and I can set things based off those properties. So you're now instantly unlocked, and you can do anything you want to the native layer without doing a custom renderer. No more, every time I have to render or register a custom renderer, I have to think, what's that syntax? Where's that attribute? Another benefit to that is startup time. We all know startup time, especially on Android. Why? Because we're searching for custom attributes and we're finding them to then register them. That's out the window. It's not needed anymore. We don't need it. We don't need to use custom renders in that way. So we're actually getting rid of those attributes as how we register things. We're going to this, you'll see this layer right here where we're injecting, because this prototype didn't have any layouts. So we had our own dummy layout render. So this is the this is the syntax you'll use. And so third party libraries will have an init handler. So they'll just do like my teller controls dot init or whatever, or any of these third party ones. You have to do that anyway, or else the linker removes those DLLs. So the initialize will do that. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, the bots, the bots are always, always. I'm sorry, the message is deleted. I wish I could see it. I'm sorry. All right. But you can jump, like I said, you can inject in at the native level. And if you need to do a custom renderer, you still can. It's right there. It's a one line. The other benefit of doing this in order, you do it in the order you want, you know the order they're going to be called out. Super awesome. All right. So that's what you guys wanted to see right away was some of the stuff on how some of these are, are very different. Oh, man. Well, you should be able to use lots of exclamation points. Bots shouldn't care about that. All right. So we have a lot of power when it comes to these. And you can easily inject in and do some things. Now, I know I was asked about Figma stuff earlier, right? Let's actually, I'm just going to go crazy here. Let's go, oh, I'm even on the right branch. Hopefully you guys have all heard of Comet, right? Anyone not heard of Comet? All right, well, let me launch Comet. And I'm hoping no one says no in chat. Let's don't save that. Well, let's jump into there. So Comet has a lot of inspiration for all this new Maui stuff. Oh, you, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. All right, so Comet is one of my little pet projects. And I will link you guys. Hopefully, I have the power to link. Let me, let me see if I can paste from one computer to the next. No, it says I can't. The bot won't let me. Maybe a mod can do it. I know Luce has the URLs. Luce will do it. She's amazing. All right, check it out, though. Um, you will notice in here... Comet has the old architecture, similar to forms, how one relates in the other one. Um, or the dependency is the same order to where there's the Comet core and then there's the platforms. We've decided to switch those around because Comet is an MVU for C Sharp. It's something you can play with now, and it's what's heavily inspiring what will become Maui.MVU. And I'm still working on it, still experimenting with it. It has C Sharp hot reload, which is really fun. Um, but we were asked about Figma stuff. Oh, thanks, Luz. Thanks so much. So we're asked, I was asked about Figma things, right? How are we going to take Figma controls and bring them in? Well, inside of Comet, Comet has handlers. That's why I'm excited about the handler name. Um, so that's where handlers come from was actually what we named them Comet. So people then confu get confused with um, renderers and the negative connotations of renderers. Um, yes, this will work on WPF for D or Windows. I don't know. Right now, our target is probably going to do UWP or WinUI. WinUI is what's most likely going to be. Right now, all of this is talking about the future and what's going to happen. And so all these projects are, are working about, are working, are going around, and we're all waiting for each other on different dependencies. But that's what it should be. Um, so uh, Microsoft should focus on a modern innovation so I completely agree. What we're doing is our goal with Maui, and this talk is on Maui, and Maui, kind of the inner workings of what's happening with .NET Maui. Um, so our goal is to try and break people who are doing their existing XAML and MVVM apps as little as possible, but still enable you to move forward to an MVU style pattern if that's what you so choose. That's another reason why we're doing this big re-architecture to where we're replacing the dependencies and making the handler layer be the root layer. So if we have all these handlers which use interfaces, guess what this means for something like Comet or MVU? I can now build an entirely new UI paradigm that works very differently. It has very different... Um, very different things that work very differently. And if you're looking at how MVU looks, if I look at one of these samples really quick, let's go to a sample. And actually, let's go to a Skia sample, since you guys are asking me about it. But you'll notice things work very, very differently. That's how you declare UI. This is how you declare a list. It's all from C Sharp. And it works very differently because there's a body which returns the view. And so at any point, if something changes, we can reevaluate this body and 
redo everything. And yes, there will be documentation. Microsoft loves documentation. Um, you can't do UI frameworks without documentation. So absolutely, there will be documentation. So MVU works very differently. And MVU uses different controls. If we look at how, let's look at a clip sample. Check this out. I can just say, hey, image, let's add a clip shape to you. Let's add an overlay. Let's do a shadow. Now, a couple things that are different about this, if we look at a, how things work, and even like with a button, if we're doing a button sample, I say, hey, button, the only properties I have on that, I don't even have properties really. A button, come on, you can do it, Visual Studio. A button has two properties, only two properties, text and a click. That's it. And they're read only. You can only set them via the constructor. Well. How do you style this thing? All of that happens through Fluent Extensions. So dot, let's do font. And so these things are very simple. And in the end, with Comet, I was rewriting that renderer there and making it into a handler, making handlers, and they were very different. But now with the new Maui architecture, I can do something that works very differently and base them off those existing handlers. Now, those handlers are going to be shared by Xamarin Forms. They're going to be shared, shared by um, Maui's MVU. Whatever framework pattern comes in the next five years, next two years. If you have this new idea for an entirely new framework and how you want to design and build apps, you can do that and base it off our renderers. And now it's cross platform and you don't have to deal with all that headache. You don't. And any custom controls that people wrote for that handler layer, like the Telerik controls, are all just going to magically work for you. You'll get them in your toolkit, and they're not going to have to do any work to do it. That's exciting. That is the promise of this. So we can future-proof the investments you guys put into there. Another thing about it is you can mix and match these paradigms because in the end, they're all going to the same exact handler layer. That's exciting as well. So you can write your app partially in MVU, partially in MVVM, whatever thing comes next, and it'll just work. That's so much fun. That's what's really exciting. Now, I went into this library because I was asked about Skia. I mean, I was asked about Figma controls. So there is a repo that we're working on. Um, call, it's was public. It was made not public. It will be made public again. They're working through all of the open source stuff that we have to deal with. Um, so actually, you're asking about pointer down, style of a button. Great, great thing. Great things to ask about. So a lot of these things in the States, things are going to work differently based on where they're running. Um, so. As far as, um, so let's look at Comet and what we have in Skia. So I have some handlers in here. And let's first start by looking at these fluent, like I have these fluent ones. You'll notice these fluent ones have this handler.designer. Dot designer, guys. This code is 100% generated. Let me make sure this thing runs really quick. Let me, I didn't try running this because I wasn't planning on showing it. So. Let me just make sure I have the Fluent stuff enabled. I No, no, I do. I think the Fluent ones are enabled. We'll find out really quick. Oh, I even have this the style applied. All right. So this code, if we go back to this, was 100% generated from Figma. I was actually did this live on stream a couple weeks ago. Maybe it's been like three weeks ago. I don't remember. I was working on this live on stream. Now, if this runs, which I hope it will, um, and will we have composable lower level components similar to Flutter widgets? Um, that is all stuff that we're still designing. Um, I don't know if we've decided on that. We should be able to. Right now in, in Comet, the radio button is a composite control made of widgets. So there should be no reason that we can't continue doing things like that. There's lots of things that we've done in Comet that is moving into, oh, huh, it's on the one that's on the other screen. I'm like, why isn't it launching? So yes, we should be able to. All right. Um, so let's look at this. And that is working. So this code, 
Um, is this the right one? I don't know. That's not the right one. Let me just verify. I'm going to put a breakpoint in here and see if this drawing code is ever called. Which one is that? That is progress. OK, it's being called. Check this out. Now, this code, you'll notice that animation, if we look at that toggle, I did not write animation code. This is a generic thing I wrote, which doesn't tell you how to animate this stuff. All it does is when the value changes, it says, hey, toggle and this on the set state, says to, hey, animate, set the variable to true or false. That's it. Now, this code comes from Figma. This is coming from the Figma Fluent UI design spec from Microsoft, and it auto-generated this, and it says, hey, for this state, for on, for off, this is the colors, and this is the location. So that circle, that handle rect, and it automatically will mix all these layers and do everything. I didn't draw any, I did not write any of this code. 100% generated from Figma, and you can just go, it's fully animated. And I did not write animation code. The only thing I said was animate the states, and it automatically figured out what states do what layers, and then animated the control. So, Yes, we will have animated Figma stuff. This stuff is coming, and we're working on it. All right. And you'll also notice if I, right now, if I was to switch to my Skia samples, the, which is the material UI, the button has all the different states. I can actually just show you that code for a button handler. This does all of that based on the states. All it has to do is it will just go and ask for the color based on the state. And this was, I wrote this drawing code. This is 100% written drawn code. But all I'm doing is drawing shapes. So it's super, super easy. And I do say, hey, draw the background radius to where I make the radius, because I do the little fill, like you see if you're long pressing. And fully animated code just by saying, hey, lerp between the, the radius. Fully animated. All right. Um, and yes, we are going to be working. I see. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to go through questions. I'm missing things. Um, yes, we're going to be working with the C Sharp team. Um, Mads is going to be helping us to make this look better. There's, I mean, there's lots of things we want to do to make this nicer. All these news and enums. We're going to make this thing nicer. This is going to get better. Mads has a tons of tons of ideas to make this better. It's going to get cleaner. All right. Any other questions I missed? So styling things like pointer down style. Styles are things that we've been talking about in some of our meetings with the forum slash Maui teams, because they're the ones who are working on that. We're working on something that should work for regardless. Um, I Like I said, I'm doing that. My, I showed you the state changes. As state changes by clicking, I even have hovered state in here. It does that. So on a desktop, you get hovered, but you won't get hovered on mobile, because that doesn't make sense. So we're working on things like that. Um, how will updates work in detail? Um, so updates as far as for as far as MVU works, um, really simple. Right now, I'm trying to ditch this. I'm hoping I can ditch this. So right now, I have a thing called a binding object. It's a little bit confusing because there's a binding object in forms, but you can do this, or you can implement a new interface called I notify property red, which subclasses I notify property changed. If you have if you use this class, all you have to do is just say, hey, I've got a state. Or you can just do state for a primitive. And my binding object, every time I use that, it's going to automatically update for me. I don't have to do anything as far as bindings go. I just use this class of that binding object. And it's going to automatically data bind everything in here for me. It's going to recall this function to set the text. Um, when this one right here, this label is going to automatically update whenever state.txt changed. It just will. So you don't have to think about data binding. It's going to re-execute this body. It's going to re-data bind the functions. It just is going to work for you, which is really, really nice. So if you use a bindable type object, it's just going to work as your data models. Done. Um, all right. Which So Right now, MVU has actually is actually better. So the question is being asked about like Dart does things where they do builds to reduce the GC calls. The MVU stuff 
Um, I actually get told that Comet slash the Maui MVU is not real MVU because I cheat and I made it more performant. So what should happen is every time you change something in the state, it should set the state and it should call this build method and then diff the entire tree. That's pure MVU. We don't do that. I don't diff the tree if I don't have to. There's lots of things that I do to determine if I should have to diff the whole tree or not. And I even tell you, I'm diffing the tree. I do it in debug mode. I give you a warning. And I think we can do some like Roslyn analyzers to tell you, you're doing something you shouldn't do. Right now, looking at this text method, if I was to remove this so it's not a lambda, this, oh, it's trying to hot reload and I've had breakpoints because I was deep fixing hot reload. Let me just stop right now. So right now, this text, whenever state.txt changes, I'm going to have to diff the whole tree to figure out what happened with that label. And I'm going to tell you, OK, your label is passing in um, the string. And I don't know how to create the string for you when text changes. Please switch it to a lambda. Now I know how to update this label because I know this state.txt was used on this label. So whenever it changes, you know, just call the lambda again. And so that is not going to have to recreate all these objects. We're not going to have to recreate the whole tree and diff it. So there's lots that have been done to prevent this whole diffing the tree. And so I'm going to avoid diffing the tree whenever possible. And yes, technically it's not pure MVU because of that, but I don't care. I care more about performance. So it works just like MVU. I mean, and we can turn off that diffing mode. I mean, we can put it into full diff mode every time, but so it's true MVU, but I don't want to. Uh, but yeah, so you will see these automatically update, so I don't have to recreate all those objects. So, all right. Any other questions? Did I miss any? Any moderators? Did you notice I missed something? Hopefully not. All right. So. Like I saying, with the MVU, it's going to enable us to, I mean, sorry, not MVU. With the new Maui handler architecture, it's going to enable us to do new things simpler and easier. And right now, to do this prototype and this experiment with Comet, it was a lot of work. Because not only did I have to come up with the new syntax, and I had to come up with the diffing and hot reload and all these things like that. I had to build that new cross-platform UI layer. And I'm not going to have to do that anymore. Um, Flutter's MVU is very similar to what I'm doing here. And it's pretty performant, but they have some tricks that they're doing as well. Um, but Fabulous is pure MVU. And you'll notice a speed difference between Fabulous and Comet because I'm cheating. So. Also, though, if any of you guys have been using the um, Blazor bindings, the Blazor bindings will be able to switch ahead as well. I mean, get some speed boosts ahead as well. Because right now, in order to do the Blazor bindings, they're binding to Xamarin Forms. Um, and all of that, um, sorry, getting struck by chat. All the things that that's doing is it binds to Xamarin Forms. And it has a lot of things in Xamarin Forms that it doesn't use and doesn't need. And same with Fabulous. Fabulous does the same thing. So it adds an extra weight and an extra layer. And now the new the Blazor bindings will be able to go straight to the handler layer and eliminate all the XAML, all the binding, all the things like that that Blazor doesn't need. And so it's going to be faster, a lot faster. So this enables us to let's try out new patterns. Let's come out with come out with new UI paradigms. And we can do a lot more experiments at Microsoft and try new things cheaper, faster, and easier so we can see what type of things developers like. Well, um, you guys will be empowered to build your own UI framework without having to do everything, which is just going to make your life better. Um, is the code which parses and all this? Yes, this whole repo was linked earlier by um, Luce. It's just GitHub slash Clancy slash comment. So you have access to this. So would there be a toolbox for elements? 
So there's a lot of interesting things. Right now, um, there's next to no tooling around Comet or MVU. More of that will come. Right now, a lot of the stuff has been around, um, a lot of that has been around Hot Reload. That's the only tooling I've built for this. There's an extension for Visual Studio for Windows and Mac and also VS Code. So you can test out Comet in VS Code. That's actually what was used at Build to show off the Maui MVU stuff and all the Maui stuff at Build was it was using the Comet plugins. So you can play with some of that stuff now. Um, so yeah, if you're a XAML guy, stick with XAML. No, that's the beautiful thing about this is you can mix and match and switch and do what you like. Um, so I think you read that React Docs that recreate the UI type doesn't affect the format. People, so it depends on what you're doing, um, whether or not recreating the UI and diffing it is a performance hit. What device are you running on? Are you running on a brand new iPhone? Guess what? You can do what you want. Those things are fast. They're faster than most people's computers anymore. Are you targeting markets that have older Android devices? Ha, it's going to matter, that diffing. Things like that really start to matter. And some of my prototypes, when I'm doing stuff, and I'm doing it on iOS and the simulator and on my brand new iPhone, I'm like, this thing is amazing. I now run my prototypes on some of my old Androids sitting in my closet, and I want to cry because I'm like, ah, I see the delay. I see a black screen. I see a hang. So it depends on what you're targeting. Now, which performance, which um, paradigms would be more performant? You could write either one to be the most performant. It depends on what you're doing and how you're doing things. There's lots of things I've done in Comet to make it more performant. The handler architecture is more performant in Comet. But guess what? Maui um, is getting that. And so Forms is getting that. So that new architecture is going to be more performance on all of them, which is really exciting. So they're all going to have the same performance layout and render layer. Now, what they do under the hood, there are going to be some differences. Um, I think Comet, of course, I'm going to say Comet's going to be the fastest because I'm going to make sure of that, right? Um, but it depends on what you're doing and how you're architecting your app because there's things you can do to make any app non-performant, and I'm trying to remove as many of those as possible from Comet so you don't make those mistakes. But in the end, like I said, if you're doing, um, if you're passing this stuff in wrong, it's going to be not performant because it's going to have to diff, but it's going to yell at you and it's going to tell you, please don't do this. This is not smart. And eventually I, I might make those be like really big, crazy warnings yelling at you not to do that. And so there's things that I can do and detect so you don't make those mistakes. And I'm going to do as many of those as possible. I'm also looking, um, yes, performance boost is going to happen to XAML code as well. Everyone's getting performance boosts with Maui. The new architecture is faster. And so everyone is getting performance boost. Everyone's getting a startup boost. So everyone's getting those boosts across the board. Everyone's getting those. I'm running out of time, um, but everyone will get those boosts, I promise. It's awesome. We're setting up performance tests. So we'll be able to show you those metrics as we work on it, and it's going to get better. Um, I was explaining something, and I totally forgot what trail I was working on. Um, is XAML supported with MVU? No. XAML and MVU are very different. They behave differently. I don't know how that would even work or what benefit you would get from that. So you can mix and match and put a MVU control inside of XAML or a XAML control inside of MVU. But past that, no. Like, I don't know. Um, oh, right, code generators. So I'm working on deal, I'm learning code generators. And I'm working with code generators. I think that there's a lot of things I can do because these build methods are going to be your biggest performance hit. If you're doing lots of things that do things like this to where I'm saying, hey, what control should be here? And I switch these in and out, and I have to do bigger, bigger diffs. Um, though the bigger this control gets, and the more you have in here, the more it has to parse for these diffs. With code generators, we can break this up into smaller controls for you. So it's like, oh, you know what? You're going to switch between two different controls here. Let's just nest this in a new, um, new view body. And now we can put this here. So if this thing ever toggles, guess what? All we have to do is... I don't know why it's yelling at me. My code looks good to me. I don't know. That looks good to me. Either way. Oh, 
equals, that's better. All right, so now we can generate this code for you. So we're like, oh, so now if canEdit ever changes, I'm just gonna move it between here. So now I don't have to diff the whole tree. I can just diff this one thing. So there's lots of things like that that we're gonna be working at. Um, as far as targeting web is the question in the chat, something we want to do, something we're looking forward to, something we're gathering feedback on. Um, so inside of Comet, there's a Blazor, um, there's a Blazor back or front end, front end, back end, I don't know what you call it, whichever end, there's a Blazor version. So we've been toying with those things and that's something we want to look at. So, all right, we are down to five minutes. Is there any question? Um, any more questions? Like I said, the idea is with these code generators, we can do things like this, which this will be an instant performance gain. And we can do things like that. So that way, even if you write bad code, we can fix some of it for you. So I'm really excited for code generators. There's gonna be lots of fun things with those. And I think by code generators, I can hopefully get rid of having to write this ugly code. So you could do things similar to what people are doing with, I can't remember the name of that, um, Fadi? Is that how you say it? Foodie, Fadi? I don't know. However you say that thing where you do the I notify property change things. So um, I even have a branch of Comet that does that using code generators. So you don't even need an external thing to do all of that rewriting of IL. It just does it at build time. So it doesn't even need new IL. All right. Um, what am I most happy about this? I'm most happy that it enables new UI paradigms. Um, MVU with C Sharp um, hot reload is so fast. Right now, the current hot reloads in Comet are a few milliseconds. It's definitely, I think they're under 10 milliseconds for doing a full hot reload as I'm typing. And it's so fast that I don't wait for save. I just do it as you type. And if I can't, if I can't show something on screen, I just keep with the old version, which is pretty nice. It's where I have a debounce in there, so it waits like, I can't remember how many milliseconds. It waits X number of milliseconds before hot reloading, but it's instant. So you see your changes happening as you type. And so enabling that type of experience without having to build an entire new cross-platform UI layer is exciting because that now opens us up for further experimentations going forward. That future proofing of cross-platform UI frameworks is really exciting because we have this Blazor native experience that we're doing with the Blazor bindings. There's going to be more things in, in, that we want to build and we want to try out. So I'm excited that we can sh try out more things faster and um, at future proofs, like I said, because the, the Telerix and all of the people who are building all these UI controls don't have to build it over again for whatever new UI paradigm comes along. We can easily just do those. So that's what I'm really excited about, is that future proofing. All right, two minutes. Two minutes, guys. Any more questions? All right, I'm going to do the slide. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm doing a slide. Here is my stuff. Um, I've been bad about Twitch streaming lately and I'm going to do better, but GitHub slash Clancy, Twitter, JT Clancy, um, really easy to get a hold of really ask me questions. I have a discord channel inside the repo for comet. You'll see a discord. I should put that elsewhere. You can join my discord, ask me questions. I am pretty available. So, um, anytime you want to know, let me know. And yeah, you can mix and match these things. That's what we're enabling. As far as the toolbox for elements, right now, there's tooling we want to build. Some of that could be dragging and dropping. I really like Swift UI tooling. I'd like to build some of the stuff that they have. Um, there are no slides, guys. This is my only slide. So I can upload this, but go to my GitHub. It has all that information as well. Hopefully, it's pretty easy to remember. I have at Clancy on the little right there to help with that. Really easy to find. All right, I think it's time for Gerald to interrupt again. Are you coming back? Ta-da! Any there other you. questions? Oh. He's magic, oh. he's back. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, I just appear whenever you say my name. Fancy transition, uh, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're doing a better job than we are. Oh, man. Um, 
So yeah, thank you, James. I'm a little bit distracted with all the other stuff that's going on here right now, but uh, thank you so much. That's why uh, I had to call your name. I know you're busy. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, I see from the reactions that it was a very nice session. I know some of the stuff, but I will definitely watch it back because I'm probably not, horrible, and you're probably gonna have to delete it from the YouTube playlist. <laughs> I mean, it was me again. Um, that's true, also, that's though, true. just to plug, David Orton now is gonna talk more about Maui. I have no idea when. Sometime on the schedule, but I'm going to be asleep, but hopefully you guys won't be. Absolutely, absolutely. So he'll be, I think he is closing off the day, actually. So uh, he'll be in about uh, oh. seven hours or something. So I might be awake. Be awesome job way. Well, there we go. There we go. Who knows? Who knows? Not not that not that much Mountain Dew, right? Then, then you'll be awake all night. Uh, exactly. so thank you so much thank you so much uh, I'm going to take you off right here so we can't hear you anymore sorry about that thanks again uh, your swag package is underway it takes a little bit of time because of all the lockdowns and stuff but uh, it's it's underway so you'll see that thanks again uh, all right so next up we have uh, so let me show the little nice background how do I do that I can't well anyway we're messing with the uh, uh, technique here a little bit um and it probably won't be perfect throughout the rest of the day, but at least we'll have fun, right? So uh, next up, we'll have Conrad, and he's going to show my face on a slider uh, in, in Xamarin. So he's going to show some advanced drawing stuff. Actually, let's just bring him up. There he is, looking beautiful with his fancy camera. I know he yeah. has a nice setup just for this day, so that's amazing. Uh, thank good. you so much for joining us. Yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Conrad, uh, taking the time to, to be with us. You have been... Uh, in the actual in-person event as well, uh, so we've we've spoken to each other uh, a couple of times, and um, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, leave you to it and uh, tell all the people what you're going to talk about. So have fun. Thanks so much. Sorry. Yeah. So um, hey everyone, thanks for joining in. Thanks for having me, and especially thanks to all the organizers for making this possible. Um, I will talk a bit about uh, drawing UI and uh, especially advanced UI in Xamarin. So I will elaborate a bit on this uh, drawing stuff that James already showed. Um, before I start, let's start with me. So I have some slides. Um, this is me. I'm Konrad Müller. I work uh, for a company called Aventus as a software de developer here in Germany. Um, I have now, I think, four or five years of experience with Xamarin, um, but currently work mostly with ASP.NET Core and the backend and also cloud stuff and DevOps and also. Um, you can find me on Twitter and on GitHub. So if you have any questions after this talk or just want to connect, please uh, feel free to reach out to me and I will try to uh, answer all questions or just say hi. Okay, um, before we start, I want to show you um, really what you need this for, what you can utilize uh, this for, what I will show you later. And therefore, I have uh, gathered some samples uh, from the community. So create UIs that are custom drawn. And uh, we'll expand them a bit. Um, the first one is from Kim. You might have you might know this already. Um, this is about this, this beautiful um, temperature gouge here. And as you can see, this is not a, a standard UI from Xamarin or Xamarin Forms. This is a custom UI. So this is really where um, custom drawing comes in. Every time when you want to build a custom control, you can use custom drawing. And this UI is really nice because it's act it's actually interactive. So you can slide this uh, gauge around and uh, set the time, uh, set the temperature. <laughs> so this is really nice. Um, you can find uh, all the samples in, in the links below, and I will also share the slide, uh, these, these slides after the talk so you can find them all. Um, Next thing is uh, something by, by, by John Marie. And I think this is really impressive. This is uh, the, visual, the visual, visual, visualization of the running track. Um, and you can really see pixel perfect where the runner is going and how many turns he will do. <laughs> uh, also, this is animated. This, is, uh, this has multiple graphs which, are in, which interact with each other. So I think this is a really great example uh, that, one, that when you need uh, your, your really custom UI to your use case, can make this all happen with uh, custom drawings. So um, next thing is something that I find this is really impressive. Um, it's by a company called Blue Eye. Uh, they make uh, submarine robot drones. And uh, what's really impressive is that this whole control UI, so the controls which you actually use to control the robot, is uh, also drawn with a custom drawing. 
Um, and you can really see how how interactive this is. It reacts to your touch inputs. It really fits the use, the use case. And that's uh, one of the great benefits of, of custom drawings and of creating the, the controls by yourself is that you can really fit it perfectly um, to the to the use case. Uh, of course, you can not only use it for your use case at the moment, but you can also abstract this and, and reuse it. So there are many libraries which, which use custom drawings uh, to visualize stuff. Like, for example, uh, Microcharts is a really awesome uh, open source library, which is drawing charts. And it's uh, also animatable. It's interactive. It can change on, on binding changes. So this is a really great example. And also a great uh, code example, if you want to dive in, into the code, how this is uh, done. Um, OK, so these are some things that we can do with custom drawings. And next on, and next on I want to explain to you how we can actually, actually uh, custom draw and show you a bit of the basics. So you might ask yourself, OK, what are custom drawings? Are this like I have a canvas, and then I, try, try, and then, and then I just draw, uh, draw strokes on my canvas, and then it will magically appear? And actually, that is, that is exactly what it is. So um, with custom drawings, and when I use a custom 2D drawing library, I have a canvas, which is my screen or my, my, my view. And on this canvas, I can draw my shapes and paths and render my, my controls. Um, our canvas has a, coordinate, has a coordinate system. So it's going from 0, 0 to the size of a screen, for example. Um, in, most, um, frameworks, in most frameworks, I know the, the root point is at 0, 0 in the top left. And then it gets, gets higher when we go down right. And to this canvas, we can now apply our drawing operations. So for example, first of all, we would uh, maybe remove the old drawings, so uh, remove what was shown before, and um, start drawing our new shapes that we need, that we need for our, our control. We can uh, basically draw everything, uh, mostly uh, geometries or, or known shapes, like for example, a circle, which just tells the framework, OK, which coordinates do we want? Uh, where should the thing get drawn? And then we get get uh, drawn there. Uh, we can also uh, add more geometries, so we can combine multiple uh, shapes together. Add, for example, oh, do something. Draw, draw for example, a, a rectangle as, as, at another position, and then make them interact it, with, with each other for uh, in some way. Um, we can also draw more ex, more uh, advanced shapes. Uh, so F, F, when you uh, look at the uh, running sample from Jean Marie. You saw that this was really a, a path which consists of really of of many little segments for each uh, part of the running uh, track, and for that we can just uh, draw a whole path object which consists of 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 multiple segments to the canvas. Um, now, let's go a bit deeper in, 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 into the paths. Um, a path is really just uh, a combination of multiple segments. So we first say, that, say, where should the path start? And say, OK, please move to 0, 0, which, which would be the upper left uh, with a bit of margin. Um, then we can say, OK, please draw a line to the top right. Please draw a line to the bottom right, another line. Maybe add some more advanced shapes, like, for example, an arc. And then uh, combine this back together to the top so that we have a complete shape. We can then put this into a path. And then, again, draw this path on our canvas so that we now have the shape drawn. What we can also do, of course, uh, since, since calculating all these points is a bit hard, is that we can just uh, use vector images, um, because vector images also consist of, of, uh, of uh, vectors and, and path data. So we can take the path data from our vector images and just put them into our, our frameworks. Um, so for example, if I uh, take like uh, one path and add another path so that I add two paths together, and then, I, then I, I draw this combined path. I can, for example, really easily uh, draw the hexagon without having to calculate every position and every uh, arc in there, which would be quite hard. OK. Um, next on, what's also really important and uh, is really cool is, is uh, animations. So when I do an, an, an animation, um, I can really redraw our surface a number of times. So. For example, I have this circle here, and now I want to move the circle down on our canvas. What I would do now is just to say, OK, um, end times. So let's say from a time from 0 to 1 seconds, I want to redraw my 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 surface end times. So that would be our frames per seconds, how many times I, I, I redraw it. 
And then on each frame, I would clear the canvas and redraw the new uh, circle, but with a new Y position. So that would look like this. I have a uh, time span. And then on each execution of our uh, drawing, um, I just move our Y coordinate a bit up or down because our canvas is, expand is extending to the down uh, height. So making animations is, is really easy. It's, it's basically just a, a for loop with, um, with some end. So really easy. Um, of course, when you have a shape and you draw it on your surface, you still have to tell it how it should get drawn because only having a shape doesn't do anything. So first of all, of course, we need some some color. So we can say, okay, what should be the stroke color? Um, and also what should be the the fill color so that we at least have have the shape visualized with the color. And um, the next thing that, that we would mostly do is um add some add some kind add some uh, kind of post-processing. So so for example, uh, anti allies so that we uh, get rid of our uh, so that we can get smooth corners and 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 the smooth roundings. Um, create our image, for example, um, transform it somehow, so that we uh, yeah change the appearance in some way. We can clip stuff in, so maybe subtract a path from our shape, so that we can intersect them with each other, and also add more effects, like for example, a blurring or like a shadow, so that we can really. Uh, Add or add add depth add depth to the con control and uh, make it pop out. That's also really important. Um, yeah, that's basically it. That's, that's 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 basically it. So uh, custom drawn control is is really just a combination of multiple shapes and and the rendering that you apply, and then you just change just change it to the user input. Really easy. Um, now this is all a bit theoretical, so I will uh, dive into two samples for this. Or two frameworks which you, which you can use in Xamarin to uh, execute these custom drawings. Um, and for this use case, I um, brought two samples or two frameworks which are quite different. Um, the first one is the new 2D drawing API in Xamarin Forms called Shapes. So this is a new um, uh, API which is coming in 5.0. It's already in the current preview and already usable and already working really nice. Um, it's supported on iOS, Android, macOS, UW, UWP, and WPF, so on uh, most platforms already. And I guess, and I guess the rest will, will follow shortly. Um, what Xamarin Forms Shapes is is doing is that it's uh, basically a high level abstraction of the native drawing API. So um, all the platforms have their own drawing API which you can use, and uh, Shapes is abstracting this to a uh, easy to use and and Xaml compatible um, uh, way. So that we can easily utilize these native drawings, and this way we also have a really good performance because we use the, the native API. Um, again, you can find links to, to all of that in the uh, slides. Um, so if you want to know anything more, just uh, look at the slides. Um, coming to the features of Xamarin Forms Shapes, uh, we have a few things. Um, we have two types of, of views. We have shapes, which are just basic shapes like ellipses or rectangles, for example, and geometries. And geometries can themselves consist of multiple geometries or, uh, or geometry groups. So really, if you want to combine multiple shapes with each other, we would use a geometry. Um, you have shapes like ellipses, polygons, polylines, lines, and so on and so on. So uh, I think everything that you need for your custom UIs and your custom controls. What's great about uh, Xamarin Forms Shapes is that you can use it from Xaml and from C Sharp. So it's also bindable and, it's, and it also works with Hot Reload or with, with uh, Xaml Hot Reload. That's really nice. Um, and we have a few other features or effects like we have fill rules. So if you have two shapes and they intersect with each other, we, you can define how they should get filled. We have aspects so that we can easily scale the shape to our uh, device size. And we have also masking, so you can mask other views in some forms with these shapes. For example, you can make a, re a really easy rounded or other shaped image by masking an, an image with, with, with a shape. So that's uh, really nice. OK, then this is a bit uh, too much talking now. So let's dive right into a sample, because I think when showing things, it's always best. OK, um, I've set up here my some forms solution. And also the controls that I want to draw now, which is this one. This is a path sample from before. Um, 
I also have my reference code by my side. Okay, so um, what I have here is like just a content view, and in there is, is is our path. So this is a path shape in this example, but path would also be the, the view that we that we would use to to draw um, geometries. This is just a uh, contained in a uh, in a page in a content page, and there we have a little margin. So that's all. And that's then just our root page. So nothing fancy, just a little shape. Okay, let's uh, start by defining our um, uh, data, so our lines and our segments. So this is a bit nested. So we first need uh, to fill in path data. Then next on, you have uh, a path geometry. I can't type. This one consists of multiple figures. We put in a path figure, <laughs> and now the path figure has segments. So this is where we put uh, our data. I will just quickly chat, uh, chat the chat if everything is okay for you. Okay, nobody is complaining. That's good. Um, all right. So um, we can now add multiple segments to this uh, path. Now I will use the same size that we saw in the demo. So I will say that the width is 100 and the height is 200. But since we can later on uh, scale this and make an aspect ratio, um, we can then scale it to the whole screen. So that's really nice. Uh, thanks, Jared. Um, OK, so let's add our first segment. So the first one would be a line, which should go to the top right. Um, and this just has a point. Let's go to uh, 100x and zero y. So we go to the top right, 100, 100 points to the right. We also have to say, where should be our start point, which would be 0, 0, so the top left. And now we only have uh, a path, but not, uh, but don't have anything or any or any any information to to render is, so that we can actually see it. So what I will also do is um, add a little bit of coloring. We have a stroke color, which is yeah, the outline, and then also have a stroke thickness, which is ten, for example. So this is how thick our stroke will be in the end. Okay. So this is all we need to draw our first part of our path. Let's start this right away. OK. Let's pay to the demo gods that everything will work for us. Yeah. And now you can see this, this beautiful black uh, line in here. So this is a bit, bit sad at the moment. Now, as I said, we can uh, change the aspect ratio so that it will get um, Fetch to the size of the screen, but uh, keep its shape. So now it's at least uh, filling the whole screen. And now we can add more shapes to this. So, so, so for example, I, I uh, cut this a bit. So we can add um, the down and the left line to this. This is this, these two. So let's save this and wait for the hot reload to work again. And now we have the first big part of our shape. And what's missing now is this arc. And uh, drawing arcs or drawing all roundings is uh, mostly hard in most 2D, front, 2D drawing frameworks. But uh, some form shapes actually makes this quite easy. So all we need to, uh, need to do is add an arc segment and say, OK, where should the arc end? Um, we want to end it at the bottom minus uh, half of the width. And since, this is, since uh, the height is 200 and the width is 50, um, that would be 150 points to the bottom. So this is this point. And what we also have to say is how big is this whole rectangle where the arc is contained in. So this would be, oops, this would be the size. And that's 50 x 50, because we go 50 to the right and 50, and 50 to the top. And now you see it's already drawn, but it's a bit, <laughs> uh, it's a bit wrong at the moment. So also say, OK, I don't want to rotate in this direction. I want to rotate in this direction. So let's say the sweeping is clockwise. Now we have our little nice arc, which is going on here. OK, uh, what, we, what we can also say is just uh, say is closed. And then the framework will connect our last and first point together. And now we have this whole shape. So what we miss now is just the filling. Uh, so just let's add a filling. And for the filling, we can add another new feature in uh, some forms, which is um, brushes. So we have don't only have colors now, but we also have brushes now. For example, this um, linear gradient brush, which will go just from the top left to bottom right. And you can add multiple colors in there. 
So in my example, it's a, it's a light blue and light red. <laughs> um, and now we have a really nice shape <laughs> with the color uh, gradient on there. So this is not uh, really doing anything now. It's, it's just a path. But um, I think you can imagine how this would then transform into a real control. So um, one big, one bad thing about shapes that I don't like is that um, you define the color and the uh, rendering at the top level. Um, so if you add any more geometries in here, they will all have the same coloring. But in most controls, you don't want to have the, the, the same color for all parts of the control. So for example, if I now want to add another circle in here, as for example, my, my thumb or knob, um, I now have to put this into a grid, for example, and then nest these few, so nest, nest multiple views in there. And for example, now add a circle. I will, yeah, take my sample again. So I will take this ellipse. It has a height with a filling again, which is this time also uh, only color and also is uh, centered vertically and horizontally. So now I have two shapes um, which are uh, layered and I can then make them interactable, for example. So th this is really just the, the sample for uh, some form shapes. Yeah, so if I, ask, if I remove this again, let's say just, yeah. As a default, this will go back to the top left and be small and, and set again. So I keep this. I keep this. OK. Oh, I press some button. Something is not working. OK, everything is good. Um, OK, then let's go back to the presentation because there's more to show. So this is our little demo for, for um, shapes. For example, from shapes, it's a really nice um, UI. And, uh, and I think it's, it's a really great addition to the Xamarin Forms APIs. OK, the next one that I want to show you is something more advanced. Um, and that's, can I click on this? Yes. And that's uh, Skiersharp. So Skiersharp is really rich and, and powerful 2D drawing library. And it's not native to Xamarin Forms, but it's uh, really native to all the platforms. So it supports everything from .NET Core to GTK, you know, all the Xamarin platforms, so everything. Um, Skiersharp is basically uh, bindings uh, of the Skia graphics, graphics library. And uh, Skia is a library by Google, which is, for example, uh, the, the drawing engine which is used in Android, uh, Firefox, Flutter. Um, so really powerful, really, really uh, widely used. And uh, therefore, it's uh, made in C++. So it's also cross-platform compatible. And that's why also all these platforms are, are supported. Um, Skia Sharp does, is not only providing the bindings, but also providing the views and abstractions for this. So um, we can we, we can easily uh, include Skia Sharp into our platforms, uh, whether whether it is uh, some forms is is a GTK Linux application or it is maybe even the backend server side, where I render an image and then send it to the client. For example, that's all possible with uh, Skia Sharp. It's an active uh, development by Microsoft, and they are doing an excellent job and a great job. Uh, it's one of my favorite libraries in existence. So uh, I really hope that this library will, will never die because I really like it. OK. Um, in my presentation, I will work with the version 2.8.2. Um, so this all applies to this version. OK. Uh, let's go to features. And this is a bit more than we saw before in, in shapes. Let me drink a bit. So um, in Skiersharp, as I've uh, 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 shown before, we have one unified API, which is usable across many platforms. So you can really uh, define your UI, for example, in your Xamarin Android project, uh, write your code there. And then if you say, OK, I don't want to uh, port my code to Xamarin Forms, I can just copy my, po copy my code and paste it into my new project. And because the API is, is always the same, mostly at least. And so it's really easily comp compatible and also abstractable. We have um, native support for touch inputs, so we can make our controls interactable, uh, which is really handy. We have full support for scalable vector graphics, and uh, not only that we can use the path to draw paths, but we can also uh, render complete SVGs with Skiersharp. We have a wide range of uh, ge geometric functions, so we can draw all kinds of shapes and, and uh, manipulate them in all kinds of ways. So that's uh, really powerful once again. We have many effects and, and features like clipping, masking, and so on. You can read it yourself. As, so we can really 
manipulate and, and uh, render it how we want to do it. And we have different rendering backends. So this is a bit more advanced, but we can actually swap out the rendering engine, which is used uh, behind the scenes. So for example, when we are when we want to use a GPU or CPU accelerated um, rendering, we can use for, GP for the GPU rendering, for example, OpenGL or Vulkan or Metal in the future. Uh, this is, so this is maybe a bit more technical, but it's also really nice that we can do it in general. And uh, also just shows how, how powerful and also how low level we can go with uh, Skia Sharp. OK, again, we want a little example because uh, uh, just talking about it is not that fun. So uh, in this case, I will uh, draw the, the famous slider, uh, which I think some of you have already seen on, on uh, Twitter. Um, and uh, so I will draw a slider control, and this has uh, three, 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 three re requirements. The first one is that, I, of course, it's slider. I have to slide it. So I have to recognize the touch input and uh, must slide it according to my touch input. Next thing is that it must uh, be resizable so that, uh, yeah, it can adapt to the screen size or also to rotation, for example. And it must have a really cool thumb. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's important that the thumb is really cool. That's always a re really important requirement. OK, let's dive into the sample. Um, I will just uh, change my start page to my slider page. Slider sample, is this, yeah, this is a page. I named the page and the view is uh, the same name, so I don't know which one is which. <laughs> uh, let me close all these documents and then go into the slider sample page first to show you what this is in there. So this is just a stack layout. Don't need this anymore. Um, and then my slider. So this is our custom view. And uh, it's also set to expand uh, to in both directions. Um, yeah. So now we have our slider sample. And this, time, this is C sharp code. And this is our Skia Sharp implementation. So we inherit from uh, SK Canvas view, which is a base view for Skia Sharp. We, we could also implement this and uh, register an event handler. Um, but in this, but I find it, it always easier to just invert from the view and then have my my class where all my code is contained for the custom drawing. Um, we have three properties that that I already de defined, which is the progress. So this is the position of the slider from zero to one, and we have a line and uh, thumb color. So this is uh, gray and the accent color of the device. So I think this is pink mostly in the summary forms standards. We also enable touch events. We have to enable this this uh, explicitly. Otherwise, um, this untouched event will, will never get fired. And then the most important part is this on-pane surface. This is really important. This is really where all the magic happens. So this uh, method will be called every time that our canvas, that our surface will get invalidated. So every time we have to redraw our image, for example, during an animation or when the screen size, size uh, shares, uh, size changes, this method will be called. And then we can redraw our image. And as I said before, the first thing that we always have to, have to do is uh, take our canvas and say clear so that we can remove our old content and then redraw our fresh new content. OK. Let's make my sample a bit bigger. OK. Now the first thing that, that that we have to do is really calculate where, where all my where all my controls should end and be, and therefore I will uh, set up a few um, properties or variables. So we need the start of the line, the end of the line, and also our position of the sum. So we will first say, okay, where should be our uh, line start? And our line start is in this case in the middle, so uh, vertically middle, and on the horizontal start. So this would be a new SK point. We always work with Skia Sharp uh, specific uh, objects here, and the point is zero, so to the left, and then I'm um, the size height divided by two. So this size is always the current size of the canvas, and since I said it should uh, be filled in both directions, this would be the whole screen in this in the sample minus the margin. So this would be the size. And the great thing is that now that every time this is recalled, um, this size will change. So this is already uh, fully fully dynamically adapted to the to the screen size and, and to screen size changes. Next thing is the line end. So where, should, where the line should end, and this is also the escape point. And no, it's a point. In this, uh, I will go to the full width. So I will go to I will I will I will go to the full right. 
and this is uh, this is just the, the full width. And again, I will go to the half of the height. So this is our height again. Okay, now we have our start and end. All we need now is our uh, thumb position. So this would be our thumb position. And this is a new SK point. Now this time, um, this is uh, relative to the progress. So I say, okay, my X position is our width multiplied by the progress. Um, and our height is again the size height by two. Um, so our width will be either zero or one or n times uh, our width to a max of one time our width. So um, what we have to keep in mind here is that is, this is uh, progress is a double and in GitHub everything is floating around. So it passes to a float. And now we have our three basic values. Uh, I also want to define our line width. So how big our line should be uh, from top to bottom. So this would be like 50, for example. Keep in mind, in, in um, example from shapes, these were always uh, device or device dependent pixel sizes, so not pixels. And in SketchUp, these are all pixel sizes. So this is one, this is 50 pixels really on the device. So you have to uh, adopt this, edge, so you actually have to adopt this uh, and scale it up a bit to account for higher or, or lower uh, resolution devices. In this example, I will just make it static. OK. Let's continue with this um, and draw our, our first stuff. OK, so the first thing that we wanted to, to draw is our line here, uh, so this, this orange line. So we directly address the canvas and say, canvas, please draw me a line from the start point, from the line start. Start, line end. And next thing that you have to do is, is apply a paint. So really apply or add all the rendering, in, all the rendering in, in information. The first thing would be the color, where we can use our uh, existing is it line color, I think it is. No, line color. Um, line color is defined here, and this is a semi form color, but we want to convert this to, to an SK color. So we can just use this nice little helper method from Skiersharp. And these are available, available for, for all uh, platforms. So if you are using like a Xamarin Android color, you can also convert this to a Skiersharp color. Next one is that we set the style. And in this uh, instance, we want to make a stroke. We don't want to fill it because it's only a line. You can't fill a line. <laughs> so this is a stroke. Um, we want to enable anti aliases uh, Also, what you can't see that that would here is that this is rounded at the, at, at, at the end. So it's a rounded ending. So we have to say the stroke cap should be rounded. And last but not least is the width. So I say stroke width is our line width. OK, now we have our, our line in place. So this will be drawn now. Um, next thing is that we have to throw our sum. So in this case, I will first of I know it's not cool, but I will, I will start with a little um, circle. So I will just draw a little circle here. And I will put it as a point where, where our thumb position should be. So this is a point. And radius should be, I think, 75 or something, I don't know. And last thing is again a paint. This time I will just copy this here because I don't want to type it all again. So this is our paint. And plus the thumb paint uh, and again anti alias is on. And this time it's it's filled, so I don't want to uh, paint the stroke, but just want to paint the filling. Okay. Um, then let's start. I could also draw this again maybe because in this sample this thing actually has uh, a little stroke in the around it. So I can draw this two times, and one time draw it as a fill, and second time draw it as a stroke, and say my uh, outline should be not the thumb color, but should maybe be always gray. So I can just say dark gray here. And then we will have, have both a filling and an outer line. As you can see now, I can easily layer multiple views above each other, so these will get drawn in order. And I can also easily set for each view of each shape its own uh, painting information. So let's start. I have my clear. Okay, that should work in, in uh, theory. Let's hope that it does. Yeah, and there we go. So this is our beautiful slider. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a uh, thumb and we have a line. So that's not uh, that exciting, I guess. But we get there. Um, so one thing that you might notice is uh, that in our sample, this should be rounded. 
but actually this is a hard cut. And that's because it's a bit hard to explain it. Yeah, but um, really our line goes from zero to the max width and our line will expand to have a, a, width, a, a size of 50. So our line width is 50. So when we try to draw a, a rounded ending, it will also try to uh, draw 25 pixels in the left direction or right direction. And this is uh, and since this is um, breaking the bounds of our canvas, this will not get drawn because this is this is actually negative. So what we have to do is account for this uh, overlapping in our sample. This is a bit bigger, big, bit bigger, and saying okay, our line start and line end should not be uh, just zero and the full width, but should be zero or should be um, line width divided by two, and the end should be uh, the full width minus line width. By, by two, and now if we redraw this again, um, everything is good. Okay, but now it's uh, looking way better already. Okay, no, no, now that that's, that that's, that that is that that is in place, we can add uh, our interaction, so we can add our touch interaction. Um, for touch, we always ha have this on touch event, and uh, this event has multiple actions that that, that it can recognize. But we, all, but we, all, but we, all, but we only want to uh, react to some certain actions. So we only want to react to the uh, can type to the action type um, press when we press in the slider, or when we um, move in the slider. In there, we can now uh, code our code to calculate our current progress. So our progress, or well, let's start by by um, getting our current position in the horizontal direction. So our x position, our x position, <laughs> uh, would be our touch, our location x. So this is the current x position of our finger, for example. Um, and therefore, our progress would be our x position divided by the full canvas size width. So in this example now, we uh, have a percentile um, progress between 0 and 1. Actually, since this um, action can also break the bounds of our canvas, it could be uh, higher or lower than 0 or higher than the whole width. So this progress can be greater than 1 and uh, lower than 0. So we have to make sure that it's we we'll keep in the bounds that we know. So we say math min is one of progress and progress math max is zero of progress. So it will always stay inside of zero to one. Um, this again shows that you that uh, drawing your, your own stuff is really mathematical intensive. And uh, this is really simple because we only we only drawing lines, but when it comes to drawing round, rounded things, there's also many times when you have uh, to to look up and and uh, use more advanced math mathematical 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 functions. Uh, in this example, it's quite easy. Um, and now we can assign assign our progress. And then just say, please, now that I have my new progress, invalidate the surface and then redraw my my content. So now I redraw the content. I also have to say that I handled this touch input to handle further inputs. Um, and now we will recalculate our progress at each touch input and then draw our content again. And since we clear the canvas every time, we will then draw a new image on each input. Um, OK, let's start this again and see if it works. OK, this is the slider. And now I can yeah, track it around. And it's already interactable. Uh, of course, I have to actually do a bit more accounting for, for example, this case where I draw it to the right and the uh, thumb will, will be cut off. But this is not uh, feasible in the time of the demo. But uh, I think you get the idea. And you can make this now more more advanced. You, you can, for example, say, only start the, the, the dragging when I am inside this thumb so that I can do this, for example, <laughs> or this. Uh, but that would be then more advanced. And I don't think that fits this session. OK. Now this thing is uh, now uh, draggable. I can interact with it. I can also 
resize it. So this will get resized to my size of my screen. Let's get back to the, yeah. Since we are always re re recalculating the sizes when we uh, change our, our surface, this is big again, yeah. Okay, now there's, there's one more thing that we have to do, and this uh, that's to make this uh, fun and cool. Um, so this is a really important requirement. And for this requirement, I, I um, actually want to add an image of a really cool guy because a cool guy makes a cool thumb. So I uh, made this little utility function, which will just really uh, load an image for my resources. This is uh, embedded as a uh, embedded resource in my project file. So really nothing special when you come to some forms. To it is. Um, so uh, just just loading a uh, bitmap into a variable is a bit dumb mostly. So you should uh, garbage collect this and then recycle it and so on. But in the sample, I will just load it and then live, live with it. So I will remove. I think I will only yeah. I will move. I will remove uh, my filling. I will keep with my uh, stroke with my outline. And now I will just draw my can my my bitmap uh, instead of the. Old farm. So just draw my some guy, some cool guy, and then say uh, where should the thing get drawn at my thumb position X and thumb position Y. You can already see this. Um, this cool guy has some, has, some, has some issues. So not the guy, but my drawing has some issues. Um, so first of all, uh, the, the origin or the, the pivot point of this uh, image is, is in the middle where our thumb should be. And also the guy is not round, so that's too bad. Um, so we will do two things. First of all, move this image to the thumb and also res resize it and then also make it round. So this is a bit more advanced. Well, not really advanced, but it's not that simple. So let's go again into our code. Okay, so first of all, I want to make this a circle. So what I can do is just um, stop this first and then say, okay, I want to define a new path and this path should only consist of one circle. That's, so that would, that would be our, our clipping of the image. So this would, this, this would be, this would be what, what we clip our, our image in. So I first can say, okay, please image keeps or takes the size of our path. And next on, since this will only um, this will only uh, change the size, I also have to clip the image. And since I can't easily clip our image, I can clip the whole canvas. So I can say after the first uh, lines are, are drawn, I only want to continue drawing a certain part of our canvas. So I can say canvas clip path, and then I can say my path. And now I could say if I want to draw everything that, that is outside or inside of the uh, path, in this case, I only want to draw what's inside the path, so I say intersect, and also enable empty less. I want my smooth corners and smooth roundings. So uh, if I start this again, I will see that, that my cool guy is now uh, inside. And now I can draw this guy around and he's round and where he should be. So there's one thing that I want to add to make this really, really cool. Um, that's, uh, I think every character has to, ro has to rotate. So let's add another effect to this. Just to show you a bit what, what you can all do with, with, with uh, Steel Sharp. Um, so after we uh, add the, oh, no, no, be, before we add the clipping, we say, okay, canvas also please ro uh, rotate. So we rotate the whole canvas and everything that will get drawn on the canvas will also get rotated. Um, at the pivot point of our rotation, we take the, the center of our path, so the center of the, the thumb, and we say rotate by progress x uh, 360 degrees, so this will get rotated from 0 to 360. Okay, let's start this again. Yeah, there we go. Rolling, happy sliding. Um, this this, this might be on. Sorry, 
you got a bit of connectivity issues and we're not seeing your video update anymore. Maybe you could remove your screen and add yeah. it again to the stream. Thanks. The best part of the, the, of the demo is too bad. <laughs> yeah. We didn't see it on the slider yet. Oh, no. Okay, I'll add it again. My screen should be. Oh, but it's just staying transparent. That did not work. There we go. Okay, we're seeing your screen again. You do because I don't. But but if you say you see it, yeah, do you see Ooh. it? I, I see your screen, screen right? Yes. The browser, I see. Yeah, but. Did I share this? Is it the wrong oh. screen? <laughs> I think I said share the wrong screen. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a live demo, right? It, it has to go wrong at some point. It, it has to happen. OK, please oh, try no again. No worries. There okay. we go. OK, now there we go. OK, uh, so I hope this will work now. OK, so now uh, the amazing rolling Gerald slider control. And now it's it's uh, working properly, I hope. OK. Um, so that's the slider, and now as it's, I'm already a bit uh, over my time, uh, what we could do is now is also add uh, bindable properties to this uh, properties here, and then you could bind them from SAML and also use uh, hot reload for this. But uh, yeah, I think this is a is, is a topic for for another pres presentation. So I will finish this off um, by giving you a, a little uh, summary of. Uh, or Comparison of the two libraries that we just that I've just shown, and uh, these are some informed shapes and and gear sharp. So um, just when to use what. So some informed shapes is really built in, so it's really easy to get started. It's a simple API which you can easily use, and it's also fully bindable and and usable in in SAML. So really, if you really if if you want to 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 draw simple or maybe even a bit more advanced shapes. Just go ahead and use Xamarin Forms shapes. It does all the drawing and canvas interaction for you. So that's really nice. Uh, a few cons that I see in shapes at the moment is that it's, of course, only, avail only available in Xamarin Forms. So it, you can't use it on other platforms. Um, you have to layer views if you want to uh, draw multiple shapes with different colors. That's a bit of a con, but yeah. Uh, as long as you don't have too many views, it, it wouldn't matter that much. And of course, the feature set is a bit limited, uh, but only compared to to uh, to Skiersharp. So I think it's it's fully sufficient for most uses for most use cases. Just against Skiersharp, of course, it uh, can't hold up. Okay. Uh, the next on to to Skiersharp, uh, which is a really really rich and and big library, and Skiersharp, of course, has this really rich API uh, with many features. So it can basically do every, do everything that that you always wanted. Uh, it's also highly compatible on multiple platforms, and the code base is, is really easily portable. That's really nice. It's also highly performant, because you are drawing on a really low-level API on, with, with the native native bindings. It's really fast. It's a bit hard to measure, but uh, it's, it, it's fast. You have seen this in the demo by, by John Murray, just how smooth the running track was uh, getting get, was getting drawn. Uh, I see two, two cons. Uh, one is quite large, literally. It's it's the size of the uh, bindings. It's uh, four to six me megabytes, uh, depending on device and platform and so on. Um, but that can be in an app which is like 10 max big, be a big issue. And also, it's the complexity. So you really have to care for all the um, scaling, for all the uh, drawing, and really have to interact with the canvas. So this is a bit more complex. But as, but as we've seen, it's, it's really easy to uh, just draw some easy con controls, so uh, don't hesitate to, to use it. OK, so that's from me. Um, I think we don't have time for a Q&A, but uh, if you have any questions, just uh, reach out to me via Twitter or via GitHub. Um, also, if you don't have, have, have any questions, just say, say hi, to, and then I will say hi back. So uh, thanks so much for listening in. Um, thanks again to the organizers, and uh, I, will, I wish you all a happy rest of the day and that you all have some fun and, and learn something. So thank you. Happy exam expert day.
Yeah, thank you, Conrad. Yeah. Very awesome. Uh, so for questions, I'm sure Conrad will find some time to uh, stay in the chat and he will yeah. answer some questions that way. Uh, the internet was a little bit, but it was near the end where that cool guy's head came yeah. in, so it's not that bad that you missed that part. Uh, thank you, Conrad. It was a good presentation. I saw some nice reactions, so very uh, thanks for that. I will take you off right now and um, you can you can answer some questions in the chat. Thank you. So a, a very quick shout out to uh, the um, weekly exam newsletter that just came out, I think all the way from Australia and uh, Kim Philpotts and Luz Carter are the uh, editors of that. So let me just quickly, I wasn't prepared for this. Ah, there we go. Screen number two. Boom. So you should be able to see that. Weekly Xamarin, they did a nice shout out to us as well. This is a weekly newsletter with all the great highlights from uh, Xamarin stuff and maybe even a little bit more. It's starting to drip in some .NET MAUI and also some generic .NET stuff. So uh, go check that out. Weeklyxamarin.com. Um, go subscribe. Um, um, Kim is also doing some live streaming with Luz to create an app for this. Um, what am I even talking about? Go check it out. Do it right now. Do it right now. Sign up. Put your email address here. Um, another quick shout out. They are not official sponsors, also not the weekly examin, but we have been able, because we are a free event, we have been able to use Sessionize uh, for our speakers to sign up. They even helped me with a little issue on the website um, last night, last minute to do that. So if you are an organizer of an event yourself, go check out Sessionize. Uh, it's free. Whenever you send them a message, it's free for uh, free events. So that's very awesome of them, um, especially for these COVID times where everything is online and you have to maybe uh, be mindful of whatever you're spending. So go check that out. Okay, without any further ado, let me stop sharing again and bring me in full blown, full screen. Uh, we're going to have a session by Daniel all the way from, oh, I have to say this right. It's some Scandinavian country. Is it? Is it Sweden? Is it Sweden, Daniel? Let me just bring him in. Is it Sweden? Yes. Oh, it's Sweden from the middle great, of Sweden. Great, great, great. Okay, good, good, good. So um, uh, what are you going to talk about? Well, actually, let's just find out. I'm going to take myself off and let's just take it from here. Let's go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will talk about my uh, library I created a couple of years ago that I have worked with together with some uh, great contributions from the community. It's called Tiny MVM. It's MVM framework built for Xamarin Forms. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about how you can use it, and but I also will talk about how it works under the hood. Uh, so my name is Daniel Hindrikes, and uh, I'm working from a consult company in Sweden called 1337, 1337, if you translate it to English. Uh, I'm a co-author of Summer Forms uh, Projects, a book published by Pact. Uh, we released the second edition. Uh, this summer, I wrote it together with Juan Carlson, also a long-time Xamarin developer. Uh, I'm also a podcaster, mostly in Swedish. But um, if you want to learn Swedish or speak Swedish, just turn in. The code behind is the name. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I used to blog a bit at danielhindrikes.se. And I also uh, have some plans to start streaming some Xamarin and Azure stuff on my Twitch channel. Uh, but... I will probably start with that next week. Uh, so there are no content yet there. So, but why did I create Tiny MVVM? There are a couple of good MVVM frameworks or libraries out there already. MVVM Cross, MVVM Lite, uh, Prison. Uh, I have tried all of those, but they didn't fit me very well. Uh, the one that works best for me was probably Tiny, uh, not Tiny, that's my library, uh, MVVM Lite. Uh, I don't say that none of the others are good. They are good, but they don't fit my needs. And I don't want to have a very big library either. So uh, I had an idea once after that I was pretty tired of some of the MVM stuff. I maybe don't need an MVM framework uh, because some reforms have great stuff built in uh, with bindings and things like that. But uh, uh, I started to think about it, uh, develop some app. It's pretty nice to have uh, the view model clean from Xamarin Forms references, so you can use them uh, if you're using other uh, UI frameworks. For example, now when we will soon migrate to .NET MAUI, it will be easier to migrate to it if you don't have uh, references to UI framework in the view models. Uh, 
So it started with me created a library called Tiny Navigation Helper that was just for the navigation part. Uh, but then I realized uh, I tend to uh, reuse a lot of code between my apps. I copy pasted it or I rewrote it. I think I wrote a blog post of how I used to do uh, in uh, my apps. Uh, so, but later I realized it was, would be much easier if I packaged it up uh, and created a library of it. So that it was became Tiny MVM. I also used Tiny Navigation Helper as a part of the Tiny MVM to, for the navigation parts. Uh, so I will talk later how I did that. Uh, but here are some of the main features of Tiny MVM. We have an IOC helper uh, and a resolver uh, that helps the developer using IOC stuff. And it also is used by uh, Tiny MVM internally. Uh, we have the navigation helper that is an abstraction of the navigation parts from Xamarin Forms. And it's also pretty easy to build it out with uh, other navigation stuff. So I uh, worked with a client a couple of years ago where I needed to do some uh, VPF stuff. So I built a navigation helper for that. It's, you can find it on GitHub, but I don't uh, maintain that part anymore. Uh, then I have a base class for views uh, and I have a base class for view models. Uh, the base class for view models is probably the one that we that we uh, work with mostly, but we needed to have the base class uh, for the views as well to get some of the features in the view model that I will show you soon to work. And then I have created an I command implementation because .NET doesn't have an implementation of I command. So um, I created my own, Xamarin Forms has one, but if you want to have your view models clean from Xamarin Forms references, you need to create your own. So that's a part of the package TinyMVM as well. So how to get started? Uh, all docs are on the GitHub, uh, on the repository, TinyMVM, in the Tiny Stuff organization, because there are some other libraries I have created and my colleagues uh, have created as well. Tiny Cache, we have uh, Tiny PubSub and uh, Tiny Insights, for example. They're also there. Uh, I will show you the link to it later. But to get started, the first thing you need to do is to install the NuGet packages. Uh, for some reinforced projects, uh, the project where you have your UI code, you need to install two packages, tinyvm.forms, and then you need to install a provider for your IOC stuff. So I have created Autofuck and Tiny IOC, but uh, it's pretty easy to create your own provider if you have some other libraries that you prefer. Uh, but Tiny MVM not Autofuck for Autofuck and Tiny MVM, Tiny IOC for Tiny IOC. Uh, what I have learned is that uh, Tiny EOC is uh, much faster than Autofuck. And you, if you go to my blog, you can read more about that. Uh, but on the other hand, Autofuck have some more features that you don't have in Tiny IOC. Uh, for core projects, if you separate uh, your projects in Visual Studio, for example, you can maybe have your view models in a separate project. You can just install the base NuGet package, TinyAVM. Yeah. And there are some other packages on uh, NuGet called TinyAVM as well, but you can see those that are mine is published under my name. So, so let's leave PowerPoint and go to Visual Studio, the fun part. Uh, so what I will show you here today is a code that are available on the tiny v MVVM uh, repository. So I will show you first how you can use it. So you can use tiny MVM with both the classic way to work with navigation and you can use it together with uh, some reform shell. I will start to show you first the classic way. So here you have us sample solution folder that is named classic and that's the classic part of it or the old part but i prefer to call it the classic part because it's not old in that way you can still use it and it works well and some people prefer to not use shell i love to use shell but for some uh, reasons and for some apps it's probably better to use the classic way to work with navigation 
So the first thing you need to do is go to the app.saml.cs or the first thing after that you have installed the NuGet packages. So in the constructor, you can uh, have it in a separate class uh, if you want to, but you need to call this code from the constructor of the app uh, class. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is to set up the navigation helper. Uh, to do that, we create a new instance of forms navigation helper. Uh, in this example, I register all views in uh, this assembly uh, and they will get the, a key. Uh, all views are mapped to a key. So if you want, you can also do like this navigation helper dot register view, uh, give it a key. I, and then you can define what view it will map to. And you can also, after that, uh, you have register all views in assembly. If you do that, they will get the, key. the name of the view will get be the key. So, but if you want, you can override that. For example, if uh, you want an, another view to be loaded when you navigate to the key on a desktop app or a tablet app, for example, you can do that pretty easy like this. Then you can. Uh, register a view that will override uh, what you recently registered. This. Uh, so instead of main view, you maybe want to load the details view of some reasons uh, in that case. So that's possible to do. Uh, the next thing you need to do is to define the IOC part and create a container. Uh, this example are using the outfac uh, container. So we create a new container builder and then we register the instance of the iNavigation helper interface. And that is the forms navigation helper in this case. Uh, then we also need to register all views to the container and all the view models like this. You can also do this one by one if you want to, but. Uh, uh, I think it's pretty neat to do it like this. Okay, it will probably affect the performance a little bit to do an assembly scan, uh, but it has worked well for me. And the last thing we need to do is to uh, set what resolver that we'll use. So in this case, when we're using the artifact resolver, we, we call new artifact resolver, and when we pass the container to it. Uh, and the artifact resolver is the one class that be installed when you install the NuGet package tinyvan.artifact. And then we can set the main page. Uh, you can do like this, but if you're using the classic way to uh, navigate, it's probably better to do like this, navigation helper dot at root view, and that will replace the main page. And uh, you're doing this, you will have a navigation page by default, but if you don't want the navigation page, you can just pass false here. And this you can use wherever you want. You can also access the navigation helper by its static proper current. This, and then you have all navigation properties here. Oh, Ooh, that's part so it will possible to run it later. So when we have done this, we are ready to start to code on our application. So we can take a look at a view model, for example, here, uh, main view model. We have view model base as uh, the base class for uh, all our view, all, all our view models. Often in a real app, we maybe create a, a own base view model to have in the middle here, if you want to have own uh, base logic. But as you can see, what we get from the view model base is we have an override of initialize that will run when uh, the view model is created and the binding contest is set. We have on appearing that will be mapped to the on appearing from views from uh, some strict MVM people probably not like this, but I think this makes at least me very productive to have this in the view model. Otherwise I need to call code from my view model when those events happen. So I think it's nice to have them here. We also have an override for uh, 
the first pair that we can use. So when we want to navigate to a view, for example, here, if you click the details uh, button in the view, we create a new tiny command, uh, just like with some reforms command, it's nothing special there. And then we have navigation from uh, navigation property from the view model base that we can use. Uh, so we have all methods here. So then we can navigate to a sync uh, that and we can pass a parameter to it as well. So that's pretty nice if you compare to the Summary Forms uh, navigation service. Uh, and here you also have methods for open a model, for example. And it's worked the same. You can pass a key and you can pass uh, if you want with the navigation page. Uh, if you navigate to a view and you're inside a tab page or even a master data page, it will know what tab you are inside. So the navigation will be in that navigation page for that tab. So that's pretty nice. Uh, especially with most digital data page, it could be a little bit complicated to do the navigation, uh, but um, TinyMM handles all that for you. Uh, so what we need to do in the views is that we need to set view base as uh, the base class for the view. And um, to set the view model, we don't need to do it in the code behind. Uh, we can just do it like this, x type colon type arguments, because view base is a generic class. There are also a non-generic class if you don't want to set view model like this is in use. But to get all the life cycle events like initialize on appearing, on disappearing to work in the view model, you need to use the view base uh, as a base class for your view. So let's take a look at uh, the shell part. Uh, also, here is everything set up in the appsaml.cs. It's pretty much the same, uh, but instead of the forms navigation helper, you will use the shell navigation helper. Uh, you can register all the views in assemblies. What's nice here is with shell, a navigation helper, you can also use uh, view model navigation. Um, and that is a feature that Shane from the Summary Forms team uh, created on his one of his live streams. So I have added it to, uh, to him because he sent the code to me. Uh, so that's pretty nice and uh, a feature that I'm using all the time. Uh, I will show you later how that works under the hood. Uh, and then you will set main page as the app shell. So you should not use the, the set root view method here. You should just create a new shell. Uh, and the shell will look exactly as uh, it will if you don't use TinyMM, no TinyMM tiny stuff inside here. But if you go to the views, uh, you can use the same view base if you want to, but uh, it will get a better experience uh, if you use shell view base because there are some lifecycle events that will work better uh, if you use shell view base, for example, initialize will run earlier. If you don't use shell view base, it will run initialize uh, on appearing. Uh, and uh, you probably want it to run when the binding context is set. So let's take a look about how navigation can look with shell. Um, you still have the navigate to a sync, but instead of sending a key in here, you can send a URL to it. So in this case, we create a URL with the name of the details view model. Uh, then we can pass a query parameter like this. And we can also pass a, a navigation parameter as we can could do before. So if you go to the details view model to take a look how we will receive that is that Query parameters will be in a dictionary called query parameters. You don't have to do that parsing on yourself. You don't have to add properties for it. Uh, and you don't have to pass it to the view model uh, by yourself. That is handled by TinyMVM. 
So query parameters, if you want to access the other navigation parameter, you can do it with the navigation parameters. So all this is handled by the view model base class. So that's basically how you can uh, use TinyMVM. We will also say that uh, the only method that is changed in the navigation helper for shell is the navigate to a sync because uh, you don't need to go back. You don't need to open model. If you use them, it will fall back on the classic navigation. Uh, and that could be cases where you want that. If, for example, if you want to open a model and you want to have a navigation page in it with a top bar and things like that, you can fall back to use navigation or open uh, model async. Uh, otherwise, you can set presentation mode uh, on the page if you want to have it as a model like this. Uh, just use the navigation, navigate to method, presentation mode, model exactly as you should do with a normal shell navigation. So now we have done a quick uh, walkthrough how to use TinyMVM. There are also docs that you can read on, uh, on the GitHub repo. So browse in there if you want to read more about how to use it. And now we will take a look how it's working under the hood and how I have built it. Uh, so, we are still in the same repository. We can minimize the samples uh, folder. Then we can see that here we have Tiny Navigation Helper. Tiny Navigation Helper is a separate uh, repository, but I have added it as a submodule. In the first versions, uh, Tiny MVM 1.x, it was a um, NuGet reference, but uh, to decrease the number of the assemblies reference, in, or up added a sub module it's compiled in in the to the same assembly as tiny MVM. Uh, so that's one of the things that introduced together with shell navigation in 2.0 of uh, tiny MVM. so let's start with take a look at the navigation helper because that's what i started with tiny MVM. so we have an abstraction layer it's just interfaces and things that is shared between all of it. Uh, we have the iNavigation helper interface with all the navigation methods. We have a view creator, uh, and we have this helper class. So you can use the navigation helper.current method if you want to. We have a parameter setter that helps us uh, when creating views, and we have a view creation exception. Uh, but all relevant code is here in the forms navigation helper. So let's take a look at that. Uh, here we have a dictionary with all views that we have registered. Uh, uh, so when we register view with, uh, with the method uh, uh, register all views in an assembly, for example, it will be added to this dictionary. Uh, then we will use the default view creator. If you are using TinyMVM, we'll use TinyMVM view creator. I'll show that later. Uh, register view is just adding things to to the dictionary and navigate to here we can take a look at the navigate to a sync method so it will keep track if you are in a model navigation page it will keep track if you are in a tabbed page uh, so it will know what uh, navigation page it should use uh, and you can also reset the stack here if you want there are a lot of code here that can be pretty uh, complicated to write all the time and you don't it can be hard to keep track on uh, navigation pages and so on in your app but uh, TinyMVM will do that all for you uh, yeah so it here you have the tab page uh, to take a look what is the selected tab uh, and then we'll push to that navigation page because often you want to have one navigation page in each tab of a tab page. Uh, you have the same for master detail page. If you're doing navigation inside of a details view, for example, you don't want the whole page to navigate. You want just that navigation page. Uh, so it will check if you are in that case. And it's also check if you are in detail page or master detail page and it's a tab view. It will handle that for you as well like this. Uh, navigate to async, uh, 
navigate to yeah. it's just helper method and the view creators uh, we can take a look at the, the at the tiny MV view creator view creator because here is some of the interesting stuff uh, so when you create a view uh, it will use uh, the IOC if it's possible uh, if not, it will use uh, system.activator, but probably if you use TinyMVM, uh, you are in a context where you have IOC uh, enabled. So what it will do is it will create a page and will we'll set that it's created by TinyMVM. Then will, it, will be create, it will create the view model from what you have set in the generic type argument. Uh, it will set it up as binding context, and it will also uh, run uh, initialize. It will run, uh, uh, yeah, it will run initialize here and later it will run on appearing that we will see when we take a look at the, the view base, but it also ensure that, uh, that uh, initialize has finished, the run of initialize has finished before it running on appearing because we have a semaphore slim here that, uh, make sure that it run in the correct order. So if we take a look at uh, uh, this uh, view base, you can see here we have the non-generic one, and then here we have uh, the generic one. The most of the code is in uh, the non-generic one because it's a base class to this generic view base. Um, there are some shell stuff here that we will take a look at later. But here you can see it's if you don't have a view model and it's not created, by, the view is not is created by TinyMVM, it will create a view model for you. Uh, and here we all can also see how it uh, maps the on appearing stuff. Uh, and it will also ensure that it's running in a sync context. Uh, so you don't have to think about that yourself when you're doing stuff in the on disappearing or on appearing methods in the uh, the view model. TinyMVM is handled that for you, and it also makes sure that it's running on uh, on the main thread. Uh, so we can take a look here at an on appearing uh, if view model int. Uh, is not null it will run this it will check the 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 read lock so that initialized has completed uh, and it will check if it's not initialized for some reasons maybe not initialized by tiny MVM. it will run that code and then it will run on appearing and it will also run on first appear if an appear not have occurred already and then it will release lock so you can run continue with it uh, here we also have some old code for setup UI action that makes it possible to invoke things on the UI thread uh, from the view model, but I have set that method to uh, deprecate it now because I think it's better to use uh, the main thread stuff from Xamarin Essentials. But Xamarin Essentials was not uh, available when I first created TinyMVM, and now it's also part of the, the default templates for Xamarin projects so i think it's better to use that one if we are working with shell we have the shell navigation helper here uh, that have a register root method uh, you don't have to use this you can set root in saml for example and you can use this method directly in your initializing initializing code if you want to uh, but you can also use this one if you want uh, uh, then we have an override of the navigate to a sync method, and we also have an override for uh, internal register view. And here is the part when you creating uh, and setting up for a view model navigation. It will go to the to the view check uh, if it's a generic view and has type arguments. Then it will take the name of the view model and register that as a route. And that's why you can use a view model navigation and, or you can create a URL from your view model name as I showed you earlier. And you can see in the 
sample project for tiny and then so what happens when you navigate with shell first of all it will check if uh, we have registered the view in uh, the old classic way then it will use that type of navigation if not it will create a tiny id that is used for the query parameters and the navigation parameters so all navigation that happened uh, with the tiny mvm and the shell navigation helper will have a tiny id to it like this in the end of the query parameters uh, then we'll add it to the query and then we will add the parameters to this uh, dictionary that we have for the tiny navigation helper and then in uh, the view model we can pick it up by using the uh, the tiny id you can take a look at uh, the view here first so here we said that we have a query property as we do with shell and uh, query properties and uh, here we also have the property for it and in the setter we check if you have a binding context that is view model base and then we can get the query parameters from the navigation helper and we can set them as a dictionary of the uh, the view model query parameters and we can do the same with the navigation parameters so it makes it accessible from the view model then we will run uh, those methods for initialize for example uh, we have also a check here if is shell view uh, we will run those methods if they don't have run already uh, so what shell view base is is basically it just pass true to the view base constructor we can do that from the code behind if you don't want to use shell view base uh, in views if you want to as well so in uh, the view model base uh, as i showed you before we have this navigation parameter and we have query parameters that will be set uh, when we navigating to a view uh, here we also have some method that i don't have uh, talked about yet and it's navigate to an open model that makes it possible to define a key and a navigation in uh, the sample file and this is a contribution from uh, Juan Carlson uh, i don't use it that often but this could be pretty usable in some some uh, cases Yes, and we also have some uh, helper method for is busy that triggers uh, race proper change for is not busy as well if you don't want to use an invert converter uh, in um, your SAML file to handle is busy you can see if the view is initialized we have some helper method and implementation of i notify proper changed uh, interface here as well so that's basically how tiny mvm is working uh, you can see here we have the url to the github repo github.com slash tiny stuff tiny mvm there you can find docs samples and all the source code uh, now we have some minutes left for questions i will take a look at the chat to see if uh, there are any questions uh, for me to answer We don't use any. Tiny has 160, and it's Nugget Pay has had 3,000 downloads. Yeah, uh, I think it's pretty about 10,000 downloads, but it's not very much used. Uh, I know that, uh, but I know that some people that have used it think it's great. Uh, uh so especially shall yeah shall say that uh, uh, many big mvm frameworks don't support shell and that's true and i know some of them working on it prism for example uh, someone john is said that he's pretty happy with tiny mvm
if a package does, doesn't have many contributions and it's not actively updated, I will never use it as a comment, uh, but uh, uh, I would say that Tiny MVM is uh, uh, actively updated. It's me updated. It's where my colleagues, Johan and Mats, uh, is working with it. Uh, I also have some contributions from Steven for Tiny, Tiny Navigation Helper. Uh, yeah, Steven says that the amount of downloads is nothing about the commitment of development. Now I'm using Tiny MVM for all my apps and I have done that for two to three years and I think it works well. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions right now. If you have questions, you can uh, get in touch uh, with me uh, on Twitter at Hindrikes. Uh, it's the easiest way. Uh, of course, you can create an uh, issue on uh, GitHub if you have questions or if you have feedback. Feedback are very welcome because I want to make TinyMVM uh, better. And of course, you're welcome to contribute. If you find bugs, uh, have features that you want to include, just create a pull request and I will take a look at them. And if it fits what I think should be in TinyMVM, I will merge it. I have a couple of pull requests that I have merged, for example, from Shane, from Steven, and some other great community members that have helped me with TinyMVM. Otherwise, thank you for listening. Uh, this has been a great day so far and uh, hope you will stay tuned for all the day. I will listen to all the other sessions as well. Thank, thank you. you so much. That, that was awesome. Um, so just for everybody, go, go check it out. We'll, uh, we'll update the links on our website and uh, at the GitHub repository mentioned, um, you can have a look at the slides afterwards. Um, yeah, and uh, coming up next, we're a couple of minutes early, but that is okay. Um, but thank, thanks to you first, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, coming up next, we are going from Sweden to Poland, where Damien is. I think he has some sweets for us today. Is that right, Damien? Oh yeah! Hello, hello everyone. Yes, I'm going to talk about cake and zamorin. All right. Uh, well, um, so we I, I will hand over to you, and um, just uh, you're going to be live now. And, and thank you for for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, so I see it's screaming. All right, so once again, uh, hello everyone. My name is Damian Antonovich, and today I would like to talk about how we can use Cake for building and deploying Xamarin applications. First, let me introduce a little bit more about myself. I'm honored to be Microsoft MVP. Currently, I'm working as mobile architect for SII Poland. I'm also leader of Xamarin Warsaw Mobile Developers Group and administrator for Polish Zamorepin, Zamorepin developers on Facebook. In my spare time, I'm blogging and obviously tweeting, but you came here to learn about Cake, not about me. So what is Cake exactly? Cake is built automation system that allows you to write scripts in C Sharp, so the language you already know and like. Cake is cross-platform, so you can run your scripts on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And of course, Cake is open source. And Cake was created by Patrick Swenson. Thank you, Patrick. So what's included out of the box in Cake? So out of the box, there is a support for code compiling, running unit tests, file directory operations, file compression, creating nugget packages, and many, many other. And if this is not enough for you, there are add-ins for even more. So now let's see a quick demo of the cake. 
So I will switch to Visual Studio Code when I have uh, my script. And at this point, we will create a Hello World script. And later, we will be start creating script for building and deploying Xamarin application to App Center. So now let's start with simple Hello World example. So I will copy first step to my cake script, but it's already here. So before we examine the script, first let's take a look at uh, our project. So here I am in my uh, project directory already. I will list all the files. So we have a default Xamarin Forms application created for, from default template in Visual Studio. However, uh, application itself is not that important for this presentation. What's important is that here in file build.cake, we have uh, our c -sharp script. And to run the script, we need to execute build.sh. This file is need to be executed on macOS and Linux. And on Windows, of course, we need to execute build.ps1. All right, so let's go back to our script. So first, we need to take an argument called target from command line. Target uh, specify which task needs to be run. So the task in cake is unit of work. So the task, and for the task, we specify what this task should do. So in this example, it's just displaying hero work to the console, very simple. And at the end, we are running our target. OK, going back to console. Now I will run the script by executing build.sh. OK, it's starting. And yes, it has run. As we can see, we have a hero word written to our console. Great. Now let's do even more. I will now switch to my Windows virtual machine which is hosted on Azure. And I'm here in Windows. I have the same repository, same project, same script. As you can see, there is the same Hero World example. And now let's execute the script in Windows. So I'm using uh, this time build.ps1. So let's execute the script. Okay, script is starting, and we should see very soon. Yes, it ran, and it's displayed her word to the console. Great, so we have one script that is running both on Windows and macOS. That's great. So now let's go back to presentation. So you might start wondering right now, why to use cake? And before we answer that question, I think we should ask another question before that, which is why to use script after all. So by using script, you obviously saving time. I have seen uh, many times uh, when developers were changing by hand, Android manifest, iOS info police, they were uh, putting their version number, build number, uh, bundle identifier, and after that they were right-clicking on project and uh, selecting Arch AFI Publishing. And all of that was created by hand. And well, <laughs> at some point uh, I was one of those uh, developers and I realized hmm, I need to automate this <laughs> to save time. So yeah, I became interested in Cake. So yes, use do yourself a favor, use a script for such uh, things. Also, by using scripts, uh, we have less errors because script written once will run every time the same. So the scripts are repeatable. It runs every time the same, no matter what. And also, we can version our script in our Git repository so we can have full history of it. So. Why to use Cake for CI/CD systems? Uh, for me, 
is uh, cake is great because we have the same ci cd configuration everywhere it's to it no matter if you are running uh, your script on your local machine or if you are running this for example on azure devops or jenkins it will run uh, always the same uh, also it's important in situations when your CD, ci cd system stops working and you really really need to do that important update to your mobile application in that case you have a problem unless you have a cake script and you can run it on your local machine and have all uh, the same build created for you uh, also cake is great for cross uh, it's great for teams who are using different operating system so right now in my team i have one developer which is using windows and other developers are using mac os and we are using the same cake script for build and deploying our mobile application that's really helpful all right so let's go back to our script and now we will do some more advanced uh, things so as i mentioned we are going to create script which will build and deploy our mobile application to App Center. So as the second step, obviously, before building our application, we need to run unit tests. Uh, because if unit tests are not passing, there is no point in building our application. So I will copy this step and paste it to the script. OK, I will save it. So what has changed? Now we have some constant values we have path to our solution we have path to our unit test project and now we have also task which is called clean and this task will delete all the contents from bin and obg directories so we can have a fresh build of our application second we have a task for restoring nugget packages it restore nugget packages for whole solution. And at the end, we have a task which, which actually when we run unit tests, and this task is depending on the clean task and depending on the restore task. So before any code in this task will run, fields will run the clean task after that, restore task we run, and at the end, we will run unit tests. So in order to run unit tests, we need to execute .NET Core test method, pass a path to unit test project, pass some settings. Here I'm using release configuration, and also I have argument customization, which tells uh, that the results from our test run should be saved to TRX file, which is Visual Studio test result file. All right, and at the end, uh, as before, we are running the specified target. So let's go back to console. So I will clear this. So now we are going to specify target as run unit tests, and let's execute this. Okay, great. Our unit test has passed. We have only one unit test in the project. Okay, I didn't show this before, so let's do it now. I will switch to Rider and I will open our test. It's a very simple unit test. It's just asserting if true is true. And, and from our test result, we see that it's yeah true. <laughs> uh, okay. So now I will switch to my Windows uh, virtual machine and we will run the same version of the script. So now I need to focus because I have macOS keyboard and I'm working on Windows, so the shortcuts are a little bit different. It's always the pain, okay. All right, so we have the script here saved. So now, okay, I will create the console. Now we will also run unit test on Windows. Okay, let's start executing. 
Okay, it's running. Okay, great. So our uh, tests are also passing on Windows. All right. So going back to Visual Studio Code. So as another step, we need to actually build our Android APK and iOS uh, APA. So let's copy this step to our cake script. And let's see what has changed. So now we have a path to packages uh, folder. And in the packages folder, there will be our, yeah, packages for our mobile application. So let's switch to that folder. That folder is uh, right now uh, empty, but it will change. And also we have a path to our Android project. We have path to our iOS uh, project. And also we have now a little method that will actually move our uh, package to that packages folder. And after that, we have clean task as before, uh, restore task. Uh, in this step, restore task is also restoring nugget packages for both iOS and Android. Uh, we have running unit test task as before. And now we also have task for publishing uh, APK, which depends, of course, on running unit test first. So in order to build Android APK, we need to invoke build Android APK method, pass path to Android project, and also say it should sign the package. And after that, we are moving the APK to our packages folder with method we created before. Simple. All right. And for iOS, uh, we have very similar thing. So we have task for publishing APA, which depends uh, also on running unit test fares. Uh, we are using a release build configuration and we need to invoke build iOS APA as path to iOS project build configuration. And at the end also uh, move our package to proper folder. All right. Uh, however, for this step, I won't uh, execute this in uh, console. Uh, I will explain this in a moment. So now let's move to step four. And in step four, we will create application package for specify environment. Uh, so we will have three environments. We will have a dev environment, staging environment, and production environment. So let's copy this step to our script. Okay, and before we see the changes to the script, I will go back to console. And now I will run target, which is uh, publish APK. And now I will also pass argument env, which determines for which environment we are creating application package. So in this example, it will be dev environment. Okay, so let's create a package for dev. Hit enter. Okay, it starts running. All right, it's running. So in the meantime, we will see what has changed in our uh, script. I didn't mention uh, in the previous step that we needed to add additional add-in, which is kxamarin, in order to build our Android APK and iOS APA. Uh, also, we have here add-in for App Center, but this is step four, and so we don't actually need this this time. We will need this in the Step five, okay, but let it be here. We also have add in uh, for cake playlist, which is adding for uh, changing contents of iOS info playlist file. And we have also add in for cake Android app manifest. And as the name says, 
this adding allows us to change contents of Android manifest. And we also using a small tool, which is called Git version. All right, so let's see the changes. So as before, we are taking a target argument from command line. And now we also taking argument code env, which is shortcut for environment. As I said before, we have uh, three environments for which, for which we can create our application package is dev, staging, and production. Uh, as for um, our constants, okay, I think I will disable the word wrapping. Okay, it should be better now. So now we have a path to Android keystore file. We have also keystore areas and keystore password. And as you can see, values for these uh, variables I take, I, are taken from environmental variables. It's important not to keep such things in your uh, script because that things should be uh, considered as confidential. So for example, we need to use uh, environmental variables for that. Okay, moving on. Now uh, we have, yeah, the same method for moving packages further. And what's new for this step, we have a class which is called build info. And this class will hold information for current build. So uh, this class is holding information for our API URL, build number, app version, app name, package name, and so on and so on. You get the idea. And now we also have a method called setup. And this method will run before any other task in the script is run. So what this method do? This method is setting up instance of build info class, which we have seen just before. And by default, all the values are specified for dev environment. And this method now checks for which environment we want to create application package. So we have a get environment method. We will check this method in a second, what it actually does. And we are comparing our uh, current environment to the constant values we have uh, defined before. So if we are creating application uh, package for staging environment, obviously we want to have a different API URL, which our application will uh, consume. We want to have different uh, app name, different package name, and we also want to have a different uh, app center name for which we will deploy our uh, mobile application. And the same thing also for production environment. We specify here also API URL, app name, and package name. All right, so there is also a little thing called uh, Git version. So what we are using Git version for? Okay, maybe before what we are using it for, maybe I will tell what Git version actually is. So I will go back to console. And okay, great. We already see that our application package for Android has uh, been created. Let's see the packages uh, folder. Yes. Success, we have our application package created. Okay, going back to console, I was talking about uh, Git version. So Git version is command line tool, which is very useful for checking uh, properties uh, for your current uh, branch. And in our script, I'm using Git version to get major minor patch and it will become my app version and from the console we are seeing that major minor patch is actually 0, 1, 0. this is the default value and for example 
if I would be at branch with which will be called let's assume re release uh, one dot zero zero, then our minor minor patch will be that number. So Git version is uh, very uh, flexible in uh, regarding to obtaining the uh, version for your application. Very useful. Okay, I will just close this. All right, and for our build number, I am using just the unique timestamp. It's the most uh, simple uh, thing we can do in order to guarantee that build number will be uh, bigger every time we run our script. Okay, I will drink a little bit. Okay, and before I mention that we have get environment method, which uh, tells us for which environment we want to create application package. So what this method do? This method do does is that is checking if we have a specified environmental argument from command line. Uh, if yes, we will just uh, return it. If no, then uh, we will once again use git version. And by using git version, we can see on which branch uh, we are. And this script assumes that if we are on branch, which start with release slash, then it means we are creating application package for staging environment. And if we are on the branch master, then obviously we are, we are creating our build for production environment. And in other cases, we are just creating application package for dev environment. Okay, so let's move on. What other changes uh, we have here in our project? All right, so now we have a task for updating config files. So uh, in our application, we are calling uh, API URL, uh, where, where our uh, API is. So uh, let's see this class upsetting. Okay, I'm switching to Rider. And as you can see, we have a class upsettings and by default it's pointing to dev API URL. Okay, I see that, uh, okay, it's changed because we have run our scripts. Okay, I will revert contents of this file. Okay, just... Uh, Quick revert, okay. All right, so uh, by default, without any modification, there is so-called uh, token, which is uh, replaced by uh, our uh, cake script. So we have update config files method, which is loading the upsettings file and it's uh, replacing token with proper API URL, which is uh, get from build info. Uh, instance of this class uh, was created in setup method we saw before. All right, and after that, we are saving uh, our upsettings uh, file. Okay. Okay, I see there are some questions on the chat. Okay, the question is first, can I use cake to add a compiler flag? Uh, okay, to be honest, I didn't <laughs> do that uh, before, but I guess it should be possible. Okay, we have another question. I'm still unsure the why use cake. We use Azure DevOps. I can see that cake would allow me to run my build process if that was enabled, but I have never been in that situation I'm missing. Uh, okay, to answer that question, uh, I was uh, in that situation a few times that my my CI/CD system uh, stopped working, and I was uh, in need to create application package uh, with bug fixing, which was needed to deploy to to the store, and in that case, uh, K can can uh, help us. 
because if your CI CI CD system doesn't work, you can run a whole pipeline on your uh, local machine. And also it's uh, and also it depends on uh, your project. And for example, in my project, uh, which I'm currently working on, we are using a Team Foundation server, which is uh, hosted on premise. Uh, we don't have uh, we, we, we don't we don't use uh, Azure DevOps uh, hosted from uh, Microsoft, so we don't have uh, access to build machine uh, in the cloud. So. And also, be, and also because from the whole COVID situation, we, we had uh, budget cuts, so we didn't get uh, money to buy a, a Mac mini machine for our uh, uh, CI/CD system. So we have created a cake script, which allows us to run uh, the script locally and create package for our mobile application. So uh, we have already our uh, script in place for building and deploying application. And now uh, when this COVID situation is changing, uh, we can have a budget for buying a machine for building our application. Then we have in place a whole CDI CD pipeline configured in our cake script. So we can use it in uh, our uh, Team Foundation system uh, hosted on premise. I hope that answer uh, this question. Yes, and Tobias uh, is also right. And it's very easy to switch from one CD to another. And this is also situation I had in my previous project. So once I was working for a company that already uh, been using Azure DevOps, but after that I switched to other project which was using uh, Jenkins. And I had to set up pipeline in Azure DevOps. I had to set up pipeline in Jenkins. And after that, I realized maybe I should use Cake to write this script once and uh, use it uh, from project to uh, project. And the script, which I'm showing you right now, I have created this uh, script some time ago. And with little modification, I'm using it from project to project, and it will work the same uh, on every CI CD system. It's very, very uh, convenient. Uh, okay. All right, so there are no more questions. So let's get back to script because we are slowly running out of time. So uh, now, we also have a method for updating Android manifest. So first we need to deserialize Android manifest. And after deserializing it, we are uh, changing, of course, the uh, version name, version code, application label, package name, and we also setting debuggable to false for security purposes. And after that, we are serializing uh, Android manifest back to uh, disk. All right, so this is it. And also now we have published APK method, which is now uh, extended uh, in case, sorry, uh, it's extended that now it detects if we are creating build from for production environment. If yes, then we want to sign our APK with uh, Android uh, Keystore. So this is the code which is actually doing that. Okay, so now let's also move to iOS part. So now we have a task for updating iOS info list and it's working the same like for Android. First, we need to deserialize uh, info list and after that, we are changing uh, data in that file. So we are changing uh, short version string, version, bundle name, display name, bundle identifier, and saving info police back to disk. All right. And after that, we have uh, also our publish uh, APA method. Now it also 
check if we are creating a package for production environment. If yes, we are using different build configuration. We are using uh, App Store build configuration because uh, that build configuration is using uh, production certificates. Uh, okay, and that's it. So uh, I have already run this uh, script. So we already have our application, which is uh, prepared for dev environment. Uh, and let's see the changes, what has been made to the Android manifest. And as you can see, or maybe not, because this is a little bit small. OK, I, I hope you see it. And the script updated uh, version code, version name, package name, and so on and so on. I hope you can uh, see this. Uh, OK. So now, as a final step, we need to deploy our package to App Center. So I will copy final step to our case script, save it. So what has been changed is that we have now method which allow us to deploy uh, APK and APA to App Center. So let's check the deploy APK to App Center task. So what this task do is first depending, of course, of publishing APK. And after that, we are invoking App Center distribute release, and we are providing some settings. So first, we are providing path to our application package. We are specifying which group in App Center should receive this uh, release. We also specify uh, app name in App Center, and of course, we are providing a token. And as before, token to App Center is environmental variable. <laughs> Remember to not store such values in your uh, script, it's not secure. Okay, so now let's deploy our package to App Center. So we will execute deploy apk to app center method so i'm going back to console maybe i will clear a little bit and now okay our target is deploy apk to app center uh, however as you can see this task is depending on publishing apk but we already have created our android apk before so we don't actually to create this uh, package one more time. So Cake uh, is here to help us. So we can use uh, exclusive. Ex it's very hard to write for me. Ex so okay, I hope I write this correctly. So exclusive parameter will tell Cake that it should run only this uh, task and it should not run the pending task. So as you can see, we are already uploading our APK to App Center. Uh, okay, but I guess it will take some time because I have noticed recently that I have some internet issues. So we won't be uh, waiting for that. I will just uh, kill this. But trust me, it, uh, it should work. It's just my internet connection. So now let's do even more. I will switch to Azure DevOps. OK, so here I am in Azure DevOps. For my Tasty Forms app, we have uh, one pipeline. And this pipeline is already using our uh, cake script. So let's go to that pipeline. And before we see how this pipeline is configured, I will first run this pipeline. So it will start running in the background. So what this pipeline will do, it will of course, build our application and it will be deployed to App Center for both Android and 
iOS. So let's go back to pipeline definition. Let's see how it looks like. Okay, so here I am in my pipeline definition. Uh, first of all, before we run our uh, cake script, we need to install Apple certificate. So I have already uh, deployed my certificate to library secure files. So we can see there is a, my development certificate to see in uh, iOS uh, version. And I I and I saw all. I'm um, sorry. And also I have a provisioning profile for that. Okay, so now let's go back to the pipeline. Okay, pipeline is executing. Great. So first we install certificate. Second we install provisioning profile. And as a third step, we are executing our cake script. So. As target, we are uh, specifying that Cake should deploy APK and APA to App Center for staging environment. And we also specifying a parameter verbosity set to diagnostic. So it will tell Cake to display um, more information to the console. Uh, it's very useful uh, if something is going wrong. So it's useful to see what is actually happening. All right, and as a final step in our pipeline, we are uh, publishing test results. So this task is looking for TRX files and publishing it. So let's see how our pipeline is doing. Okay, what it's doing? Okay, it's still publishing APK. So. Let's go back to our pipeline. So I will show some previous uh, runs of this pipeline. I want to show you how test results look like. So this is the run of the pipeline I did uh, yesterday. And as you can see, it was successful. And in the tests, I can see that uh, one of my tests I mean, the only one test has uh, passed, so that's great. And okay, let's go back to our pipeline, see how it's uh, doing. Okay, I guess it's still building Android. Okay, so let's wait a little bit. In the meantime, I will check uh, the chat if you have any questions. Okay, there is uh, one question. Can I define Damon, my Damon, environment? Sorry. Increase your yeah. font size in the browser or just zoom in in the, in the browser somehow? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Bottom end okay. of our resolution. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, it should be better now. All right, so we have one question. Okay, can I define my environmental variables locally for testing. Hmm. I'm not sure if I get this question correctly. So uh, about, ah, okay, you mean environmental variables local for testing. Um, yeah, you can specify your environmental variables, yeah, on your local uh, machine. And you should uh, do that actually. Okay, I see that in the pipeline, our script is uh, deploying APK to App Center. Okay, it should be there in any seconds now. Okay, come on, come on. <laughs> we are running out of time. Okay, uh, there is another question. Can you also run UI test as part of the script? Okay, to be honest, I didn't yet uh, do that, but I guess it should be possible because Cake is very flexible. Uh, okay, I see that our APK 
is deployed to App Center. So now I will switch to App Center, refresh the page. And OK, we are seeing that application packages package was deployed just now. So now what we can do is uh, obviously to download this package. So here I am in the my another screen. OK, I will close this one. OK, it's very dark. Uh, visor is very dark. I hope you can see it. So here I am on my uh, Android uh, phone. And as you can see, there is uh, one package available for download. So I will download this package. It was uh, built and deployed from Azure DevOps, as you have seen uh, just a second before. OK, it has been downloaded, so I will open it. OK, install, yes. OK, it's blocked. Yeah, install anyway. <laughs> I guarantee this package is safe. OK, it's, it has been installed, open. Uh, no, don't send for scanning. And yeah, success. As you can see, uh, we have built and deployed our mobile application using uh, Azure DevOps and Cake. All right, that's great. So now going back to the slides. And that's everything I have prepared today for you. Uh, the whole uh, script which I was uh, showing here is available at my, uh, at my GitHub. And yeah, that's it. Are there any questions? So I guess we already had some, some questions and your answered questions. I see people are, are liking what they see. So uh, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping you have changed uh, some people's deployment pipeline. So that would be a, a good outcome of this. Uh, so thank you so much for, for telling yes. us about this this exciting technology. And it's it's nice to have, have this uh, with your existing C-sharp knowledge and not have to learn uh, like F sharp or some other language to, to do that. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, thank you and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. So we are pretty much on schedule. We're just a little bit early. We've got a lunch break coming up of one hour. So we'll resume one hour from now. I don't have to tell you the absolute time because it won't work in your time zone anyway. Um, so 13, 15, European time, and um, we are, as mentioned at the intro, we have a, a raffle to participate in. We are giving away two, no, three Syncfusion commercial licenses, two JetBrain Rider licenses. We're giving away 10 Xamarin Expert Day water bottles provided by MSG and five Manning books and uh, also five mugs also uh, Xamarin Expert Day mugs. So uh, make sure to participate in that raffle. I will put the link on after this and um, we'll see each other again one hour from now. Thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back to our first online version of uh, Xamarin Expert Day. Um, up next is uh, someone from beautiful Brazil, um, Alexandre. If I'm pronouncing the name correct, Alexandre? No. Completely right? right. Thank you. Moving Wing, though. <laughs> <laughs> Eight o'clock at your place. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah. So sorry, I am a little asleep yet, but <laughs> I think we, we can have a great show. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to tell us uh, about accessibility in Xamarin Forms, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, it's a subject that it's not usually uh, uh, we, we, we don't, 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 don't see a lot of information about it and it's very easy and it, to, to, to implement it to using Xamarin Forms and uh, it, it can increase a lot the experience of your users. So um, I am a, a person with visual impairment, so I, I need accessibility to do my day job and do everything. And it's something that I like to share with, with you so we can have more accessible apps to, to use because usually uh, when I try to use a new app that I'm not uh, I'm not uh, used before the, the first thing I notice is that there are a lot of small issues uh, about accessibility that can be solved so easily, and uh, in, in my opinion, the, the, the main reason is really because uh, developers usually don't, don't know how to do it. So I'd like to share a little bit. It's not a very extensive uh, talk about accessibility because it's a, a very huge subject that we can have an, an all day event and probably we won't cover everything, but I think that it's a good start. All right, so I will give the stage to you. If you have a presentation, mm -hmm. uh, feel free to, to share. All and, right, let's uh, start well, sharing. The, the stage is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Share screen. First of all, back. Uh, you are listening. To lo uh, I shared also my sound calls. Um, to, to use my computer, I use a screen reader. So I want to, to give you the opportunity to understand how uh, it works and how it can help me to, to achieve everything that I want to, to do uh, in my daily basis. So let's start to running the presentation. So, uh, Xamarin Accessibility. Our agenda will be uh, talk about uh, what is accessibility, uh, accessibility in Xamarin Forms and the properties that you use. Very simple. Uh, what is accessibility? We have a lot of uh, academic definitions about accessibility and uh, universal design. But I like to say that uh, accessibility is offered to any user uh, the same experience of your product or service, uh, despite the bar, uh, cognitive, sensorial, or physical barriers. So if I can use your app using a screen reader, or I don't need to look to the screen to use your app, uh, we can say that it's accessible. If a person with uh, low mobility can use your app, uh, we can say that your app is accessible. Uh, if uh, the person has any kind of cognitive uh, impairment, but uh, the person can 
can use your app. This app is accessible. But we are talking about, when I, I say about impairment here, I am talking about permanent impairment. Uh, I was born blind and, and I, I am blind. I, 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 for a while, I was low vision, but uh, I, had, I had low vision, but now I'm completely blind. And uh, it, it's a condition that won't change until uh, technology or uh, technology or uh, I don't know some surgery or any kind of treatment appear. Uh, it's permanent, but you can uh, walk uh, walk on the street and uh, for some reason you can. Uh, break an arm or break your leg and for a while you be have mobility and physical impairment. And for, uh, for example, uh, is your app prepared so the user can use it using only one hand, uh, for example, or uh, you are in a very uh, sunny day and it's hard to look to the screen. Uh, it, it's a temporary condition. Is your app prepared for this situation? And uh, some 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 time ago, I was uh, attending to a accessibility uh, course and, and training, and uh, the the teachers told something that I never stopped to think about it. Uh, usually, when when you go to the the so some hospital uh, website, for example, or you need to to use some some kind of emergent service, uh, you go to the website, you go to the page, and it's very hard to 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 find the the address of that hospital or the, the, the telephone, the phone number. So you are in an emergency. The most important information is the, the, the phone number and the address, and it's hard to find calls. Usually we think about the, the person or user in the best condition. Oh, my user is at home, seated. Uh, the user is calm. Uh, the user is... Uh, with with everything okay and, and it's good to him or to 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 today uh to navigate my 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 browse my website no. and, and find the, the the necessary information but why in in when this condition is not okay is my application is my app is my website prepared to those conditions so uh, it, it opened my mind for, for this new thinking. And nowadays, when I'm thinking about the user, I, I, I really think, okay, what kind of conditions that can uh, make them uh, have a hard time to use my app and how can I solve it? I hope it's okay. I will present a small video from Build. Uh, and to me, uh, it represents okay. uh, what is accessibility right, and what is uh, really help the, the, the user. Great start. I tend to kind of just avoid doing sketching and writing now because it's just, it's not really worth it if you get something like that. Anything you could do that would just make my hand do what I want it to do and yeah, be able to sign yeah. my name would be an incredible thing. How do we even just begin to help her overcome this particular symptom of her tremors and helping her be able to regain her writing ability, her drawing ability? So what I'm doing is I'm making a, a very rough prototype. And what this board does is I can connect into it through these wires, these um, tiny coin cell motors. So these motors will vibrate I personally think that what this is doing is it's short circuiting whatever feedback loop there is between the brain and the hand that's causing the, the tremors.
So the idea is if you are distracted by the vibration, are you able to write better? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's affecting something. I don't quite know what's happening. I'm on to something, right? I'm on, I'm on to something. Oh my god. <laughs> it makes me forget that I have a tremor. <laughs> I've drawn one of them for a long time. <laughs> I've actually just written my name for like the first time in ages. I can't believe it. Mum, it's called the Emma. Oh brilliant. It's got my name on it. <laughs> In my opinion, uh, it, it uh, represents completely what is our daily jobs as developers. Uh, our mission is to improve the, quality, the life quality of people. Uh, so when we are writing a single line of code, uh, it's not related to the business, it's not related to the money, it's not related to uh, if it's a cool technology or not, it's related to how this simple line of code can change lives. And I'm completely sure that in a daily basis, you folks write code that impact a lot of lives. And each time when I, each time I open my Visual Studio and each time I put a semicolon in the end of the line, I think, okay, this line of code need to have the uh, most uh, possible quality uh, and my user interface should be uh, as easy as possible and should be accessible so I can transform lives uh, for, uh, for good. So, what about Xamarin Forms accessibility? In Xamarin Forms, uh, as Xamarin Forms is uh, the, the best way of de develop uh, cross-platform native mobile apps, uh, we have access to 100% uh, of the API. So it's easy to use uh, the Android and iOS resources to implement accessibility inside our app. But when we are talking about uh, Xamarin Forms, it's cross-platform. So the framework uh, offers to us uh, some properties uh, that are grouped inside the automation properties uh, class. And we have these attached properties that it's the name. So we can identify to the user what is that control we can use the help text to get a hint and how to use that control. We can use uh, the is inaccessible tree to show and hide controls to the assistive technology. And you use the tab order so the uh, nav navigation between controls can be measured so uh, not important controls can be skipped or we can put uh, important co controls up front. So it's very easy to implement and uh, I'm completely sure that with just a uh, few properties you can improve a lot uh, the uh, usability of your apps. But it's necessary only when you, we use uh, not a standard control. So if I use a standard entry or, or a standard editor or a standard button, uh, it's accessible uh, by design. So if I put a button on, on my form, my Xamarin Forms page, it's accessible. I need only to put the text and okay, it will be read aloud by the voiceover, for example. 
And but when we are using uh, not so common controls or we are creating custom controls, it's good to know this. Uh, these properties, okay? And it's so easy that it's the end. No. Uh, I think that before we go deep into code, uh, I think that code is the less important thing uh, related to this presentation. I do, do like to use my, my next minutes, the next minutes, to show you guys, uh, folks, uh, how do I use my smartphone with voiceover and how the experience ch change completely using a screen reader. And after that, I can show you a small app with some examples of the, the user of that properties. But it's, it's really straightforward uh, and, and I'm completely sure that I don't need to show uh, too much of code to you guys to, to, to start using it. But uh, I really want to show you how do I use it. So if I can change you. So here is my phone. And uh, one thing that I, 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 I forgot to, to told you guys that in the, the beginning of the, 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 the talk is that uh, as it will be hard to me to, to, to do the presentation that uh, present to you and read comments and questions, I'd like to, to reserve the last minutes so uh, I, I can answer more direct questions. So I get my iPhone here. Uh, you are seeing my, my, my iPhone screen. Uh, no, I think that's... Cellular, three okay. or four bars, signal strength, status bar item. So when I am Swipe using VoiceOver enabled on my phone, Swipe up with three when I touch an element on the screen, first it read loud, so... Calendar, Friday, the 2nd of October. Double tap to open. Use 3D touch to show home screen actions. Photos. If I swipe Double left open. or right, it moves to the next item. Actions. Camera. Double tap to open. Clock. 8.32. Double weather. Double tap to open. Use 3D touch to show home screen actions. So, uh, if you notice, uh, and, and I turn it on, I, I don't know if, it's, if it is visible uh, on the screen, but now on, uh, if I go to settings. settings. We, we cannot see it, uh, Alexandre, we can only see the, the screen for the, uh, for the sharing, but we cannot see what you're doing on the phone. Uh, okay, Let, let's try Set. to share again. Cellular. Thank you. Free this. De accessories and scenes you add desktop NJ desktop NJ selected desktop and selected quarter stop mirroring page two of two brightness volume screen mirroring button desktop NJ desktop NJ VMPJ5 Desktop NJV. EJ5. Selected. Desktop NJ. Desktop NJV. Desktop NJV. Now it's good. Now you can see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. Settings. So if I go to settings. Set. Control center. Display and home screen. Accessibility. Accessibility. Accessibility feature. Accessibility feet vision heading voiceover on. voiceover voiceover on since so, iOS 13 so I have a new option six to eighteen caption panel on caption panel that uh, to toggle set show you uh, everything that the screen reader is uh, reading so it's easy not only for debugging. So you can uh, really uh, see uh, on, on the screen what is happening. 
but also uh, it's a good way of starting with voiceover calls as it changes completely the, the gestures, uh, you know exactly what's happening. So let's return to the ROM screen. Settings. One new item. Settings. App Store. If I go... Notes. Clock. A weather. To the weather app, for, for example. And... Weather. Florianopolis. No weather information available. Double tap. Florianopolis. Hourly forecasts. Now. Mostly clear. 24 degrees. 09. Mostly clear. So, 10. you notice Mostly that I have clear. access to all the information on, on the screen. Friday. Rain. 60% chance of rain. And when, how do I move to the next uh, screen? Uh, instead of uh, swiping with one finger, I can swipe with three fingers. Page three of three. So I go to the next page. Page three of three. Page one of three. And if I tap with three fingers on the screen. Page one of three. Bottom of screen. It show me the position where the, the 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 cursor is positioned, and you can notice that when I focus on an item, it's uh, highlighted. So Saturday rain, sixty percent chance of rain, high eighteen. So 15. it's the way that you can assure uh, 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 that. Uh, your controls uh, has focus and you can focus everything on your screen and the user can navigate freely inside your app. And a good thing between, uh, I am showing it on iPhone, but the, the way uh, that uh, uh, a person with visual impairment using an Android is the same. Uh, TalkBack is a little bit different uh, uh, but uh, we can do the same. And if I go, for example, to my computer now, and I don't know, let's go to a browser. Uh, let's change the voice first. Okay, uh, it's really fast because it's the way that I use it to, to program, but I, I will be uh, good with you and I will change the, the, the speeds. Very fast. Velocity 100. Velocity 65. Velocity 25. Velocity 20. So it's better to, to listen. So let's and open a, desktop list. a web page. So Reflect. let's open, for example, Edge. Microsoft Edge. Name the door. Zero eight colon thirty eight. No media dash SOM dash Microsoft Edge Jane. Barred applicatives, barred experimenters. If I go, for example, to docs.microsoft.com dash yen dash us dash learn. Go to Microsoft Learn, that's a page that I use a lot to learn new things, to find documentation, and so on. R.
Mm-hmm. Pression tab parapest with RM. Really is low. I think that's because I am sharing a lot of things, so sorry. Reflector free. Microsoft Learn Bar Microsoft Docs dash SOM dash mine. Sixty percent chance. Banner Marco Link Microsoft. Principal Marco Click will discover your path to Chilo Nibble 1. Global Navgasa Mark Link Docs. Link Documentation. Visit Auto Link Learn. Link Q and A. Link Code Samples. Okay, so it's the way that Screen Reader reads to me uh, some, some, some web page so I can navigate between headers. Principal Marco Click will I can navigate between links. Browse all learning options. Li I can navigate between buttons. List of common items. Book. I can search for, for example, a, a text box. Carigamento concluido. Sam cam Sam Campo. No, no, no fields here. Okay. Uh, so let's go to Visual Studio. Reflector three. Xamarin accessibility dash PowerPoint lin Streamyard dash two. O app Streamyard dot com. Reflector 3 Linfa 2 Kaluna 2. Xamarin Accessibility Dash Microsoft Visual Studio Preview Linfa 2. I created here a very Text simple application, very simple application, just to demonstrate some of the accessibility features. So in the main page, Nibble 4 name page dot Nibble 3 name page dot Nibble for main page. Nibble three main page dot xam. Text editor. One less xml. Two less. Not special here. Four Nothing less. special. Six less linear gradient. Seven less. Three, uh, I create less a, a li Nine. linear gra gradient. So I am using the left uh, and hottest. Uh, things from uh, 4.8 like content. brushes. Well, less style target type. Some 15 style. less, 17 less grid padding, 18 less stack layout, uh, 19 uh, less label text. Equal. Some labels, and in the end, 35 less slash grid grader, 34 less button back. Less button. Nothing special, right? Let's Zero run the application. Marina. I am using a uh, hot restart, so it's pl uh, the, the, the the iPhone is connected to my voice dream page two of eight Windows machine. Xamarin access Xamarin accessibility. Microsoft Learn Bar. Double Microsoft open. Use three D touch to show home screen actions. Xamarin accessibility dash Microsoft Visual Studio Preview Jane. Text at zero eight. Zero eight co mm, right. mm. Win graphics recalky performance pro relaunch performance profiler launch Python profile. Okay, it's deploying. Let me see. M. M. Branco. Build stop. M. Brank. Two greater six dash bill. Case building. Doc. WhatsApp. Double tap to open. Use 3D touch to. M. Branco. Two greater six dash build started colon. M. Brank. M. Branco. Why is it too slow to build now? M. Brank. 2 greater provisioning profile colon. Okay. Quote vs colon. 
Wild card development quote left paren C. M. Branco. Yeah, this machine has serious problems when stream because j just before it was really fast to, to build and deploy. Please. M. Branco. To greater provisioning profile. I will run the app just once and show you uh, the, the the code of the all the pages and uh, if you are lucky, hot hot load will work and we can change some properties. But M rank to greater provisioning profile. Uh, Xamarin accessibility. Doc. WhatsApp. M brands. To greater C colon backslash program files to show home screen actions. Telegram. 33 new items. Microsoft Visual Studio by logo there were deployed. Uh, Zam. Microsoft Learn. Reflector 3 dash Alexan. Reflector 3 dash Alexander. Reflector 3 dash Alexander. iPhone Jangler. Brightness. What volume? Desktop NJVM PJ. Quarter. Selected. Desk. Selected. Desktop N. Stop mirroring. Brightness. What volume? Memory accessibility dash mic. Volume. Screen mirroring. Button. Desktop NJVM. Desktop NJVM PJ fun. Less XML version equals quote one point. Selected. Reflector three dash Alexander my phone Jane. Reflector three dash Alexander my phone Jane. Welcome to Xamarin. Forms. So in, in, in this uh, in this app, uh, in the first the, the, the main page, as I told you, uh, we have just uh, the full control. So I have labels. Welcome to Xamarin. And it's read with no Continue. problems. Button. Continue. Make changes to your XAML file and save to see your UI update in the running app with XAML hot read. Learn more at https slash slash aka ms slash so Okay, very, uh, very standard control with no problems. Continue. Button. Continue. I went to the second page and this is uh, the name page. So I have here more standard controls. Text field. Your name. Text field. Double text field. Your comment. Save my name. Button. And uh, here we have a checkbox, and we can see that at least for uh, iOS, the checkbox in Xamarin Farm is not telling me that it's a checkbox and I don't have uh, a good accessibility on it. Save my name. Button. Check mark. Uh, this sound uh, that, and it's he, here check mark, it's that it's an image and now in uh, iOS uh, 14, uh, it, it detects uh, an image and try to describe uh, so it helps a lot because usually uh, I don't have uh, too much to, to do when uh, the, the developer put an image and don't tell me what it, that me image means. But uh, the, 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 the good way of uh, treating it is really uh, using the accessibility properties. So in this page, let's try to do something related to it. Xamarin accessibility Microsoft. To greater provisioning growth. 
Uh, it's not debugging. I won't let you. So I will tell, uh, show you the, the next pages, and after that we can navigate the code calls. Uh, it took a while to build, and sorry for that. Reflector three dash. Reflector three dash. The following page, I put three box view. Box view is something that don't have a uh, focus, don't have access to the user. Uh, but I do, do like to show something using it. So I use it, the properties in is inaccessible tree and the name, pro, the automation properties name. So these uh, box views can be uh, used, uh, noticed by uh, the, the FCV technology. So if I touch the yellow bar, warm. it's a warm. Hot. For the orange one, hard. Inferno and the red one, Inferno. So it's a way, uh, I will show the code uh, in, in a few minutes, but it's a way that we can use uh, the, that uh, property to change uh, Continue. the way that Not the view uh, can be noticed by, by the user. Continue, continue. And Number sign, button, one, two, three, four, uh, and button. Uh, this page I uh, was planning to uh, cause the buttons is in, in the, the sequence here, but we can use the tab order to, to change the, the, the navigation sequence. Uh, but let us see uh, the code a little fast. Memory accessibility dash Microsoft Visual Studio. Memory assembly info dot CS. Topo. Assembly info. Topo. Name page dot x. Uh, One screen read, please. Two less time. Three XML. And uh, if you can notice here, uh, fifteen less style target. 22 less header property. So 29 less entry placeholder equals quote your name quote slash trader. I put a placeholder here in the entry, and so it's why they, it's read to me uh, in this screen reader. 30 less editor placeholder equals the same for the code editor. 31 less stack layout orient. 32 less label text equals quote save my name quote x code. I create a label. To, to label the checkbox and I try to link it using uh, another property that is the labeled by uh, where I use the X reference. Let's focus. Labeled, labeled by X colon reference checkbox label. I tried to use it, but uh, as you see, uh, it's not working properly on iOS. On on Android, uh, the problem is that I don't have a good tool to screen share my Android. I have a, a very old device here, so don't have the same quality to to screen uh, screen mirror it. Uh, it. It's working properly, so sometimes we need to 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 overcome with some pain points about. Uh, the accessibility properties. But here, we, what we can do to solve it is to use the uh, automation properties dot name to, to name the checkbox and, and work on that. Uh, let's see to a more interesting one that is the yeah. level two box memory. views. Level three dependencies, Rachel Kido. Accessible three page dot. Zero eight colon fifty three. Six less linear gradient. Seven eight less gradient. Nine less slash. Ten less slash. Eleven less content. Twelve less style. Eighteen less box view height request equals quote. Here box I have the box height. view with the Quo. sizes. With request e one hundred. Quote background color equals FF eight up. Quote. Automate dot. Automate dot. I changed the is inaccessible tree. Equal, quote, 
true solution. Now. True. So now it's visible to the, the assistive technology. Uh, I can get, for example, an, an entry, a button, or any other control, and put in uh, automation property for, uh, dot uh, is accessible tree. So it changes to be invisible to the assistive technology. Uh, and when you use the is inaccessible tree uh, with the false value. Imagine that, for example, you have an image that is just a decorative image. It don't have any uh, functionality. It's not uh, necessary to give context to the user. We can uh, reduce the friction of navigating in a lot of uh, images uh, with no use for the user, uh, putting these images in, in the is inaccessible tree uh, with false and it will be skipped by the assistive technology. But for example, for the box view that's invisible for the accessibility in, in the accessible tree, uh, if I put it on, on true, I can navigate on it. But uh, as it is uh, just a box with a color, it don't have any uh, description. It don't have, uh, uh, that doesn't have any, uh, Information to the user, so we use the automation properties. Name. Automation properties. Dot name, dot name to set what you be spoken. Uh, why I will open the third? Nibble to memory accessibility. Not I. Let's rebuild the app. Deploy. Oh, rebuild the. Let's rebuild and let's open the third one. Coco, Namarinax. Coco, Namarin accessibility, not iOS. Namarin access. Nibble uh, to Namarin one. Red D. A. Coco, Tab order page, not XAML. Uh, here we have this page I, with a lot of buttons. And I for, I didn't change anything here. My my objective was to change the tab order here to show you that we can navigate 30, in a different order. 30, Let's see if that build and run so we can do it. Thirty one left. Thirty one less. M branch. To greater memory accessibility, not iOS dash greater C colon backslash users backslash magu backslash repo. M branco, zero eight colon. I don't know if I have uh, too much time, I think. Zero eight, eight colon fifty seven. Uh, almost there. Uh, there are questions uh, that I can answer on the, on the, the comments in the chat. There are a lot of nice comments. I think there are no um, questions. Uh, are there any questions for Alexandre that he could take now? M brand to greater memory accessibility, not iOS dash trade. I'm sorry for not a uh, uh, great demo. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, no problem. I, I was <laughs> I noticed that oh. I was muted. Um, hey, hello. Um, I hello. see one question in the chat um, by Ali. He asks. Are those buttons um, so departed? I think are those buttons so far apart on purpose uh, to avoid pressing the wrong button? And if so, do visually impaired people need a different layout? So do you do you, do you take into account the layout? No, in reality, it's that uh, I'm not good like like the the the, the guys to, to create beautiful screens. So uh, I was playing with flex layout and it it messed with the spacing. But no, it, 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 for, for each platform, we have the the good practices that on the the, the 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 guides for the distance between the buttons. Uh, for Vision Expert, it's not necessary to have calls when 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 I show it. Reflector free dash Alexander. When I touch an element, it reads to me. So two button. And to activate it, I need to type twice. Two. So uh, it's not necessary to have uh, it. It was it was uh, it was me uh, playing around with flex layout and trying to to 
to create a a, a better layout but i i think that i i messed with the things it's it, it's it's not by it, it was accidental it was not <laughs> my intention <Okay. laughs> i've actually seen a session before uh by it was a spanish person also about accessibility about these stuff and uh he he made a joke about it like you know i can't see it anyway so i i'm not gonna bother with the design ah, of, yeah you know, he, for, for he showed this up yeah, mm -hmm. I, 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 uh, but 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 as I told for for a while, I was I, I, I was a low vision person, and I I, I never I, I I I was never good for good looking wise. So <laughs> it, it's why when when I I watch uh, I'm watching uh, King Philpus and you <laughs> live coding and creating awesome uh, mm -hmm. interface I, I am really in because I, I do I, I'd love to have this <laughs> yeah yeah I understand I understand so that's also a lot of messages that we get in the chat like there's a couple of people who say like hey I got my best friend's wife or something who's blind and thank you for doing this um, so uh, you know a lot of people see the importance of this accessibility stuff but uh, unfortunately it's it's um, yeah something that is easy to forget for um, us people who are blessed with, uh, you know, just uh, being able to see. Yeah, my, my intention today is, is just really an introduction to accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, as I told you, it's a very broad uh, subject that we can discuss a lot uh, about UX. And uh, I, I'm talking today about uh, visual impairment. That's uh, it's that the disability that, I, that, that I, I live every day. But when you talk about uh, deaf people, people with uh, or, or other uh, kind of uh, impairment, we have a lot of challenge to, to overcome, like the, the distance between the buttons that maybe for, for people with uh, low mobility will be hard to touch a very small button. So it's why uh, we have a, a, a minimum size for buttons and, and so on. So uh, we have to, to take in, in account a lot of things. But uh, I, I hope I, I helped you. Uh, the documentation of Xamarin Forms about accessibility is very huge. Uh, the, the control gallery in the Xamarin Forms uh, repo has a lot of things, a lot of tests. Uh, I think they, they are improving a lot. Uh, if you get the got, got the first bits of Xamarin, a lot of things was harder to, to achieve. Nowadays, we set just one or two properties and everything's fine. And try to use uh, the, 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 the native controls, things that are in, 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 in on the platform. Or if you are creating custom controls, uh, remember to enable the accessibility properties so it, it will be let your user uh, uh, the user of your control uh, enable it and, and make uh, accessible apps. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I've been working on on the Xamarin Forms team, and I know there was a great effort uh, going into uh, the accessibility part and, and making that better. So I hope um, they, the team, and I did a great job in doing that. Uh, I know there are still some things to improve. So um, you know, if you're watching this and you run into something, please let us know. Uh, we are we are happy to help. Uh, Alexandre, are, are you done? Yeah. Were you going to show us something else? Okay, great. Uh, then thank you so much for being here and sharing this with us. Um, yeah, again, from the chat messages, I see everyone really appreciated this. So no. um, thank you. I'm going to uh, so much. It's my pleasure. put you. Yes, great, great, great. Have a good rest of your day. I'm going to get you off the stream and then I'm going to uh, put up our next speaker. So there we go. And I'm going to welcome Kodrina, yay! And she Hi. actually has a exam expert day shirt, and I lost mine, yeah. so that's, that's that's weird. But you know, um, <laughs> um, cool, Kodrina, because you have the shirt because you were on our last um, um, event as well last year in uh, Cologne, so that was really cool. And there you talked about UI testing, I think. I think the session is yep. on my YouTube channel somewhere as well, so go find it. Or did we record that one? I, I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, yeah, you can find often. it. Yeah, you can find it. You did it probably more often. But today you're going to talk about AI and chatbots, right? Yes. Okay, great. Something so all the way from different. Yeah. Yes, totally different. Are you're still in Italy? Yeah. <laughs> yes, because you northern Italy. 
Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, so all the way from Italy, Codrina talking about AI and chatbots. I'm going to remove myself, but I just because else I'll just keep talking. Um, so take it away, Codrina. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. First of all, I want to thank all the sponsors that we have today. And yeah, as Gerald mentioned, I was on the last uh, Some Expert Day conference in Cologne. So this is a picture of me. I had the same t-shirt and I, has, I was very anxious as today. So this day, 25th of October, will stay in my heart forever. So just to mention a few words about me. I work as a senior software engineer for Fresenius Medical Care. In the meantime, I also managed to become a Microsoft MVP. I'm also an agile coach, a speaker, and a mentor, uh, especially in summary or developer task. I'm also a tech and chocolate addict, so I'm kind of sad that we're not in Cologne today because there, guys, they have the chocolate museum. So if you're there, I hope you'll go in there. So that's all about me. Let's get started. And to start, I want us to go back in time in 1966. Maybe a lot of us were not even born. I wasn't born there. But Eliza was born in that year. Eliza was a natural language processing computer program. Was maybe the very first attempt for people to demonstrate their desire to speak with a machine, with a computer with something that can help you. This kind of uh, very first bot was creating by using a pattern matching and had a lot of scripts uh, back in there. One of the most famous was called the doctor scripts because also more than 50 years ago, people were very concerned about things that go around mental health. So this uh, script was trying to impersonate a psychotherapist and I also wanted to mention Eliza that was uh, one of the few bots uh, that managed to, um, to attempt the so-called Turing test. So if you might heard about Alan Turing, one, one of our bigger father in uh, information technology, this test uh, was uh, to understand if you're speaking to a person or a computer and this very first bot uh, managed to fake it somehow. Another bot that was very famous and, as the name say, was more clever, was Cleverbot in the early, early 20s, was very integrated also. But the funny fact was that every time you are trying to speak with this bot, he was searching the answers around all the internet, all the, your previous conversation and all the conversation with other people so was like a very huge work behind it. But I think that nowadays when you're speaking about a bot or something, you're trying to imagine something more like this one here, that it's more nice, more colorful, that you can interact with. And yeah, the video is not playing, but I can play it. So this kind of bots can help you to reach out uh, your, sh your shipment, to help you solve some problems. Uh, mm, some bots also help you with, uh, mm, with tracking stuff. And uh, Satya Nadella, 50 years after Eliza, was uh, saying that uh, bots are the new application that you can converse with. So 50 years later, this kind of bots became also very trendy. And also the need once uh, again to have this kind of conversations. And uh, what is actually a bot? So a bot is nothing more than a web application. So you can imagine any kind of API you want to write in any kind of languages. Together with uh, some cognitive services that we'll see in a few minutes, provided also by Microsoft. So you create your bot with, um, with connectors and through different channels, you can get uh, to your user. There are different kinds of bots that you can find, but today I will focus on the chatbots. And, um, the, maybe the very first idea is that uh, you want a bot to create uh, and perform repetitive tasks. 
and also you want your bot to have a conversation more humanish way possible so they're not they're not like a robot uh, you might have in your home like i have and i had to mute it i have alexa you might have google home um, these are more than bots they are called the digital system assistance and also on windows we have cortana that can help you better manage your day or your calendar so after build 2016 uh, there was the need to introduce uh, the conversation as a play as a platform and uh, it's a new way of thinking for both people and uh, the need to create digital assistants and bots together with artificial in intelligence and also to create a new canvas for developers business and communities and uh, introduce a new way to discover and interact uh, between this uh, person um, nowadays chatbots are almost in every website you you are trying to reach and they are trying to change the your online user experience and give you a more intuitive way to speak with them the benefits that uh, you can find are also business related something like productivity productivity task or a better way to reach your customers on any platform on any device and engage with them in a more natural way so imagine you won't need to hire a lot of people to do the same uh, repetitive task so bots can help you also they can help you expose your program products and messages it may happen that you pop in, in a site and you have your bot and says hey have you seen our last product so that is also something that uh, can help you and also there is the needs to improve the customer experience and reduce the human assistance so we can let people do more creative tasks like creating a bot for example so when you speaking about conversational apps as i told you they are bots that are simply apps that you can find in different channels they should please you with user experience so everything runs smoothly but also they should be intelligent and also may happen that sometimes the bot is not replying to you as you will wish and in this case we are not getting rid of the humans but we can do the so-called handoff to a human some platforms also microsoft dynamics 365 help you if something goes wrong then your message and your chat goes to a human and the bot can still be there and maybe help uh, the people with some hints uh, and solve the pro problems now i want to um, speak about the most famous bot frameworks of course microsoft has his his own that we'll see today Facebook, Google, Amazon, IBM, everyone has its own basically. And the bot can be found now in a lot of channels. You have Alexa or you might have Teams, uh, uh, Facebook, Skype and everything you will see here. But today we'll only focus uh, on the basic one, which are the direct line and web chat. The architecture is kind of complex, so you can have an input that can be from different kind of uh, things like typing or you can speak to a bot, you can use IoT and all these kind of channels to create uh, the bot or your assistant and you can have it uh, for different kind of use. As I was saying, we are going to use the Microsoft Cognitive Services that help you give your apps uh, a human side. There are five different categories you can use. They are nothing more than cloud-based services with APIs that can help you with vision, speech, language, web search, and the last one that has been added is around the decision-making. 
And uh, for example, if you have a uh, FIQ on our website or on your app, you can use that to create your bot and make your user help some time, save some time. When you're speaking about the architecture, you can write your bot in different ways. You can use C-sharp or you can have um, Node.js, you can enrich it with these cognitive services. And also they can be very agile. You can use it with Azure functions or continuous deployment. Now it's time for the very first demo. So I will jump to Azure that I have in here. So from the Azure website, you can simply create a new resource. And just by searching a bot, you can create a bot in just a few clicks. And after selecting just the resource type or your area, your bot will be ready to go. And as the demo are very likely a cooking show, I have here my bot so we can save some time. So once you created the bot uh, from Azure, you will see that uh, Azure already give you uh, like a sample bot that it's an echo bot. So it's basically a bot that says exactly what you're typing. You can test it using a very nice web chat in here. So after it's loading, I have my chatbot that I can interact with. And OK, so if I say hi, the bot will reply to me, hi. As I was mentioning, once the bot is built, so this is very simple, you can just download this code and enrich it based on your uh, idea that you might have. So we tested it, it's very simple and it's working. It's working in an iframe or in a web chat. We can see here that we can have, we can have different channels that we saw earlier. So this is the web chat channel that is already in there. If you want to edit it, you'll see that this is nothing more than an iframe. So if we want to add this bot right at this in our Xamarin form apps, we can use, of course, a web view. So now I'm going to move to Visual Studio. I have created a very simple um, application here using the template. So basically, I have a main page. And from this main page, I can open my bot web view page. That is nothing more than a web view inside the stake layout. I'm not very cool with UI, so please forgive me. And from the code behind of the page, we only need to add our bot. And of course, I have the demo here. But yeah, in the meantime, I can show you my phone. So I have here the application. That is nothing more than the web chat that we already saw inside the Azure, inside the web view. Each time you want to create and add your bot to your application, you need the Azure to give you a token. But anyhow, you'll find all the code on GitHub, so don't worry about that. And yeah, it has loaded in the meantime. So in order to access the URL, I will need to create uh, uh, this token. And for my web view, I'm going to give this uh, source here. And as I was saying to you, this is the very basic chat inside my summary app. So if I say to him, hi, he will answer the same way that answers me inside Azure. 
Okay, so let's move back to the presentation. And now it's where the artificial intelligence comes in for your, uh, for your bot. So around conversational intelligence, there are many different services that you can find. You have the Q&A maker that you can use, as I was saying, for your FIQs. So, for example, if you have a list, you can uh, um, make your bot cycle to the questions and give directly the people the answers. You can use Azure Search that can integrate the search into your experience. You can also use the language understanding intelligence services that help you better understand all uh, uh, the things that can go around the conversation. You can also use some other APIs like the Bing Speech API or the speaker recognition that can help you better speak to your chatbot. Then also the translation, or you can uh, integrate uh, with uh, uh, speech recognition for maybe more complex uh, situations. As you can see, the ladybug is near Lewis, so I'm gonna jump into the language understanding intelligence service that is offered by Microsoft. It's designed to provide you a easy way to create the models because sometimes understanding language, natural language can be different, difficult, and even humans can get it wrong from time to time. And uh, this uh, service helps you understand uh, what the person wants in their own words. Also, it uses machine learning and uh, uh, allows developers to integrate and understand the user input. So, for example, if I want to say that I want to book a ticket, my intention is that I want to book something. If I want to go from Cairo to Seattle, I need to understand and make the bot understand that I will go from Cairo to Seattle, and in this case, that I wanted to have two, two tickets. Um, this is the Lewis dashboard that uh, you'll find once uh, you get in there. The main, the main components are the intent. So the intent, it's a task or an, an action that the user wants to do. And the other um, thing that you can find here are the entities. And the entities are nothing more than the word or a phrase that you want to extract from the language. So from the intent that you can see here, for example, if I want to book a flight, uh, Lewis help you understand the level of comprehension and understand exactly what the user wants to do. And the entities are more like variables. So for example, here you may have airport or from and to that can help you better create your queries or your logic. Once you created your intents and your entities inside Lewis, you can test them. So for example, if I have a greeting uh, intent, if I wrote, hey, ciao, hi, hello in every language, I want to map that uh, to a greeting. So for example, my bot can answer me hello to you or things like that. Everything will uh, translate to JSON. So everything you will need to find based on the score you'll find it inside Lewis that I'm going to show you in just a few seconds. So for example, if I want to do the greetings, so every time I say any of these words or the user says to your chatbot any of these words, they will understand that this is a greeting and they will answer in that way. And for the entities, for example, if uh, yeah, here is the testing, so hope that it's working because the storm, I think it's getting back here in Italy. And every time I say something, the machine learning will help me understand the intention 
of the user. Once you are creating your own model and uh, your entity, you'll be able to add your logic inside the, the, the bot. Um, now I'm going to jump back to the presentation and go more about what you can do with your answers and uh, what is happening with your bot from an application point of view. So here I have some examples of some, uh, some of the famous bots you can find inside mobile application. Um, the first one is uh, Duolingo, then there is the Domino one or the Kia one. And you can see uh, apart from yeah text, you can add something like cards, you can uh, add links as your answers. You can also add uh, calendars and a lot of conversational pieces that can be easily created in your application. OK, now I'm going to go back to um, my application inside Visual Studio. And for my bot that you see, it's a very nice eco bot, I created a service. So I have a chatbot services. I'm using a direct line channel. So it's the easiest way to add your bot to any application. And uh, what is happening between the bot uh, and uh, your application? It's nothing more than some task. So you're sending a message or you are receiving a message from your bot. This, after some very basic configuration, you will have uh, this kind of flow that will go on and from your bot. For the bot, I also have the view model. So we'll have the messages. I created an observable collection of messages. And uh, before every message came uh, into the service, I had a new message. So for example, um, I had a greeting, so I'm very personalized, uh, from the user. So this is my bot. For a nicer user experience, I added a user image for the bot and the other one for the user. So my message has only these three properties. You can get very um, creative when, created, when creating your interface. And everything will be in uh, this, uh, this way. Once the user sends the comment, so every message that came will have uh, the username, the text message that will be entered inside the text box, and also I added a nice image for the user. And this is the message flow. For the card, I created something very simple. So instead of having the web view that we saw uh, on Azure and inside the, the application, I created a very simple page that has something like grid. So we'll have the message grid, an entry text, uh, and the send button. Every message would go inside. I put here a simple list view that I binded with the messages that will came in into the bot. And uh, uh, something very simple and uh, very basic, I would say. So let's see it in action. I will start this part. So now I am taking everything from the bot and put it inside my custom, very simple custom salmon. So we can test it in this way. I have here uh, the web page. So this was my direct line bot. Now you can see that once I open it, 
the custom message that I created manually is shown. So the people can enter their message in here. So when I say hi, I am the user. So I have my image and uh, my name. And the Yelka bot will answer to me uh, immediately. So this is the way you can uh, personalize the messages that come in and from your bot. Of course, you can create something more fancy, maybe using uh, drawings, bubbles, depends on uh, your idea of how a chat box might use. I'm going to stop here because it's a little bit slow today. I'm sorry about that. And then I'm going to move back to my presentation and speak about what you can find around the adaptive cards. So, so the cards that we saw in the sample box that you can create like calendars, actions, intentions, and a lot of stuff like that. You can find something on GitHub. They are mainly created for Xamarin in Android, iOS. Uh, there are also some WPF cards that you can take inspiration from. You can also find a lot of designs on Figma and a lot of them. So you, if you are more focusing than myself on the UI, you can truly get some inspiration from that. And uh, there are also some uh, very nice third party library components that can help you create a nicer chat experience. So here you can find the Syncfusion ones. Uh, that also give you, you know, stuff like calendars, more in interactive chats, buttons, or Telerik. So Progress Telerik also have the conversational UI that you can easily integrate inside of Xamarina. So, um, okay. Something that was announced this year at Ignite 2020 that uh, can help you a lot with creating your bot, even if you're not uh, a developer, it's uh, the Power Virtual Agent. So it's this very intuitive and uh, I will call it drag and drop interface that can help you create uh, your bot with just a little uh, lines, of, lines of code. Uh, exactly in the same that we saw the Azure bot, you can create your bot inside uh, this platform. You can have it personalized. Also here you have the entities, all the cognitive services that uh, you, you saw, and uh, you can create uh, your own workflows and uh, uh, integrate your idea of a bot. Okay, so now I wanted to leave some space for the question and answers. I don't know if there are many. I'm going to switch back to YouTube. Okay. So, yeah, I'm near the violin makers, if you wanted to know. But they're in Cremona, not in Crema. But, yeah. Anyhow, I agree with Danny that bots are, of course, the future. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that you have an idea of a bot or uh, something that can help you add to your application. Are there any more questions for Padrina? Yeah, sorry about the demo. My Visual Studio <laughs> didn't help me today. 
But yeah, I'm sure that uh, any of us has a bot idea in their mind. And you can use a lot of things to create your own bot. Maybe also for the conference, we can think of a bot that help you better <laughs> organize it. <laughs> There was a there was a question uh, on YouTube if uh, the solution could be used offline. No, so uh, this is an online bot that I'm using, so it uh, needs connection in order to use it. But uh, if you download the, the source code for the bot and add it to your um, to your solution, you can use it also offline. Needs some tweaks, but I honestly haven't used that uh, offline yet. Hey, more questions for Katrina. We still have some time left. Okay, so usually when I was doing this presentation, I had this uh, fly tracker bot, but I thought that nowadays won't be so helpful because I know that anyone wants to travel. So I think that the EchoBot is better and it's free that, uh, so you can find it inside Azure. And it's very simple. Also, if you want to have a look at the code beside it, it's, uh, I think it's a nice way to start and add your logic inside that. All right. Um, anything else? I'm looking at the questions. There are no more questions. Um, I can see our next speaker already in the uh, in the room. Maybe we can start him early. Could we have anything else you want to say to share with us? If not, no. I want to to thank you all, and I know that. <laughs> I hope that someone won't hate me that I run a little bit too faster today. But yeah, you can reach me on Twitter if you want some mentoring. I'm also available for students or developers. And yeah, speak to you there. And thank you all. All right. So thank you very much, Podrina. Um, next up, we have uh, Hussein Abbasi, I hope. I pronounce it correctly. Sing your your own. Good morning. <laughs> you you did. did. You did. It's it's amazing how many people get get it wrong just because it has two B's in it. But uh, you did good. You did good. Thank you. So, so you, you have a presentation you already want to to share with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so first of all, I just want to thank everyone for for tuning in, and then thank you for the team for having me today. I've there's been a lot of great content before uh, this, so I'm excited to actually watch the recordings later to uh, get up to speed. But uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, good morning from Houston, Texas. Uh, good evening or good night wherever you are. Uh, it just so happens this time worked perfectly fine for me. It's early morning. So I'm ready to, I'm excited and getting ready to get started. So whenever you are ready, uh, I'm gonna start screen, my screen, and then we'll take it from there. All right. All right, then the stage is yours. All right, let's 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 get to it. <clears throat> so, uh, like I said, good morning, everyone. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I, I do tend to talk a lot, so I'm gonna try to keep it short within the 45 minutes I have. Uh, and then I hope that we'll be able to get through all the stuff. Uh, my name is Hussein Abbasi. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at with that Hussein Abbasi, or you can find me on Twitch every Thursday, uh, working on Xamarin things uh, in the evenings here. Uh, and then you can always find me on my website and my blog, intellieb.com, uh, on the web. So that's just me. I'm, I'm head of technology at a company here in Houston uh, called Chai One. Uh, and today, I wanted to talk about control templates. Uh, what are control templates? How, how, like, why do you even need them? How do you use them? 
uh, and where were they all this time, right? So, uh, the, uh, before I get started, I would like to thank our sponsors as well to make to make this event happen. So, thank you, everyone. So, back in 2018, believe it or not, I actually discovered uh, or or came across control templates, and I was just kind of blown away that wait, I I could do that. I I didn't know I can just swap out the whole view. Uh, without actually having to put in a lot of is visible, you know, hide it here, change the opacity, you know, change your grid columns. So I'm sure everybody has, or some of you, may have done something like that where, depending on the orientation, change the, the column on the grid or move the columns around. Like, I don't know. I've done some crazy UI stuff uh, with, for my clients. So then I came across a control templates, and I'm like, wait. This is pretty cool. I can just uh, strip out the UI, uh, separate it from the logic, like the definition says. And based on where I need to place my things, just swap out for that template. And that worked out pretty well. Uh, you, what you are seeing on your screen on the left is the control in my uh, IntelliApp Xamarin's control library that I have on NuGet that has some of these uh, controls. Uh, so I actually went back, redid my whole control, and just used templates, and now it's it's beautiful, right? So anyway, I just wanted to share that that in 2018 uh, I came across it, and I love it so much. I actually still use it in my apps. Um, and coincidentally enough, the official my Microsoft documentation also uses Card as an example. So Card is very, uh, I think, it's an appropriate use for is it the kind of UI control you want to use these templates for? So anyway. So what are control templates? So according to documentation, it's, uh, it's control templates enable you to uh, define the visual structure of your control. Uh, what does that mean? That just means that you can, the logic doesn't change, that feeds the data into your control, but how you want to present it on the screen, you can modify, you can like, change that out because it has nothing to do with your backend or your code behind or your, binding context, right? So the idea is it's pure UI. You should be able to do whatever you want without having to worry about where the data is and all these things. Of course, you need the data, but you know what I mean. So when do you want to actually use uh, control templates? Do you want to use them everywhere all the time? It depends, right? It depends on what your use case is. So if we stick to that example of their card, imagine you have a card, right, that has a icon on the top left, some title on the, on the top, and some content under it, right? But maybe if some of, for some of your binding data, you don't have an icon, or you don't want an icon, or you don't want title, you just want the, the, the actual content to take up the whole view in your control. So if you don't do anything, right, and then just run the card, you may have some weird spacing because the image view may take up a couple of pixel, the title may take up a couple of pixel, even though there's no value in it. It just looks weird. So what if you wanted to do something like this, where you can have a card as a, I don't want to use the word shell, because that'll confuse people. You can as a, have a card as a as a container or a layout, and then just swap out the, the content inside it, right? So in this example, I'm using the same card control, my custom control, but I'm swapping out the content based on some some trigger or based on some things in my in my binding context, right? So how do you actually get to it, right? How do you use a binding context? How do you, or how would we actually make this happen? So binding context, uh, sorry, control templates are applicable to templated views, right? So you cannot uh, you cannot apply a control template to a view that doesn't is not a, a template view or a template page for that matter. So in this example, for instance, I have two cards on the right. I have one that has an icon, a title, some content, and whatever. Uh, and then at the bottom, we have a card that only has a title and some content, right? So the same exact control. We're just switching out the, the, the templates. So how do we get there? So in code, in my card view is a frame. And why is it a frame? Well, the frame is actually a templated view uh, it's a content view, right? So we can apply a template to a frame. Uh, to to get this done, we in our card we may have two properties. 
we may have a icon property and a title property that is bindable and all these things, right? All the good stuff. But now I want to change my template based on some property change. So how can I get that? Well, I may do something like this where I actually uh, get hold of the two templates I'm working with so I can swap them out, right? Work with them as I go. And then add something like this to one of my properties to say, hey, by the way, if I'm setting a titles property, do some checking, validate and all. And then at the end, the last line, just set the control template based on some condition to one or the other. And that's it, right? So this is code behind, of course. Uh, and that's how I did this control. So if you set the title, it checks for the icon. If the icon is not there, it uses the title template. If the icon is there, it uses the, the icon title template. Now the same thing goes for pages because pages, uh, sorry, a content page, not all pages, a content page, uh, because content page comes, uh, has a base of templated page, right? So we can do the same thing where we can have our pages and based on some parameters, some condition, we can choose a whole different layout just by using control template as long as we have the data that's come, that feeds into it, right? So what about data binding? That okay, you know, I do enterprise apps. I don't do like only UI apps. I have data. How do I bind to my templates? That was me. Uh, it's very simple, right? So when you uh, when we have a template within our custom control, and our custom control has properties like we just saw, we can bind those properties to our custom control and then use them in our template by just calling them by name. So when we bind like this, when we bind a a property from our parent control, we can just use a template binding to say, hey, I'm just a template. I want to bind to a property called icon that should be in my parents somewhere in, in, the, in the tree. And it just picks it up from there. And when you bind it, it acts as a property of the template. So in here, I don't have a property called icon. I don't have a property called title in my template, but I'm just binding it to say, I would have it in my ancestor. And just by doing that, I actually get access to my, to my data binding. Pretty cool. Now, we'll see some more of this in action when I get it, get to demo, uh, but we'll get there. Next, really quickly, how do you create a template? So I talked about how to use them, like a use case on like, you know, how I'm using it in, the, in one, of the, one, of the, one of the places, but like, what is it? How do you create it? How do you use it? Like what, right? So creating it is very simple. We can create it, uh, in XAML, uh, we can create it as a resource inside our page. We can create it as a resource inside in our app and then just use it globally. Uh, in C Sharp, we can create it just by creating any like any class, right? As they need to be content view if you're working with controls or a custom control that derives from content view. Uh, for instance, we, we saw frame. So in here you're seeing, okay, um, I can create a, a create a control template uh, give it a key so I can then call it in my page or anywhere else in the app and just put some content. What is the content? Just any content like you build any view, stack, grid, however you want to build this out. Uh, same thing for C Sharp. We start with a class. We say it's a content view and we set the content property that will then bring that view to your control. And on the flip side, how do you then consume them, right? So we created a template called template A. And now we want to go ahead and use it in, in our app. So um, we have what I was just mentioning. Let's just say we created our resources in, in an app or page. We can consume them directly in the page by calling the static resource. Uh, we can consume them using a style. So in here, I have a, I'm applying a style globally to all my card view and saying, anywhere I use a card view, I want you to use this template. Right, and then automatically it'll look like template A. What's so great about that? Well, if you are doing something cool with the orientation, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, you can just apply the, the, the apply the style and then switch your styles based on device orientation, and the whole app will just respond. It's pretty sweet. Uh, and in C sharp, of course, you can just set the control template uh, property to whatever the template is, and voila, you're good to go. 
Okay, so now a lot of talk, a lot of white screen, a lot of text on the screen. Now actually, let's get to the demo. So for demo, what we will take a look at, okay. Let's get this party started. Okay. Uh, no, don't see that. Look at this. So here I have an app called Movie Night. Don't get too excited. It's not a full-blown app. It's just a, a, a practice app. Uh, and I have just two buttons on this app. This is my menu page of sorts, right? It has um, uh, two two buttons on it to take me to two different places. Uh, it has a nice little logo at the bottom. Sure, cool. Uh, so let's check out cards. So this is the example I was showing you earlier, where don't don't do that. Where um, sorry about that. I have a card that is in different configurations. The first card is is a full gambit icon title content. Second one, title only content. Third one, an icon and just a content. And fourth one is just, just a content by itself, right? So instead of creating one, I mean, more than one card to kind of get the same look and feel, how about I just create one card and templateize it so I can just change templates. So how does this look? So if we go into our card page, don't look at my screen, you're getting ahead of my getting ahead of me. Okay, there you go. So this is my card page that you are looking at right now, right? In here, I have a custom control called card view. And for the first one, I'm I'm giving it a title and an icon for this and, and some content, right? And then you may be thinking, wait, how did you get this content to show up within your custom control tags? <clears throat> we'll get to that. So I have some content in here, right? Um, then I have another card called title only, and I have some content presented in there. And then I have another card view and then another card view, right? So I'm using the same exact card view. I'm not even telling it which template to use. I'm just applying my data or giving it values. And it knows based on what it got, how to behave, how to present, right? So pretty straightforward, pretty cool. Let's take a look at it. Uh, card view .cs. So this is the card view that we were looking at earlier. Right, so I have a card view. That's actually just a frame. Um, I have two templates that I'm going to use. I have an icon title and a title template. Um, and then I'm just naming them up as a control template because these templates by themselves, I created them as a content view instead of a template. So if I'm creating it as a content view, then I have to create a new instance of control template of type, whatever my, my content template is, control template. Uh, okay, so we come down here, there are some defaults, don't worry about this. I'm a regions guy, so you'll see regions in my code. I hope I don't overdo them, but no one told me so, so I'm gonna say I'm pretty good with that. I have a bunch of properties here. I have a title property, icon property, title style property, icon style property. I like to give style property, expose that for my custom controls on a side note, because that lets my users style their UI however they want, right? So it's, it's, it works out pretty cool for them. It works out pretty good for them where I don't have to tell them, you know, a certain style. I just like go crazy. Anyway, so we have a title property and icon property. Let's just focus on these two. And then if you notice, I have an on title property change. And that guy is down here which is doing simply that one check to say, uh, well, make sure the card is not, the, the card that's coming in, the binable object is a card. Uh, and then if it is a card, then go ahead and set the control template based on the icon property. So on the right, you see if there is no icon, my title, the title only card is, is fairly lined up with my content. There is nothing, there is no space taken there. So it just ignores that template and uses the title only template. And then I'm just using use this template, icon template versus the title template. So I actually put those templates in the same file. So for those of you watching who don't like to put more than one class in a file, just bear with me, right? Okay, 
So these are my two templates. Like I mentioned, they are just content views, right? Uh, I call them template. They, I can actually make them a control template just fine, but let's leave it as is. And then I have two, two uh, elements in there or two views in there called title label and an icon image. And I'm just binding them to, to a property called title, which the template doesn't know about, right? It doesn't have a property called title, but it knows that whoever, whatever parent control is going to consume this template should provide the, a property like that. And if it doesn't find it, it's just empty, right? You don't get a crash, you don't get a runtime exception, it's just empty. But the, the important thing is to note that we are using a template binding here, not just the regular binding, right? And the template binding also only works within content view. I think if you use it outside, you get a runtime exception for that. In any case, uh, this is how I create my template then. I just come in here, say, take a stack layout, give it children, give it a horizontal stack layout that'll put the icon and the, the title next to one another. And then guess what I put under it? Ta-da! This is what I was talking about, the content presenter. You can throw this bad boy in any of your custom controls and then you can add UI into it when using the icon, it'll just present it there, right? So think of it as a page. The whole page is one big content presenter. You can put whatever you want in there, that'll be your content. And that's what I'm doing here. I want my card to be just the just shell. I don't want to use that word. Just the layout, right? Just the layout for a, a user to use on in their view. What you really should be focusing on is the content inside the view. So anyway, we have the same thing for title template. And in this case, the only difference is that there are only two children. There's a title, a title label and the presenter. Whereas in here, I have the icon and everything else. And that's it, right? So just, just you can see it's very simple to get started with the templates and just consume them. Now, what happens, and, and you can see here, this is what I was talking about, that this is a control uh, where right now it's just a label, but, oh, I'm not running it. If I was running it, I could show you how to reload. Let's do that next, okay? So, um, I can, instead of putting a label here, I might as well, we have some time, we can run it. Uh, I'm gonna run it, we'll see it here. And then as I make changes to the card, it should automatically update the UI thanks to our heart reload. Okay, so now we go back to cards. We see something's changed. I can come in here and say, uh, this is going to be a, ah, uh, come on. Let's just say another stack layout in here. I'm going to put a label called text, called top. Terrible naming. Text, how about detail? Right, how about I say this is a name of something and these are the details. And then we close it out, save it. Bingo, there you go. So we have a card that just happens to have a whatever we want to put inside. So uh, what's the ugliest color? Aqua, not the ugliest, <clears throat> the most visible. And there you go. <clears throat> so now I have a card that I can control how it should look from the top, from the bottom, on the right, but what goes inside, it's fine. Cool. I shouldn't have stopped, but it's okay. So now let's take a look at our other thing. So now I built a quick little app, for instance, a movie app, or I call it movie night, but let's just say it's some movie app, search app, where you launch the app, you get some nice, again, I'm not a designer, so please don't at me. <laughs> but uh, let's just say we have a, a list of items where we have an image and a translucent title on top uh, with two buttons at the bottom, right? And then what I'm gonna do is when I flip it, Look at that. When I flip it, the UI changes, right? So it, it makes much more sense to me to, to give the users a little bit more subtle touches to the UI when they are doing these things, right? So for instance, if I, if I have this view, you may, when you go horizontal, you may go from two columns to four columns. That's perfectly fine. Or what if you want to do something cool like here, where you are saying if you are in orientation, 
I'm actually showing you more data too. I'm showing you the release date for each of these movies. And you can see that the share icons are now up in, in vertical. They have a little divider thingy here. And when you go back, when you have less real estate, I take away the year. You don't need to know that. We all know when all these movies came out, right? Uh, and if I search, you can see that it, it stays there. So if I turn it uh, and again, continue searching, it it's, sticks to that. So it's pretty cool, right? That it's it's doing that. Now, how am I getting this done? Is that I have a custom control called movie item. Let's take a look at that. Um, now my movie item is a content view. Similarly has two control templates. Uh, some, some basic stuff here we'll take a look at. I have some properties like title, year, avatar, right? It's a new keyword I use for icons. I don't know. Uh, and then here are my content views, right? Which I built in C Sharp, but you can again, build them in XAML, whatever your heart content. Uh, I do my uh, UIs in both use, uh, C Sharp and XAML, just depending on how I feel about a control. So yeah. In here, I have a title again and an icon and this is where the magic happens. So I have a name, name stack which shows the name. I'm giving you some color, some you know transparency, all that good stuff. I have an icon stack, which is the share and the, and the favorite icon, which if you are paying attention, you notice I just threw images there. These are not buttons. <laughs> but yeah, you didn't see that. Uh, then I have a grid uh, that sets a lot up, right? So, so this grid sets the icon on the top left, the name on the top left as well, but it pushes it out. Uh, and uh, I mean, the name stack which shows up on, on top of the image. And then I have an icon stack in the next row, right? And then I just say, this is my content. But for the horizontal one, I am changing some, the rest of the stuff is still the same, right? The stack and everything else. Well, I changed a little bit because I'm adding more things to it. Uh, but this is where this is where the change really happens, where now in that we are in horizontal, I can say, okay, put an icon to the left, put a name stack to the middle, uh, and then icon stack to the right. Now, the difference is that when I'm in horizontal configuration, see, I don't need this middle uh, section or middle column to be transparent anymore because it's not an overlay, right? So I just change the color too. So I just go from this translucent blue to an, a solid blue, right? So anyway, same, same data, just different configuration showing differently. Now, how now you may be thinking, well, it's a collection view. Like, you know, how are you passing in the, the control, how you how it should render? Should it be horizontal, vertical? Well, that's where we thanks to our little friend called Xamarin Essentials. Uh, I created a little bit of a, I'm just uh, observing or I'm uh, subscribing to the display events and I'm just seeing if I'm in portrait mode or landscape mode. Uh, again, it may not work for your case, it works for mine. So I can put this control anywhere in the app. And if the app is in, in portrait mode or landscape mode, my control will know how to behave, right? Now we talked a lot about this and I think we're doing good on time still. So we talked a lot about this. We, we see how the search thingies work. So let's look at a page, right? So like right now, if we look at our main page.saml, uh, we have a page that has a search bar. Nope, not in this one. Menu page.saml. Yep. So here you go. So we have a page that we're looking at right now. Uh, it's just a stack layout, has a couple of buttons, has an image. Uh, oh, I forgot to show you guys something. In my main page, if you noticed, for my control, for my movie item control, I'm actually binding these properties, right? So these properties are not passed in as a parameter or, or anything like this. They're bound to your binding context, uh, which in my case, it's it's Prism, you know, uh, my framework of choice. But all of the all of these items that are going into the movie are all bound to the view model, right? So we get data binding 
pretty easily here. Uh, I have I have three properties that we looked at. I have an avatar year and a title. And the, these properties have a the template looks for the property uh, by that name and then just gets the value. Boom, data binding done. Okay, so this is our page, right? We have this page, background color. I think as I saw someone say red. So there you go, Ugh, your evil dreams come true. So we have a stack, we can see that it's taken up the space and then we're using safe space. So it's gonna leave some of that at the end. So we have a nice little icon at the bottom. It's, it's kind of transparent, have two things. What if I want to change this, right? Like for example, when you go into landscape mode, uh, it looks okay, but what if I wanna change this? So in the next 10 minutes or so, let's go ahead and change this page. So I'm going to say this particular view that has um, two buttons, the each button have just a command. I don't have a binding or a view model for this uh, for this page because I don't need it. All I need is to navigate and, and thanks to Prism XAML navigation, I can just bring in the namespace, say navigate to and well, I'm done. So I here I just have two pages that I'm navigating to and I have an image source that's coming from somewhere, right? So I'm gonna take this and get rid of it. Now, when we are using a custom control or a custom page or whatnot, if we are using templates, we don't need to set the content on the page directly anymore because we want the templates to decide or templates to, to dictate what to show on the screen. So here, you just saw I removed my view. Now I did cheat a little bit. So if, if you go back to my to my tree, I have actually a folder now called menu page. I come in here and I actually created that layout here under a vertical template. Uh, and in this case, you see, I can also create in XAML. Uh, so I created a XAML template uh, with the same view, right? So with the, with the same view where I have a stack layout, two buttons, go. But I also have a horizontal template that works a little differently. In this case, I have a different stack configuration, a different sized image, same buttons, right? But in a different place on the screen. So what I want to do is in my menu page, my menu page, my menu page.saml.cs. Here, I wanna do some, some, some stuff, right? So what I'm gonna do is, well, before I do that, how many of you have done on or used on size allocated override to, to, to check if, if we were in horizontal mode or portrait mode? I have. Uh, yeah, side note. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to use our handy Xamarin Essentials to tell me what's going on, right? <clears throat> so I'm gonna come in here and say, uh, what was it called? Main display, nope, it's called device. Display dot main display info changed. Thank you for IntelliSense for not checking up my things, good. Uh, and what I want to do here is, I just subscribe to my, to the device orientation change. And now what I want to do is, based on what orientation I'm in, I wanna change my content view. So let's see. Here I'm gonna say, content template, uh, control template. Let's try again. Control template, there you go. Now I want to see my display info dot orientation. <clears throat> if orientation is portrait, I want you to use, what I want you to use, I need those. I, I don't wanna new them up every time. So let's come up here, create them as read only. Control template, call it vertical menu, sure. Uh, and then because my control template actually are our control templates, I'm just gonna say vertical menu template. And let's do the same thing to our horizontal control template. 
Oop. Um, oh, plus for the name, not bad. Hor uh, new horizontal menu template. So we're a little bit off screen, so just take a look at this. Now what happens is when the device display changes, we get this uh, event org, the display info chain, it has a bunch of things in it, right? So if you go in here, it has, um, oh, no, 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 uh, I'll, I'll just go in here. So it has display info, and in the display info, we get a bunch of things like uh, the rotation, the screen density, the height of the screen, all that good stuff, right? But we're not doing that. We just we just care about the orientation. Uh, okay, so now that I have these two, I'm gonna say if we are in portrait mode, set the vertical, right? Otherwise, set the horizontal, and be done with it. So if I save, I probably have to rerun it because I made changes to the non xaml bits. But it's pretty quick. We can do it. We have time. So now what's gonna happen is. You just saw me do the controls. Uh, you just saw me do the, the little thingy in the control where I'm changing orientation. And now I want to do that to the page. But guess what happened? Well, this will only get called when actually the orientation changes. But what about if I want to have something when the page loads, right? So what I could do is I can come down here and say device display. I'm going to send give you a sender and then say device display dot main display dot orientation. So when the app loads, oh, needs to be a event org. There you go. So now when the app launches or the page is initialized, I will send it the current configuration so it knows what to do. Okay, what happened? Oh, not the orientation. I have to pass in the display info. So I'm just calling it, like kind of hijacking it to say, hey, also when you create the page and you are done um, subscribing to it, go ahead and, and do this. Uh, and then of course, I would want to do something like disposable or, or dispose this so I can actually unsubscribe to this event, right? So just make sure you you be a good developer and don't leave these things hanging around. Okay, so now we created the, the page templates. We have a mechanism to switch them. Uh, and now you see when we, I launched the app, I didn't hard code it to be vertical. I just said, hey, just, just take whatever is in there right now and then just set it up that way. So now what happens? Drum rolls, ta-da. So as I rotate, I want the app to look a little bit nicer, right? So I bring that, Brainiac icon on, on, on the side and leave the controls. So now if I go into the controls, you notice that if I go into the movies, the movie control is also in, in landscape mode, right? It didn't change to vertical because I'm doing the same thing that on initialize, make sure you have the right configurations uh, orientation so you use the right template. Now if I go back, it goes to vertical, horizontal, vertical. I can do that all day. But that's essentially it, right? So now we will just do some cleanup here to say uh, IntelliSense. I may say disposable is gonna say use system. All right, I know I can let it do it, but I like typing. So I'm gonna come down here and say dispose, and then let's just go ahead and do this. Now, sometimes I've seen people do event subscribing and unsubscribing at page appearing and disappearing. Uh, that is fine. It just depends on your use case because I don't like to do that because I can, I'm not too sure if I can control that, right? So for example, if I leave the page and I change orientation and come back to the page, the page doesn't know because it unsubscribed anyway. Uh, okay, so we have about five minutes left. Um, we're done with this. Uh, we looked at this. Now let's go ahead and switch over to the demo. Okay, so 
what did we see? We saw um, how to create templates. We saw how to uh, consume them. We saw how to create them in XAML. We saw how to create them in C Sharp. Uh, we learned something about data binding, how to bind them to properties that don't exist in the template, but it should be in the ancestor or the parent control somewhere in the tree. Uh, we learned how to change them on at runtime. So you see me doing it in uh, in orientation change, but you could be doing that in any way, right? So it doesn't have to be that. So you may be changing it based on uh, like incoming message versus outgoing message, right? So I know we currently use the item selector uh, in, in list views, but we could just simply use these and then throw them in a collection view. So what you saw in the demo was a collection view uh, using these controls, and then the controls were just jumping all over the place. Uh, okay, so what's next? Well, there are a couple of resources for you guys to uh, explore and then see what you can do this. I'm sure someone watching will, will say, I can think of one place in my app where I can probably use this, right? So here are a couple of resources. The first one is my my blog from, from 2018. It's still very relevant, so just, just take a look. Uh, the best place is Microsoft documentation, so I will definitely start from there as well. Uh, and then if you want to see the card view example I just showed in my control, that's also there. And the code for today will be available through the, the, the event as well, but this is the direct uh, link if you want to play around with it now and then see what you get. Um, and that's it. So. Uh, I will open up to questions and and see where we go from there. Um, okay, let's open for questions. No questions means two things, people. One, I did good, and everybody know what I was talking about. Two, I did terrible, and no one knows what I'm talking about. Like me at a data science conference. I'm just like, what? Okay, so I got one question from Steven Thurston that can we use that in uh, in a, so the question is, would you use this, something like this, if you want to, for example, create a base page type situation where you are swapping out content on a, on a page level? Absolutely, yeah. So um, think, of, think of the menu page we just created, right? So imagine if you have a profile page. You have a profile page. When you go to your, go to your profile page, you may have, a really big profile, you may have a tiny profile, right? You may be showing them a card view, you may be showing them a, a more detailed view, and you wanna be able to change all that based on the whole page. So at that point, you don't know where your controls may end. Um, same thing goes for tablets. So what? let's say you have, currently we can do things like tablet page and a mobile page and then do that, but what if we just wanna do something simple where, hey, if you're on a tablet, place my items, like lay out my, my my page this way. So for example, the movies thing, uh, we may say on a tablet, keep my movies on the left, and when I tap on one, show me the detail on the right. Same thing for dual screens. So we can create our base page and say, I don't know, we call it responsive page or something. Uh, and then based on some parameters or changes in your, in your app, just change the whole control template of your page. Uh, and the page will just know what to do. Right, so that's uh, <clears throat> I've used control templates on tablets without actually having to have a full-blown tablet design support. I've just uh, done small things for the customers to say, I know you are not asking for tablet design uh, to be drastically different, but here's some nice subtleties that your controls will look different on tablet just because you have bigger real estate, right? So uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I have done page base page level things like this. Uh, and I think it's a great use case for that as well. All right, any questions? Do, 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 do. Foldables. Uh, I'm gonna put foldables and dual screens in the same bucket right now. Um, but I have I have yet to play with them. So I played with dual screens uh, a couple of months ago, right? When it, when actually last year when the emulators came out. And I haven't done a lot of work there to really have a use case for me, but I think control the the dual screen is a, is a perfect candidate for that as well, where you can just reduce a lot of this overhead and be more productive if we have better templates instead of creating all these pages to to work on 
different configurations. That's what I would think. What's the structure? Don't know to add anything. Is Sync Fusion a good library to use control templates? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked at it. I mean, I've used Sync Fusion, uh, and I've actually used Telerik in my one of my last projects. But I don't. Something. Oh, I know what's ringing. My timer. But I have. Uh, sorry, this is uh, annoying. I hope you can not hear this. Okay, it's gone. It's okay. It's okay. Everything is okay. People, no need to panic, including myself. Uh, so, so no, I have to. Um, I have to. I would have to see more uh, on on what it is, but. I, I think the last time I worked with the uh, Telerik controls, I don't want to I don't want to say that definitely, but I think they also use a lot of uh, control templates to modify their UIs too. But I'm not sure, so I don't want to speak for them and have someone yell at me on Twitter. Uh, so the question from Jan Biederman: Are you able to nest multiple templates? Huh? I have not tried that. I have not tried that. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I have not tried that because, well, yeah. Sorry, can't answer that one. Maybe I should try it and then stream about it in next Thursday or one of those Thursdays, but not not right now. I do not, I have not tried it. So, sorry. Um, what else? What else? Page, okay, so there's another question that I may have missed uh, from John. I often use this on all my pages to make sure that all pages are background. Oh, it's gone. All my background images are even loading. Okay, yeah, that that's a good way to use it. Uh, you could nest multiple content right on each content view set control template. I mean, yeah, so it again, I haven't done it, but yeah, it could be tricky, but definitely try it and let us know uh, on Twitter. I can I can play around with the, that as well and see what I can find and share that. So uh, yeah, not bad. but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't want to say it's a good idea or not, uh, because you may have a need where you may have a page that ha that is templated, and then you have controls inside that page that are also templated, and then those controls may have children that may be templated. So uh, it it will be a little bit of uh, challenging to to do all that. But if you're only doing it once, right, you can you can get it done. But um, I've not done it. Probably will be interesting to do so. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's good. Uh, I think we are not getting any more questions. People know everything they need to know about control templates, except for the last few questions. We'll we'll cut it out of the video, no problem. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so um, if you want to keep up um, uh, or keep up on on what I'm up to, uh, please follow on on Twitter, and then you can see my shenanigans there. Um, my Twitch is on here as well, so I Twitch on Thursdays, or at least I try to Twitch to do every Thursday on Xamarin things. Um, and then my blog is on the very right side, which is teleapp.com, where I also do a Xamarin blog. So uh, you can reach me out there if you have any questions regarding control templates or anything Xamarin that I can help you with quick uh, quick questions. So I get asked a lot of times uh, small questions on Twitter, DMs, and, and I'm happy to help. So if you have anything else, let me know. Um, I think that's, uh, I'm not getting any more questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, I hope to see you guys again in a different event. This time I'm, I'm in Europe, you know, in spirit. Uh, next time we'll, we'll talk at a different conference. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'll see you later. Well, thanks a lot. That was really, really interesting. Um...
you got a lot of questions and thank you for answering them right away. Yeah, it was uh, great. Yeah. Um, so we are right now you're in Houston and we're going to move even farther west where it's even earlier. And um, we've got Dan Siegel coming up. I'm going to remove you from the stream and uh, make sure to, to send us any slide text so, so we can post them on GitHub. All right. Bye, right. everyone. Say hi to Dan for me. Good friend of mine. <laughs> Hold on. I'll put him on early. Hello, Hussein. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> hey, Dan. Good to see you, too. Good luck. Have fun. Oh, yeah. It should be fun. It's like 6 o'clock in the morning here. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's we are we are it's eight here. So, you know, I, I'm day. wishing that we were in Europe right now because it's the middle of the afternoon and totally appropriate to be drinking a beer right now. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, if I were to do that here at six o'clock in the morning, people might start asking questions <laughs> and uh, might be a little inappropriate. I don't know. <laughs> probably you probably will be. But yeah, okay. uh, good luck with the Thanks. talk. Uh, I'll Thanks. see you guys later. Bye-bye. See you Thanks, later. Bye-bye. There might not be any people awake to notice you drinking beer, though. <laughs> well, only here on the West Coast. You know, they're, they're still trying to get their coffee, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, welcome. And you are going to talk to us about uh, mobile DevOps, DevOps today. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm excited about this upcoming session. And I'm going to hand over to you. Sounds good. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Um, it is definitely a pretty interesting year here. Uh, I do miss uh, being with all of you in person, but uh, it is great to be with all of you in spirit uh, here on uh, YouTube. Uh, so that's kind of fantastic that uh, we have these new ways that we can get together and, and communicate and work together. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the talk today is uh, going to be a little DevOps 101, uh, mobile DevOps for Xamarin applications. Uh, if that's not why you're watching, I don't know why you're watching, but uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, so obviously, uh, I am Dan Siegel. I'm a Microsoft MVP, uh, and I work as a mobile app consultant. I do a lot of training and project rescues and kind of guidance on uh, how to build uh, different apps when I'm not actually building uh, the app. So lots of things that I, I do, lots of uh, really bad scenarios that I come across in my time. Uh, of course, uh, I am a mobile and uh, DevOps champion, which is, uh, you know, kind of why I can speak on this subject. Uh, you know, it's a, a huge passion of mine. Uh, and of course, a lot of you know me uh, as an uh, open source author and uh, maintainer for the Prism library. Um, a little shameless uh, plug, you know, because I have to have the shameless plugs. Uh, you can, of course, follow me there on uh, Twitter, Twitch, subscribe to my YouTube. Um, and something kind of newer this year is, uh, you know, they've opened up the GitHub sponsors, which is actually a really fantastic way uh, that you can help to support your favorite open source uh, libraries and, and maintainers. Uh, you know, whether it's me, whether it's someone else like Alan Ritchie, uh, there are just so many of them out there. Uh, definitely encourage you to kind of uh, help keep open source sustainable. Uh, for those of you who maybe uh, have a company budget, and I know there are some of you out there who do, um, you know, talk to your boss and have them, uh, you know, kind of help those libraries that you guys are using and relying on uh, to kind of, you know, make money, right? So uh, if you're making money off of it, you know, give a little something back uh, to the community. That way, those libraries are going to be around for a very long time for you. All right, so what is on the agenda today? Um, so first up, we're gonna talk about why DevOps is really so important. Um, and, and we have a lot to talk about, so uh, hopefully I don't talk too fast for all of you. Um, if I do, you know, the good thing is this is on YouTube, so you can always uh, play it back at like 0.5x speed later, I guess, right? Um, but uh, we're going to talk about uh, why it's so important and uh, why you probably started your project wrong, uh, as well as some common problems in code that we face, particularly uh, in the Xamarin world. Um, you know, it. I think like a lot of developers, uh, you know, I actually came into Xamarin from a more web background. Uh, so, you know, I was used to having some sort of web config uh, that I could have with my application. And uh, that would, you know, 
uh, make it very easy for me to get things like connection strings and and whatever settings I needed into my application uh, without putting that directly into code. Uh, and there just isn't a way to do that very easily uh, in Xamarin. So we're going to look at kind of, uh, you know, what some of those issues are and kind of how we uh, might solve some of them. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about my camera going out apparently. Um, <laughs> so I will have to get that camera back here. Uh, my camera didn't have coffee, I guess. Let's see if I can get that back on here. Um, give me just a minute while I get that going again. I kind of love these technical glitches that first thing in the morning here. If I can, where did it go? Let's see. We'll get that back in a minute, I think, here. In any case, um, while I'm doing that, so uh, we're going to talk about kind of getting started as well, uh, setting up kind of a simple uh, CI build with App Center. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'm going to talk about why I actually prefer Azure Pipelines and um, kind of how you can use that uh, to your benefit there. Let's see here. Let's fix this. I'll get up. Sorry. Same time I'm trying to fix this camera. Um, I think it's time for the new, uh, what is it, the Hero 9 or whatever. Um, this thing is, don't mind all the beeping. Let's see. Get this going again, maybe. Of course, I just dropped. Yeah. Well, that may be a little challenging. But anyway. Let's get this going here. All right, so why DevOps um, is so important. Uh, the, the One of the big things I kind of come across a lot is I think that there's uh, this sense that DevOps is really complex and really scary <laughs> for a lot of developers. Uh, and that kind of keeps you from uh, doing, you know, what you know you need to do. Um, while at the uh, same time, uh, you know, you, you're making design decisions uh, that are ultimately going to impact you and make your life just a little bit more difficult. Um, and, you know, part of it is it, it's kind of like this giant puzzle, um, you know, because you have uh, a repo that you have to deal with and you have uh, kind of trigger A that has to work with project B and you know, you have to provision project B on developer site C and sign away your first born child. You know, I, I know a few people with children. Luckily, I don't have any uh, that I'm currently aware of or financially responsible for. But for my friends that do, um, I know a few of them that would gladly give away the first child. They're constantly trying to. Uh, nobody seems to take them, though. Um, oh, well, <laughs> I guess sucks to be them. Uh, in any case... Uh, one of the things you need to do is kind of ask, what are your project goals? And, uh, you know, to, to do that, you know, you kind of want to do like this little game of like this or that, right? Uh, so you want to ask like, where is this going? My computer is like not happy this morning. I think I needed to get my computer coffee instead of me. Uh, but you want to ask, uh, you know, do you want to prove that you can write code? Or do you want to actually solve a business problem? Now, that business problem could be that the birds are angry. Um, if you didn't get that reference, I don't know where you've been. But, <laughs> uh, you know, you probably want to solve that business problem, right? Uh, you want to ask, do you want to just debug locally? Or do you want to deploy to users? Uh, do you want to be the center of attention? Or do you want to take vacations? I know, uh, well, we call it vacations here in America, but I know a lot of other people call it holiday, but whatever, we'll say vacations because I'm American and that's what we do. Uh, do you want to worry about every release or do you want to just get an email that something happened kind of overnight, right? Um, you know, I see this over and over and over again, and this is not in any shape, way, or form uh, specific to Xamarin, you know, this is purely a DevOps issue uh, where I see people that, um, you know, that it, it's basically an all hands on deck event. 
every single time uh, you have uh, a DevOps uh, or you know any kind of release, right? And you have like your monthly release and every single person in, in the programming department has to come in and deal with it and figure it out. And then inevitably there's some sort of problem and you have to do a rollback and nobody got a weekend and everybody's upset and, you know, reports are being written and uh, it's, it's just not a, a good uh, thing to be dealing with. And so we don't want to, uh, you know, we don't want to do that at all uh, if we can at all avoid it. Um, so let's just not, right? Like we want DevOps as part of our process. But one of the things that so many people forget here is that, um, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, DevOps is kind of, and really building your app is uh, a lot like building a house. You wouldn't try to build the house before you built the foundation, right? Like, is it going to be a solid foundation? Do you need to put it on piers? Like, how does that look? If you don't, if you didn't answer those questions, the house is not going to stand very long. It's going to fall over. Uh, and it's the same exact way uh, with building your app. If you didn't start, um, you know, knowing that you needed uh, to have DevOps as part of it, you're probably going to make design decisions that are going to negatively impact uh, your application. Oh, there we are. We're starting to get back here. <laughs> Um, let's see if I can fix the zoom on this here. Uh, in any case, so you, you want to uh, make sure that things, uh, are kind of being done correct from the beginning. And so that's why I wanted to kind of leave you with a quote. Um, well, okay. Maybe not this quote. Uh, although it's probably true. You can always count on Americans to do the right thing after we've tried everything else. But, uh, Anyway, no, the, the real quote here uh, is uh, from a really good author, uh, uh, one of my favorite authors anyway, uh, Stephen Covey. Uh, you want to begin with the end in mind, right? So when you begin with the end in mind, it, uh, you know, it's setting you up for success uh, because you know roughly where you want to go, right? Like nobody knows for sure where they're going to end up, right? Like I, I don't think if you asked... Uh, Bill Gates, or if you uh, asked Jeff Bezos, or if you asked, you know, Elon Musk, um, that, you know, would they be where they are today? I don't think any of them could have really dreamt that big and, and realized that they were going to get quite there. Um, but they had to have a general direction that they absolutely wanted to go. And you have to do the same when you're building an app here. Um, so my new app checklist probably looks a little bit different than yours. Now, what I see most people do is they open Visual Studio. So like the first parts are, are kind of the same. They open Visual Studio, they create a new project, and then they start building their app. See, my, my new app checklist is a little bit different. Um, you know, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to configure the base project settings, things that are actually important. Uh, that I need, like I want to make sure that my bundle ID uh, is correct so I can go to Apple, the Apple developer portal um, and, uh, you know, get my provisioning profile set up and kind of get the signing certificate set up uh, for development or production. Uh, but I'm going to do that and then I'm going to close Visual Studio. I'm going to initialize that Git repo. I'm going to check it in. I'm going to push it to GitHub or Azure repos or Bitbucket, wherever uh, I need to put, uh, you know, the source uh, for my source control, I'm gonna put it up there as quick as possible. And it, it's a stupid, like there's nothing really unique about this, right? Um, and then the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a DevOps pipeline. And I wanna do that so that every design decision that I make is now revolving around this idea that uh, you know I have a CI build that needs to be dealt with, right? So that way, every single build, even if it's the hello world from the Xamarin Forms template, or you know, even if I'm doing Xamarin native, right? So whatever that that template gave me, uh, I want to make sure that my client, 
uh, or if I was, you know, working for someone, you know, I want my coworker or my boss to be able to download that and put that on their phone and run it without me having to be there or without me having to do anything. It should be very, very simple for them to do that. All right. So what are some common uh, problems in code that we have, right? Um, well, I, I think probably one of the first things that we see, uh, and no offense to Microsoft, love them. They make great products. They make some bad ones too, but <laughs> it doesn't everybody. Uh, but uh, one of the biggest problems is that, uh, and this is not unique to Microsoft, this is the entire development world. Uh, for any technology that you're working with, you're going to get like the the most basic hello world samples of how to get started with something. So, uh, you know, I'm going to pick on App Center here for a second, uh, and and we'll say that okay, I went into App Center, and uh, you know, I, I I created a new app in App Center. Well, they give me this uh, kind of starter code to say, okay, we'll add these namespaces, add this line of code, and now you've got the App Center SDK running in your application, um, which is fine and dandy, uh, but you know, the, now you're checking in uh, code that actually has uh, the string for your client ID. And that's probably not what you want uh, because what I find is our applications don't live uh, in this simplistic world uh, where, you know, you, you have one environment. Um, in fact, it's probably one of my biggest complaints about App Center is that they always built this as if you have a single app on a single platform in a single environment. And that's not true, right, for any of us. Uh, we have an application that is on multiple platforms uh, and you're going to be dealing with multiple environments. You're going to have a dev environment. You're, well, well, some of us are going to have a stage environment. Some of us may have uh, user acceptance testing uh, that we have to go through. So that could be you know, its own environment with its own backend and everything else. And then we finally, we, you know, we eventually get out uh, to production, whatever that looks like. It could be an enterprise app. Uh, so we're not on the app store, you know, we're on some company portal somewhere, uh, but it could also be in the app store uh, or on Google Play, right? Um, you know, you don't want this hard coded, uh, you know, string here uh, for your client ID where you're sending everything to one location and now you're mixing up data from production and from dev and and everything else that's just going to be a huge huge mess uh, so you don't want you obviously don't want this in your code so how you know how are you going to deal with that right well uh, one way that i see over and over again uh, and don't worry these i literally went to like you know random generator.com or whatever it is um so these are not real uh <laughs> ids uh, just fyi but uh i don't know actually maybe they are i mean i guess it's possible um if they are valid it's not going to hit my account so do whatever you want uh <laughs> but uh you know you you can you know certainly create a a static class like this uh where you know now you have access to this um, and it's not quite as bad, right? Like where you see, uh, the use of, uh, uh, you know, the ID is, you know, kind of separated a little bit. It's separated out into another class as a, a constant value. Um, but that's still not very good because you're still checking this in and maybe you had some sort of weird logic to try to figure out, you know, was it a dev build, was it a release build, whatever, uh, you know, and I see that over and over where people do like if def kind of stuff to get the correct value. Um, but that's still not a great solution. You're checking all that into source control. And this is really a configuration value that you need to figure out a little bit later. Uh, but it doesn't stop there, right? Um, you know, this is actually from the MSAL uh, library docs. Uh, so the MSAL library, if uh, you're not familiar with that, uh, is the uh, library from Microsoft to work with Azure Active Directory and Azure Active Directory B2C uh, for authentication. Um, and they were actually nice enough to uh, take my code sample and not give me any credit for it in their docs. 
for Android. So that way you didn't have to do it in the XML, but um, whatever. I'm used to them stealing my stuff uh, in any case. Uh, so, you know, you do have kind of this mix where you could actually do, um, you know, this declaration in the Android manifest uh, uh, .xml uh, for the browser tab activity. Uh, and then you need to add this data scheme with your client ID. Uh, and then you have like the info P list. Uh, you know, of course you could also do this in code. Uh, so you have all of these different things you know, beyond just like App Center, right? Like uh, this kind of pops up over and over and over. Uh, on the previous slide, like you probably saw, uh, I had like a back end, right? You know, which you know which of our apps don't have a back end, right? Like probably ninety nine plus percent uh, have some sort of back end that they're working with, and that back end probably is changing. You know. Um, you know, if you're working on an app that consumes a public API, my guess is you may not be changing from one environment to the next, I guess. Um, but I would say that's more of the edge case rather than the norm, right? So uh, we want to have some way that we can kind of deal with this. Uh, and, and that's kind of why uh, I always tell people just use the mobile build tools. Uh, so the mobile build tools, it's powered by MS build. So you're not writing a script for every single project out there. Um, you know, not all of us are Jerome LeBon that loves to write scripts apparently. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very simple, right? Like I can uh, install a NuGet. Uh, it's build platform agnostic. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you decide that you want to use GitHub Actions or if you want to use Avair, uh, there are literally more, uh, you know, build platforms out there than I can remember off the top of my head. Um, there are quite a few of them out there. Um, so, but it will work anywhere that .NET will, will build, right? Uh, because this is just MS build. So anywhere that you can build a Xamarin application, it's going to work. Uh, because you're going to use MS build to build that. Um, and it works for Xamarin native as well as Xamarin forms and Uno platform. So this is just something that works across the board. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, specific to Xamarin forms or anything. Um, in, in fact, I mean, parts of this actually work in net standard. So, um, you know, it could work on a console application realistically. Uh, so what are some of the features here? Uh, well, the core feature has always been about those secrets. Uh, so, you know, I showed you that static class uh, to kind of begin this. Uh, and that's always kind of been that core goal was to kind of get that where I could generate that class at build uh, rather than having to uh, kind of check that class into source control. Uh, so we kind of have uh, that and in V2, which is currently in preview, uh, there is going to be a new preview coming out uh, probably in the next week or two. So I'll give you a little bit of a, a teaser on what is coming here very soon, uh, you know, uh, with like the last couple things. But uh, all this, all the rest of it is actually available right now. Uh, so you have some improvements in V2 that it now supports every single primitive type out there. Why you would use some of them, I have no bloody idea. Um, but they're there. <laughs> uh, and uh, as well as some other common types that you might want to use, like a URI or a GUID, date time, date time offset. Uh, all of those are there. Uh, you can also make things into an array uh, if you need, like, uh, you know, the, it actually came up uh, a while back where someone was saying, you know, that they wanted to, you know, have a scopes and that needed to be an array. Uh, and rather than kind of parsing that, uh, you know, in their code, they just kind of wanted it out of the box to be an array, uh, which I can kind of understand. So uh, that uh, that now works. Um, one of the, the other things, and I know that this has kind of been a hot topic in the Xamarin Forms community. It is a love or hate thing uh, where either you love Xamarin Forms CSS or you absolutely hate it. Um, I don't really care which camp you're in. If you hate it, don't use it. <laughs> if you love it, um, you know, if you come from the web background, you probably love CSS like I do. Um, 
And so the mobile build tools will actually give you the ability to use uh, uh, SAS and then generate the Xamarin Forms compliant CSS, which uh, just for the record, Xamarin Forms CSS is not actually compliant CSS, just FYI. Um, it will break uh, linters. In any case, <laughs> One of the other things uh, it has done for quite a while is copy uh, your IPA or APK. Uh, we also now do a lot of image processing. Uh, this includes like watermarking, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, there's now app config support in V2. Um, uh, it will generate some basic Git-based release notes for you, and there are going to be some improvements kind of coming uh, over the next year on that as well. There's a whole JSON-based configuration uh, that also has a schema, so that way you get the IntelliSense in your uh, IDE uh, or your editor, like you know VS Code. Um, and then what's kind of coming in the next couple of weeks, uh, which I'm really excited about, uh, is the tokenized info P list in Android Manifest. Uh, so if we kind of were to go back uh, and you saw the the docs there from MSAL, we can now put some sort of token in there that will get replaced. Uh, at build, uh, so you're never checking in what the actual client ID is, uh, but that will be in the actual generated info P list that is in the IPA uh, or in the a uh, APK in the case of Android, um, depending on which one you're doing, obviously. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, which I always kind of found annoying, <laughs> was there's no real good way uh, to deal with your uh, Apple push uh, environment, right? Like you go, okay, well, it's development. Well, now I'm ready for release. What do I do? And so mobile build tools, uh, V2 is also going to be dealing with that, uh, as part of that update as well. And it looks like my camera is really upset with me this morning. <laughs> oh, well guys, I guess, uh, it is just not meant to be today in any case. Um, so kind of how do we deal with these uh, secrets? Well, um, we're gonna generate those app secrets and the configuration uh, with a JSON file. And it, you know it's gonna look basically like this, right? Uh, you're gonna have a key, you're gonna have a property, and we're just gonna parse it. Um, and there's a configuration file I'm not gonna go into because uh, we do have, um, you know, a, a, a whole doc site that, you know, if you go to mobilebuildtools.com, uh, you can uh, read all the docs on this uh, at your leisure there. Uh, but this one file is very, very easy to exclude from source control. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you don't have an exclude for it in your git ignore, the mobile build tools will actually ignore it uh, automatically, it will add the ignore for you uh, in V2. <laughs> Uh, so on that simplified image handling, so I'm actually really kind of excited about the image handling that we're doing in version two. So uh, this has kind of been a long time issue that I've faced, and I know a lot of other people have faced as well, where you want to be able to have side-by-side -side, uh, installations of the same exact app. And obviously that's going to require that you have you know, a different uh, app ID or bundle ID, uh, you know, for, you know, dev or stage or production, whatever your different environment is. And, you know, but the, the problem is you probably have the same icon, right? And, and now how do you handle the icons? And there are just so bloody many of them, you know, all these different resolutions you got to deal with across Android and iOS. And uh, it's it's really painful to deal with. And uh, so what uh, we're actually doing now is saying, look, all you need to worry about is that uh, high resolution source image. And then all of the different output resolutions we're gonna deal with for you automatically. Uh, anything that's not necessarily an app icon, but just uh, an image asset that you might have uh, in your application, uh, you know, just provide what the highest resolution is. Uh, if you have it in a higher resolution than what you actually need it, you can actually downscale it uh, from there. Uh, you can do all kinds of different things. Uh, you can add a watermark image uh, to any icon or, or image that you want. Uh, we can actually draw a banner, you know, so you get like a little thing and you can position it on the top or in one of the corners. 
Uh, you can control the the what the text is, what the font of the text is, the color of the text, the background. Um, you can do like whole custom gradients with it. Um, it's a very, very powerful API. Uh, and then you can also generate multiple outputs for that one input image. And a couple of examples uh, to kind of give you some ideas on this. Uh, you know, on Android, you commonly see like there's an icon and then the launcher foreground, uh, which is basically the same icon, but it's kind of scaled a little bit differently. Well, you can have that, that same input image do both of them for you. Uh, so you don't have to have multiple versions of the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, one of the other uh, kind of common things, uh, so if, whether you're on Android or whether you're on uh, iOS, uh, you probably, well, I don't want to say probably, you you may, <laughs> um, you, you may kind of have noticed that, uh, you know, you, you have what the actual icon is, but you want that same image uh, to be able to use somewhere in your application. Um, but, you know, I can't use necessarily the, the actual app icon from the app icon set on uh, iOS, and I may not be able to use the MitMap uh, resource uh, very easily from within my application. Uh, now on native code, you know, that could be a little bit different, but uh, certainly from Xamarin Forms, it's not as easy. And so I can, uh, I can just, you know, say, okay, well, we're going to have the MitMap resources here on uh, Android, and then I also want it in the drawable. Um, as you know, this other uh, you know image, and it could be the same name. It's just in drawable instead of mitmap. Uh, you can customize the name, uh, so it's very very powerful. What you uh, want to do, uh, you can add backgrounds. Uh, so, kind of something I see a lot that people will do is on Android, uh, you have a transparent background on your icon. Uh, obviously, on iOS, uh, it's kind of required that your app icon have a background color. So you could have a transparent source that you add a background color to, uh, which is, you know, again, in my opinion, really, really powerful uh, to be able to do something like that. All right. So I, I know you're sitting there thinking like, this is just freaking amazing. Like, how does it do all of these things? Uh, and the answer is Dan is single. It's amazing what you can do, by the way, if you do not have a girlfriend or a wife or children you just have so much more time available. <laughs> All right. So let's look at uh, kind of configuring your first, uh, you know, CI build here. Uh, so one of the things a lot of people love about App Center is that it is very, very easy to use. Uh, in fact, you don't have to be any kind of expert uh, to get started with it. Uh, so it, it is as simple as going uh, to App Center and saying, hey, I want to connect. And it's going to ask you, you know, are you on Azure DevOps? Are you on GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab? And you're going to select it. All right. Uh, and then you're going to pick what branch and say configure build. Um, you know, it's pretty much that hard. Um, now it sounds hard, right? Like configure a build. Uh, one little note on uh, iOS, it's probably going to select the solution. Uh, do make sure you select the CS Proj that's going to drastically change uh, your uh, build time. Because um, if you're doing the solution, if it's targeting the solution, uh, it's going to want to build every single project in there rather than just whatever the iOS uh, project is uh, is looking at there. Um Obviously, you can select the Xcode version here. You can select uh, the uh, SDK. Oops, oh, sorry. Uh, you can select the SDK uh, for Xamarin iOS. Uh, you can say, I want a device build. I want a simulator build. Uh, you know, build this on every branch. Uh, manually choose when to run it. Uh, and then you can also turn on this increment uh, build number. And so that's going to uh, kind of update your info P list. Uh, there's a, a very similar thing uh, for the Android one. Um, I kind of figured, you know, you'd only need to see one. It's basically the same. <laughs> Little tiny differences, but, you know, um, iOS is probably the more complex of the two. Uh, so you can kind of choose these different things. Now, one kind of caveat uh, that that I've noticed, um, App Center is very good about telling you what the current version of the SDK is. 
What they're really bad about, however, uh, is to tell you um, or, or, or to give you an option to say, I just always want to be on the latest stable <laughs> or the latest preview. Uh, so they don't really give you that version. And that, in my opinion, is kind of irritating. Um, now, if you were to use something like the mobile build tools that I showed you before, uh, you know, I mentioned that you would exclude that secrets.json. So, you know, if you're thinking, well, how do I get that in there? It's actually very easy. Even in App Center, all I have to do is turn on environment variables. I can add those variables uh, to, uh, to my build pipeline. So I can say, okay, my App Center ID was this, my backend is this, uh, my client ID is this. And now when it builds, the mobile build tools is actually smart enough to recognize that you don't have the secrets.json locally, and it will now look at the environment uh, to construct that secrets JSON for you. Uh, so all of that uh, is really, really easy to work with. Um, this is actually really simplified from uh, V1 that uh, had a few quirks in it. Uh, so, but uh, V1 is actually still really powerful. I have a lot of apps that uh, still use it, um, but V2 kind of kind of took it to the next level and, and just made it so much more powerful, so much easier to work with. So I don't have to think about prefixes or anything. I can just say App Center ID, backend client ID, and it will work. And with that, ta-da, you've got a CI build. It was that hard. I know you guys thought it was going to be really difficult. It, it isn't, at least not with App Center. Uh, but there is a reason why I use, actually, there are a lot of reasons why I use Azure Pipelines. Uh, so a couple of reasons why I'm using Azure Pipelines. Uh, first of all, most of my builds require uh, quite a bit more than App Center can handle, at least without scripts. Uh, so one of the great things about App Center is that you can do anything you want. I mean, you basically have root level access to the machine and you can install any anything you want under the sun you can do. Uh, they don't necessarily advertise that very much, but you can do pretty much anything you want, but you have to write scripts. And again, my name is not Jerome LeBlanc and I don't want to. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> um, just because I can do something doesn't always mean I will do it. Uh, don't tell Brian that he, he swears I'm just going to do it. In any case, uh, one of the other things I really love about it is I can define my build with YAML. And defining my build with YAML now means that it's part of my source control. And as things change, as builds break, and they will break, uh, I mean, let's not kid ourselves, um, because everything that we're using, I mean, our apps are evolving, the SDKs that we're building against are evolving. And it's not just the SDKs from Xamarin, it's the SDKs from Apple and the SDKs from, uh, and, or from Google uh, for Android all of these things are changing. There are a lot of moving pieces. Operating systems are being updated. Xcode is being updated. So there's just so much that's changing. Things will break. But now these are, you know, this is now under source control and I can go back and I can look very, very easily of, of you know, who changed what, when, and why, right? Um, but I can also do things to try to help myself. And it usually helps me. <laughs> But I can use things like, um, oh, God, all my devices this morning are like turning on, turning off. It was crazy. Um, but I can use things like Boots from Jonathan Peppers uh, to make sure that my build host is on the latest stable version of Mono and the latest stable version of the iOS and Android SDK. Um, you know, if I'm building on Mac, I can actually control what version of Xcode I want. Um, regardless of what I'm, I'm on, I can uh, choose what version of .NET Core that I want very, very easily. And of course, I can run unit tests. And unlike App Center, I can actually collect those tests as part of my build. Uh, so that can fail my build. That can uh, very easily be reported. And I can go in and I can look uh, at uh, each test and see you know, what passed, what didn't pass, um, and, and kind of track that over time. I can even collect code coverage uh, as part of my build if I wanted to. 
Um, but I can also do things. And if you look at a lot of the public repos that I have, uh, some of the open source stuff, you'll see that very often, especially if I'm doing something with uh, Xamarin, I'm going to have a lot of templates. And so these are very small, manageable pieces of YAML code uh, that I can define like, hey, I just, you know, I want to make sure I have the latest NuGet version. And then I want to run NuGet Restore, right? Uh, I want to make sure that I have the latest uh, .NET SDK and then the latest NuGet version, right? I can do these things and I, I can now repeat that across each of my builds. I can do that uh, for my libraries. I can do that uh, for my uh, iOS or my Android build because those are going to be different builds, right? I'm going to, I'm not going to want to do that all at one time. It takes too bloody long, but that's another story <laughs> for another day. Uh, but I can also do some things, um, you know, like I can use community built templates, uh, like the ones from Nick Randolph. And, um, I'm not going to go into his templates here today, uh, but I definitely encourage you guys to check it out. And so you can go to pipeline templates.com, uh, which is the website that he set up uh, for the community where you can go and you can see all of these pre done YAML templates that you don't have to control. If you don't like you, I mean, you could, right. You can download them. They're all open source, um, but you can just uh, use the templates to make your YAML definition of what you need even easier um, and just simplify your life. Uh, so lots of different options for you that, uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do otherwise. Uh, so what does that pipeline kind of look like? Uh, well, you know, we're going to do things kind of the, you know, uh, the, the most basic way, right? Like, you know, so many of us, and, and this is kind of, I think, one of the problems. Uh, it has become so easy in Visual Studio to just say, you know, build and, and run and deploy. And now, uh, you know, everything just kind of works, right? Like I clicked a button, you know, it looks like a little play icon and I clicked it. And a couple minutes later, <laughs> it finished building and then it deployed to my iPhone and look at this, right? Or deployed to my, my Android device. And, you know, it's amazing. Um, but, you know, it also kind of makes us a lazy developer. And so there's a lot of power in actually understanding how some of these things work and, and kind of breaking things down, right? It's the same, it's the same kind of uh, process that goes into being a developer, right? Uh, so if you remember all the way back, uh, to when you were just starting out as a developer and, uh, you know, you went to uh, university and, and the instructor, you know, goes, okay, you know, uh, you know, print something on, on a, on the console. And you're like, okay, now how do I do that? Like, do I just write this 10 times or do I do like a, a, a while loop or, you know, for loop or something, right. And, and you have to kind of think through this, like, is there an, if, involved in this is is there a loop involved in this like and you start breaking it down the same way that we do in our, our code it's the same thing here right uh, so what are these different steps well we need to install the apple certificate if we don't have an apple certificate and we don't have a provisioning profile we're not going to get very far in building our ios app right um but then there are some other things that we can do and um, i i know you guys probably haven't heard of him uh, there's this little known member of the community. His name is James Montemagno. Um, like I said, very obscure guy. You've probably never heard of him, uh, but he actually has some helpers for Azure DevOps that you can install from the marketplace uh, into your instance. Uh, and uh, there's some things in there where you can do that bundle versioning, right? For iOS or Android. And uh, you can uh, use that build number. Um, and I, I believe it also does... Uh, the the timestamp as well. I never use it. I only ever do the build ID, to be honest. Um, but uh, you can do that. So that way you can get your version name, you can get your version code, uh, and then you can choose like if you want to print it so you can kind of see it in the logs and stuff like that. Um, and, and so, I mean, this is what we're going to do. And if you couldn't figure this out, by the way, uh, <laughs> from the names here, uh, this is actually from the Prism 
uh, CI build. So if you were to go to the Prism repo right now and look at our Azure pipeline, uh, all of this is there because we're building iOS and Android apps as part of every single CI build that we do. Um, and we actually do this for both Uno and for Xamarin Forms, which is why our pipeline takes like 45 minutes to complete for everything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it definitely you can check this out. Like if, if you miss something, don't feel like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Um, but then again, you notice I'm using a template here. And so I'm saying, hey, uh, I have this step and I wanna set the runtime. And then I wanna prepare my build. And then uh, I'm going to go here and I wanna actually build my iOS project, right? And so now I'm gonna pass in like, okay, here's where the actual CS project is and, and everything else. So I'm keeping things really nice and clean as much as I can. Uh, and, and while I don't have the screenshots for each of those templates, I, I guess I'll kind of explain here. I kind of already did, but um, you know, so like in here, uh, in the set runtime is where I'm saying like, let's go get that mono runtime. Let's, uh, you know, ensure we have the latest Xamarin SDK for iOS and Android. Uh, let's make sure that um, we have the latest, uh, you know, or we have the correct uh, uh, .NET uh, core SDK uh, that we're gonna need to build Prism uh, or your app, right? Like it's not just about Prism, <laughs> even though it's the pipeline for it. Um, you know, so, you know, it's very, very simple here to uh, kind of split these things up here. All right. And then finally, after you've built everything um, and you, you've published the artifact, which is your IPA uh, or your APK. And don't forget, by the way, if you're if you're doing this and you've got uh, your iOS build, uh, you know, be sure that you take that the sim folder that gets generated. It's all the symbols. Uh, so if you ever look at uh, App Center and you have logs that kind of come in, like especially from crashes, because uh, they're not really going to do it for analytics, like the user went to the homepage, you know, <laughs> the user logged in. Um, but uh, for, if you have crashes, they're going to need symbols. So that way they can kind of give you more uh, valuable information there. And uh, so you want to always kind of make sure you grab that. Uh, so, uh, you know, third parties like App Center can uh, have access to those symbols. Uh, but after all of that, um, you're going to have some sort of deployment, probably, right? Uh, now, you could go direct to the App Store. You could go to App Center. You could go to, you know, well, whatever you can think of, right? Like you could go to, I don't know, uh, Azure Storage. You can FTP it to, you, you know, your company server. And you can have some sort of deployment where you take, uh, you know, that uh, the IPA and the APK, and we're going to distribute it somewhere. Uh, and so all of this is very, very easy to do. So I can still use the bits and pieces uh, of App Center that I want. Uh, I can still do UI testing if I want. Now, there are some limits to that, by the way, like, um, and this has been one of my chief complaints on the UI desk for quite a while, uh, besides the fact that they take forever, uh, they never actually kind of call back. Like, there is no callback to say, hey, the UI test failed. Um, so that, that's a manual, go check it. But um, you can still send it off for UI testing. You can still uh, send it out uh, to deploy to App Center. Um, so it's not one or the other. It, it's just giving you more fine grain control over the steps that you wanted to do. Um, you know, and, and you know, if you want to do, uh, like I said, uh, unit tests, you can do those unit tests. You just have a lot more options available to you. Now, this is kind of one of the older, this is like the older style release uh, from Azure Pipelines uh, instead of the YAML base. But uh, what I do like about it and why I want to kind of show this here is it, it gives you a really good visual representation uh, for what your pipeline might look like. Uh, and I do want to take a moment um, to kind of thank the Telerik team, because I stole this from them. <laughs> but this is actually for uh, one of their um, uh, one of their demo apps that they have. And uh, so, you know, you'll see like when they check things in, like they're getting this uh, iOS App Center deployment uh, kind of coming in. So they've already built it. Uh, so they have all their artifacts and then they're deploying uh, to App Center for uh, iOS, Android, and UWP. And then they also do a deployment uh, for their web API. 
Uh, and then there's, you know, this gate. Uh, so uh, was that okay, right? And then they go to their beta uh, stage. Uh, and you can do all of this in YAML, by the way. You just don't get the pretty picture. But uh, you can still define these things. You can still, you know, make one deployment uh, reliant on another. And uh, you can provide gates so that way uh, a certain environment uh, cannot go uh, kind of too, um, like you can't get out to that environment without some sort of approval or without a certain amount of time passing. And so all of these different things are possible. And then finally, at the end, we're going out to production. Uh, so this is kind of what your pipeline uh, is going to look like or, or could look like, I should say. Um, what your pipeline should look like is entirely up to you and what your business needs are. Um, but I really hope that this gives you some ideas on kind of what it can look like and uh, what you can do, some of the power uh, that uh, that you have that you can leverage. Um, and so, yeah, with that, uh, th that's all I have for you this morning. Um, <laughs> and I know it's a little challenging here uh, as far as, uh, you know, people being able to uh, kind of ask questions. But um, if anybody has anything uh, that they would like to ask now, uh, you know, certainly do it. Uh, if, you know, you uh, need to kind of come back uh, with questions, you're, you're trying to scratch your head and digest it all, you know, don't, don't worry. <laughs> uh, you can always, uh, again, ping me on Twitter. Uh, if you're, you know, following me on Twitch, uh, always jump into chat and ask me a question. Um, you know, if you have you know comments or whatever you want to leave on YouTube, that's always great as well. Uh, now I do see here there's a question from Paul. We're currently using Atlassian tools, Bitbucket, Bamboo, etc. Uh, what's your opinion on which tooling is better, App Center, Atlassian, uh, for Xamarin projects? Um, to be honest, I, I just I never really got into bamboo i mean bitbucket is great i used bitbucket for a very long time um i don't anymore <laughs> but um you know i couldn't really tell you much about bamboo uh as far as how it compares um it just wasn't really something that uh, that i got into um you know so i i couldn't give you a direct comparison there unfortunately um but again like with app center i mean it, it's going to be very very simplistic but if you want to do anything more than that really simple, I just have a basic build, um, you're going to be writing scripts really quickly. Um, so Mark asked, does Azure Pipeline support GitLab or only GitHub? So Azure Pipelines actually does support GitLab. They actually support any Git provider. Uh, so if you have a custom uh, Git provider, um, it, it will work with that. Dan, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was that was really interesting. As, as someone who has set up a much more primitive version of this using <laughs> Jenkins and coded everything by hand, uh, I, I am just so jealous of what is possible here. Uh, and I will look into that the next time I have to do something like that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, guys, and, and um, definitely enjoy uh, David's talk. I know I'm looking forward to it as well. I mean, .NET Maui is the future. I, I will bring him in. You could say hi to him. Hey, your buddy. Gone. You're, you're looking kind of dark this morning. Is it not? Sun's not up. Your hero's not working. Ah, oh. <laughs> no, my camera, man. I don't know. It like apparently I didn't feed it coffee this morning and it turned off a couple times on me. And I don't know. What's I going have on. complete sympathy because I was just recording a Xamarin show with uh Montemagno and uh, <laughs> my camera overheated. Yeah, I tweeted about it. You saw the the I picture did. of my camera and the and the fan. I had to blow on it, which didn't actually help, to be honest. But now I've got the battery door open. I've got the uh, LCD pulled away. Yeah, I've got yeah, yeah. The things no, we do. You know, I, yeah. I'm feeling like I might just need to go get the new uh, Hero Nine or something. You have a perfect excuse. You should do it. I I know I do. Well, have a good talk, buddy, and uh, I will see you all later. Thanks. So hello, David, officially. Yeah, Thank it's you good to see joining. you again. It's been a while. We did a podcast a few months back, right? That's right. So we moved over from the West Coast back to the central US again. Yes. Uh, you're in St. Louis. 
St. Louis, and Missouri. It, 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 you're, you didn't have to get up as early as Dan. <laughs> no, I didn't. I saw uh, it didn't even occur to me until uh, I turned on the stream and saw Dan. And I was like, wait a second. It's really early over there. Yeah, yeah. But I guess, I guess you know, Clancy was the first session and we, we did him at 11 p.m. his time. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like how you flipped all the time zones. It, he, it helps he, that he's he in Alaska and point. yeah, he can do that. And he's <laughs> he's young and he drinks a lot of Mountain Dew. So that's right. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, th we've had this topic today. We had a, had a deep dive by deep dive by Clancy, and now you're going to give us the the big picture, I guess. So cool, yeah. I mean, uh, I will probably cover some of the same ground that he has, but certainly more of my talk is about why why in the world are we doing this, and how how much did we just mess up your world? Um, so hopefully, I can bring a little bit of clarity there. Right. I'm going to hand over to you. And cool. Thank you for joining us. Cool. And uh, I'm, I've got a screen share. So if you just want to put that up and you can play presenter and do whatever you need to do. Yeah. I love this setup. StreamYard is just awesome. We're using StreamYard for tons of uh, stuff at Microsoft for the community standups. And, and that's what we use to record the Zam show. So uh, welcome, everybody. I do have the YouTube chat up here. So let me bring that back up to the front for myself. Do, 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 so that I can see the conversations. I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you for joining wherever you are. Who is Dave? Yeah, let's, who, who the heck am I? Um, so I am principal program manager uh, with .NET, focusing on the Xamarin SDKs. So that's iOS, Android uh, forms, uh, as well as working with components. And uh, yeah, newcomers are always welcome. It's good to see everybody uh, in the chat of course, and your little profile pictures. Um, so I've been with Microsoft now for a little over three and a half years. Uh, before that, I was uh, running my own company for about 10, 15 years. Uh, I lose track of time, um, which was doing uh, a variety of software development for creative agencies, for enterprises, um, a lot of web, a lot of interactive, some uh, point of point of sale type stuff. Like in, you go into Best Buy and you go see that touch screen with the new Nikon camera. I may or may not have built that. Um, uh, and then, of course, a lot of mobile, and Xamarin became a passion of mine. I had enjoyed C Sharp when I moved from ASP to ASP.NET. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up doing uh, more and more .NET and, uh, and have really enjoyed being part of Microsoft and making these products better for you. So let's, uh, let me go over to my slides now, and let's stop looking at that. So the first thing I want to address is, wait. Are you pulling a silver light on us? Are you breaking all of our apps? Uh, have you just upended the world? Uh, no, that's absolutely not what's happening. Um, and I, I, you know, this is a real question. We get this thing a lot. If you've been in the in the .NET Microsoft ecosystem for a long time, um, then and you did any uh, form of silver light, and then you saw it go away. Uh, you, you probably have some fear. Uh, you see the name of something changing and you're like, oh no, what just happened? No, uh, your Xamarin Forms projects will continue to work. Uh, we're building migration paths for all of those. And uh, this is really, you could think of it as Xamarin 6. It's the next evolution of Xamarin. Um, yes, it is a new name. And so why would we give it a new name? Well, there are reasons. And, and one of the reasons is, is to have people give it a fresh look because we have the highest customer satisfaction we've ever had. Uh, I saw recent numbers and we're on par with things like Blazor, which is hot. Um, and so we know that we're moving in the right direction. And so how do we accelerate and catalyze that uh, and help you as developers feel like, okay, we're on the right track here. We're on the, we're on the train moving in the right direction, right? Um, so there will be migration. It'll be easy. Uh, we'll upgrade your projects. Most of these upgrades are really more .NET 6 related things. Um, but, you know, there's there are things in, in Xamarin with .NET MAUI that we're doing that uh, you'll want to migrate to to get the benefits of. So I know change is hard uh, because this past uh, pandemic, <laughs> we're marking our lives in pandemics now, uh, um, my daughter got married. And so uh, we had a wedding and all along the way, it's like, are we going to have five people or are we going to have 500 people? And we didn't have anywhere near 500 people. Of course, you can't, you can't gather that many people together. Um, but we had a good, safe wedding. 
my daughter got married, my eldest, and moved on. And that's a big life change, right? I mean, if any of you have been through that, you know that that's, that's a big deal. And then one week later, I sent my son in the blue mask over on the far right, far right, your left, my right, your left, I don't know. Uh, and uh, we sent him off to Rala s and to start studying uh, computer science. And uh, so, you know, get one kid married out of the house, another kid a week later goes off to college uh, in the middle of a pandemic. All these new protocols, a lot of fear in the news. I understand change and change can be uh, disconcerting. So one of the things that I really want to bring to you with this presentation is to let you know where our head's at, why we're doing the things that we're doing, and kind of give you a status report. Where are we today? When can you expect to start getting bits and things like that? So perhaps uh, it would be more calming if we said, instead of introducing .NET MAUI, what we're really here to talk about is the evolution of Xamarin. If you're a Xamarin developer, perhaps that feels a little more comfortable to you. Um, so let's let's start from that position. Cool. We're good. Everybody good? I see a, a smile in the chat. I don't know if that was for me or not. Because um, I think I'm actually a little delayed. That's cool. All right. So .NET MAUI, uh, what is it? It's the multi-platform app UI. So it's mobile and desktop. We are integrating Xamarin into .NET. Um, so we're adopting .NET 6, the common BCL that everybody else is using. Because um, right now you get kind of a mixture of what Mono provides and what .NET has. Um, and so we're going to all be using the same thing. We're moving into the .NET org. So Maui, Android, Mac iOS is all going to be there. We are adopting common .NET experiences. If you're a .NET developer and you use the .NET new, .NET run, .NET publish, and all that sort of thing, you can expect to have the same experiences now when you're building mobile and desktop applications with .NET MAUI. Visual Studio Code is supported for things like, uh, I believe Blazor can use it, certainly some other web uh, things, console apps, and plenty of other .NET uh, workloads work in VS Code. So if you can uh, expect to, you can expect to use those with .NET MAUI as well. And as I mentioned, it's Android, iOS, Mac OS, and Windows are our targets. And then uh, we'll talk a bit more about how and why this works. And perhaps Clancy covered a lot of these details in his presentation. But uh, the changes that we are uh, implementing are going to allow for modern app models like Blazor and Comet. Now, that doesn't mean that your MVVM is going away or that you need to abandon XAML or that XAML is suddenly uh, you know, end of life or anything like that. That's not the case. So what are our goals? What in the world are we up to? So quality is first and foremost. Um, we hear this loud and clear. Yes, our customer satisfaction is, is hitting the highest marks we've ever received, but the clear feedback is, hey, we want some stable releases. It's awesome that you're shipping us new releases every six weeks. It's awesome that they have new features that we desperately need to solve the paper cuts and the productivity roadblocks that we have. But you know, for Pete's sake, uh, stop Stop with the regression, regression, stop with the bugs, fix those things. So we are, are, are setting out a roadmap here of 12 months of quality. Um, we are going to be focusing on that. Yes, we are uh, revamping the controls and the renderers, which we'll talk about. Um, but we are going to also spend a significant amount of time uh, cleaning house and improving the quality of life for all of our developers. We're going to reorganize the project structure and make it a whole lot easier to navigate and understand. That's primarily going to be helpful for contributors, but I think for all developers using the platform so you can find where stuff is. Uh, we're also going to be standardizing uh, naming uh, class structure and things like that. So um, right now, if you bounce between iOS, Android, and uh, UWP platform folders, for example, you'll see different things, and it can be hard to navigate. Performance uh, is the other big thing that we really want to touch. Um, and so this is, hey, can we get our cold starts, especially on Android, at or under 100 milliseconds consistently, no matter the size of the app? Now, uh, a lot of this depends on you and the code that you write. Um, and so as far as it depends on us, uh, the framework maintainers and the framework itself, we're going to do everything we can to put you on the happy path to, to getting your apps running under that bar. Um, you know, if you look at popular apps on your phone today, many of them don't even hit that mark. Um, they're, they're much slower to load. 
but we want to put you on the best footing possible. We want to have responsive animations and transitions. Um, and I say we want to have these things. As I mentioned, this is driven by your feedback. Um, I'm looking at Brian's thing here and trying to understand what he's saying, but I'll figure that out. <laughs> Uh, and then we're reducing view nesting um, is a key thing to improving performance. And so uh, part of our renderer work is uh, around that, uh, removing that wrapping. We did it previously with something called fast renderers. Um, that was the initiative we called it. And so now we're calling them slim renders because we're, we're, we're going on a diet. <laughs> Um, so design, uh, this is a key thing that we hear a lot. We want to make it easier for you to deliver good looking apps out of the box. And so, uh, providing you with a default theme template that takes those native controls, but gives them a good shine. Um, and so that you don't feel like you need to start from scratch. I mean, if you go over to iOS or Android studio, uh, Xcode or Android studio, and you drop controls on the UI, in iOS, you're going to get bare bones iOS controls, which is what you get in Xamarin Forms, and they don't look super pretty. But we can easily give you a theme to get going with that. Um, and so we're going to build out the controls to allow that to be done. Um, we're also going to uh, bring easier control extensibility. So what this means is if there's a property, whether it's platform specific or otherwise, um, you want to add some custom uh, behavior to an existing control. The new handler and mapper uh, architecture allows you to easily do that right in your cross-platform code. You don't have to go create three different classes and platform specifics or custom renders. And then quick cross-platform templating. Um, Cross-platform templating uh, coming everywhere. You'll see that in Xamarin Forms 5 with the radio buttons, and we're going to introduce more. And then these are the platforms that we are targeting and bringing feature parity to those. Um, on the desktop, you know, feature parity isn't all that we are looking to do. Um, they're certainly introducing what are the desktop patterns uh, and behaviors that are not mobile specific and that we can introduce, you know, things like uh, multi-window, for example. We do actually have multi-window uh, implemented for some customers today. Um, if you are familiar with the Bull Tech Finance app, uh, and I can speak openly about that because they themselves are publishing YouTube videos about how they're using Skia Sharp for their desktop apps. Um, they are using some multi-window stuff that uh, uh, Microsoft developers help them to implement. All right, so a little bit more about these key areas. Uh, so these are from the most recent um, customer survey that hopefully everybody filled out. If you didn't fill it out, you still have uh, a couple of days. Um, I'll probably turn it off. Actually, let's say this. Uh, I'm going to turn it off at the end of the day. <laughs> um, so go find my Twitter account, uh, David Ortnow. Go find the, the uh, Survey Monkey link, and you can go fill this out. Um, but in terms of app performance, how do, how do developers feel about this? You can see that moderately satisfied uh, and extremely satisfied, you know, that's, that's okay. Um, that's good, you know, certainly. Um, but for those who really, really care about it, uh, you know, it starts to become uh, less and less satisfying. So we know that we have work to do here. Um, on average, we're measuring about a, a second and a half startup time on Android for normal devices. Um, and so what can we do to get a sub second on these things? UI responsiveness, app size, as I mentioned, really what we're looking at, and I've been talking a lot with uh, Jonathan Dick and others on our team that are working towards .NET 6. Um, because of the new BCL and things like that, what we're really looking for right now is to maintain our app size, um, especially on Android. Now, the app size on Android is the lowest it's been in a very long time, um, and uh, perhaps ever. And actually, app size barely even registered on the concerns that developers had in this most recent survey. Um, productivity is key. We hear this from a lot of developers wanting to know, hey, that I can use my .NET experience across all the different workloads. You know, not everything is going to translate, but I can be productive and useful anywhere I go. This is also important for recruiting. Um, if you work at a company that's concerned about where am I going to hire this next Xamarin or .NET MAUI developer, um, essentially, if we can build in the same experiences to our workload that, uh, that they're used to doing for web and things like that, then they're going to be able to step in and be more productive more quickly in the mobile and the desktop applications. So that's a key thing. 
uh, speed to market, wanting to make sure that you can uh, reuse all the same skills as well as the technology investment. And then platform reach, of course, wanting to make sure that you can hit the platforms that are most important to you. Um, you've probably seen if you've been a Xamarin developer over any period of time uh, that we uh, we it, it's a it's ca you're capable. <laughs> let's say it this way, you're capable of hitting a lot of platforms, but they are not heavily trafficked areas, and so you don't get tons of good support there. So we're working to be more clear on here are the things that we are supporting as core platforms. The other stuff works, but you're on your own really to to do what you need to do for those particular platforms or specific devices. Design. Uh, so I mentioned that design is important. Um, the biggest frustration we hear from customers or one of the biggest frustrations is when, in terms of custom renderers, because you have to write so much code, because you immediately are into a whole other API that you need to understand, um, it can be very frustrating. I'm a little disappointed to see just how many custom renderers are still out there in the wild. Um, and I believe this represents roughly 1,400 applications. Um, because we also ask developers, how many applications do you uh, currently have or support in the, in, in market? Um, so unless everybody lied to us, um, that's what this represents. Um, it's still, that's it's a lot more custom renderers than I think I would like to see or you would like to see, because typically it means that there is a gap or something missing in the native API. Um, but the fact that you can have a custom render obviously is great. Consistent look and feel is really important. So um, we asked this question, how many developers need uh, exactly the same design, mostly the same design, um, mostly unique or other? Um, other, uh, the answers there were basically on one project it was this, on another project it was that kind of thing. Um, so I think the, the, the key takeaway here is that we can do and should do more to make those top two easier to do out of the box, especially without writing those custom renderers. All right, so um, I wanna throw this slide in here as that strong reassurance to you if you are a XAML lover and you use Xamarin Forms <clears throat> and you have concern that we've suddenly moved all the cheese and you're gonna to have to go relearn some new way to write your applications. No, uh, you're going to be able to move your existing projects forward that look like this, um, as well as if you're using C Sharp UI, uh, you know, helper extensions and things like that, that all comes forward. We're not radically changing the control toolkit API. All these XAML features will continue to exist and be improved. So please be assured uh, that your stuff is good to go. And this is still going to be the leading uh, way in which you build applications uh, in the next evolution of Xamarin, okay? So uh, be confident there. We know that this is where a lot of developers are super productive and successful and you love it. And so we're not looking to, to derail that. We wanna make sure we continue to capitalize on that, push it forward and make it better. All right, so a little bit more about what design is gonna look like uh, coming up. So we hear a lot, hey, the, the visual material stuff that you did is cool. Uh, Dan's asking, uh, is there now a clicked parameter? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not in this one. Um, but hey, you know where to submit suggestions. Will Shell work on UWP? Yes. Yep. That is all coming together. It will also work on Mac OS, which I know you didn't ask, but certainly you want it because you're doing desktop. <laughs> Um, yes. All right. So in visual, we, as I mentioned, you know, material was a good step in the right direction, but um, a couple of things about that material implementation. Um, it requires uh, native controls from Google and they are often, um, uh, you know, it's just one more thing, right? Uh, it's not only one more thing to be maintained and bound and, and kept up to date, um, but it's also, it adds quite a bit of size to your applications. So are there things that we could do to take this concept of visual, um, but make it much more extensible and repurposable for other um, design patterns? And really what this comes down to is if I need my control to be able to look Cupertino or Fluent, uh, and Fluent's probably a better example because it's kind of not native to either of the mobile platforms, um, I should be able to do that all in the, Zam, uh, in the Xamarin API, in the XAML API, in the .NET MAUI API. Um, I shouldn't have to go doing custom renderers. And so Visual should be able to support all of those styling uh, 
needs. So you can see here, we've got some prototypes uh, of how we can do this and make it super easy. And this is all done with cross-platform code. Um, what you're seeing here, the, the what's behind those entry controls and button controls, it's all cross-platform with templating. Um, and so we're not using any native renderers here. Now, the big question is, is, is this extends? Uh, certainly is easier for you to template and control the style of. Absolutely, 100%. Um, uh, is, the, is the control going to be performant enough is the question that we really need to prove out in the early phases of the .NET MAUI release previews. Um, and then, of course, everybody loves a good switch, and they look totally different on those three different plat three different design systems. So I figured that was a good one to show. I don't have the code for that, but you know, you know what XAML looks like at this point. A couple other things that we're looking to expand upon, and we heard this uh, at the Xamarin Developer Summit uh, a year and and days ago um, that Dan put on down there in Houston, and we had a wonderful time. It was beautiful. It was hot. And uh, we had a little thing where we asked people, what is the hardest stuff for you to style that you would want us to fix? And the tabs was, uh, tabs and navigation were the two top ones, right? Um, and, uh, and so what we can do is we can essentially have a drop-in replacement for the native tabs that are really hard to position, really hard to make consistent between platforms. We can give you a cross-platform uh, control that will allow you to put it wherever you want template it however you want, um, style it, change the font. Um, we had a new engineer join the Xamarin Forms team uh, recently out of college. And uh, she said, how in the world do I change the font on the tab? <laughs> and we all know, as uh, those of us who've been using Xamarin Forms for a long time, or Xamarin in general, that's a pain. You got to go down to the native platform and do all that uh, jumping through hoops. So we can make that a whole lot easier. Uh, the app bar. And so these controls um, in particular, the tab bar and the app bar, um, we're going to look to bake them into .NET MAUI, but we're also going to look to bring them into the Xamarin Community Toolkit. Um, and by look, look to do that, what I mean is I'm going to hassle Javier until he submits PRs. That's, that's how that works. Um, but, but yeah, here, I think the key thing is, is we need to enlighten essentially these apps to be able to be drop-in replacements into a shell application, for example, so that it can do the right thing as a navigation bar, so it can do the right thing as a tab control. Um, and you, you don't have to circumvent things. Uh, you can continue to use shell the way you use shell today. Um, so what about full customization? Uh, if you saw my Xamarin Forms 5 blog post, you saw this. That bottom uh, image here on the radio buttons is actually the Fluent uh, design for a, I think they call it a choice group. Um, and so this is me showing, hey, with templating, you can easily replicate some of these uh, design patterns. Um, and so this is super powerful, and you've seen other XAML platforms that do this. Um, but we've never really had this in Xamarin Forms on the controls themselves. You've had it for templated controls that you yourself have built, um, but you haven't had it on, exam for example, a radio button or a button or uh, anything else. Um, and so this is kind of where we're heading with things. We think this is a great solution primarily because guess what? This is actually what you developers have already started doing in the wild for years. And so if it works for you and you're being successful with it and you're happy with it, then why wouldn't it be good to support it first class in XamarinForms.net Maui, right? So uh, control templates, if you've seen a control template before, you know what it looks like. Uh, you define one of these puppies in your resource dictionary. Um, you can, of course, do it directly uh, in line with your controls. You can just describe your visual state groups and, uh, and then you can uh, go to town uh, building out the beautiful UI that you desire to have. So it's really cool. Um, I've been really, really happy with it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was so happy with it that my first draft of the last blog post sounded like a celebration of Radio Button. And then somebody said, you know, Radio Button is actually not that interesting of a control. And I was like, yeah, you're right. But the control templates are awesome. Um, does cross-platform feature parity include supporting tools? In particular, will Xamarin UI test, or whatever it will be called, work for Windows as well as Android and iOS? John, that's a great question. Um, it's really a different conversation that we need to have around UI testing altogether um, because uh, somebody needs to, well, 
let's say it this way. Um, do you want to use UI test or you just want to know that there is a UI testing framework that is uh, actively supported, maintained, and works well with .NET MAUI applications? Um, so I, I think that's probably where we need to steer the conversation. I don't know that UI test um, has the the support and ownership that it, that you probably need it to have. Um, so we'll we'll need to uh, s somebody needs to have that conversation. It's not it's not a product that I directly uh, own. Uh, and, uh, someone needs to actually own it. Yes, Dan, exactly. <laughs> One UI test framework that works across. Yeah. I mean, and the thing, John, is that we need it too, right? I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand uh, UI tests that we run, many of them on every PR. And so we want one and we want one that runs reliably, right? That's a big thing with UI tests. We want one that runs reliably. Um, we deal way too often with failing UI tests for unknown reasons. And then you just rerun it and it works. Um, I don't know if that's a UI test thing. I don't know if it's an iOS thing. Certainly things like iOS 9 and 10 have tons of problems, but I'm speaking out of my depth at this point. So let's get back to the slides. Um, so I want to talk about slim renderers. Um, so this is, a, this is a phrase that I'm pretty sure I coined, so I'm to blame for this, but I like to make things fast and small. Um, so uh, let's talk about uh, some of the terms that you probably have been hearing. Uh, let's try to define them to make sure that we're on the same page. I ran these uh, descriptions, these definitions by Shane Neuvel, as you might know as Shane Man from the uh, the latest Sharp NATO blog, which I just died laughing when I saw that. Um, control, it's the cross-platform UI element. So I'll, I'll, in control, you know, it certainly could be a platform control. I even use it down there at the bottom. Um, but primarily in the context of this, uh, we're talking about that cross-platform piece. Um, and then handlers, these are the uh, classes responsible for applying the cross-platform request. Hey, I wanna change the background color to the actual platform control. Um, the mapper is a dictionary of all the uh, properties that are in the cross-platform control and what is in the handler. And then the renderer is really the platform control implementation that you've been using in Xamarin Forms, which really doesn't have a place in its current form in the new .NET MAUI. So they are going away. Um, now I say renderers are going away. Those of you who have custom renderers are probably like, oh no, what does that mean for all of my custom renderers? Your custom renderers will still work. We have a, we have a, a way in which they will still work using a, a compatibility package. However, uh, we will be encouraging you to migrate those to the new pattern. Um, and please informing us all through the previews how that's going so we can make it easier and easier and easier. But we ourselves are going to be using that uh, compatibility for our control gallery and things, which I'll be demoing at .NET Conf, quick plug, and I've got a slide later on that. By the way, I am the last session of the day. I know there's a closing session, so I plan to go as long as, as y'all stay, stay here. <laughs> Fair warning, I don't know when I'm gonna stop. All right, so that's the glossary of terms. Um, so let's talk a little bit about architecture. And this is really, uh, hopefully for you, very similar to what you know of Xamarin and Xamarin Forms. Um, but I wanted to, to put this together and try to describe it a bit more clearly, because uh, I think a lot of people have hard time. I see a cursor on the screen. I was just trying to figure if that was me or not. Um, uh, I, people have a hard time sometimes explaining what exactly uh, Xamarin is and does from a technical standpoint. So you've got your app code at the top there, right? This is the code that you're primarily interacting with. You're writing XAML, you're writing C Sharp, uh, you're describing your UI, you're writing your um, middle tier layer, interacting with web services and things like that. And primarily, you wanna be interacting with the framework that you're working with, and that's .NET MAUI. So you're working against the button API, you're working with a stack layout or a grid and that sort of thing. But when you get stuck, then you have to go to do something like number two. Uh, you're writing a platform specific you're writing effects, you're writing custom renderers. Um, <laughs> I know, I am here now, Dan. Um, 
And, uh, and, and so you can do these things, right? You can plunk down, I guess, is a way to say it, into that Xamarin Android, iOS, Mac, WinUI layer, and you can work against that API when the .NET MAUI API doesn't have what you need, or maybe it's something very specific to that platform. And then of course, .NET MAUI itself is doing that work to talk to those platform APIs. Now that layer there are the bindings. Those are the .NETified bindings to those things. Uh, and of course, WinUI itself is already a .NET um, library for us to use. And then but beyond that, everything is writing on and running inside of the .NET 6 BCL and runtime, which then is hosted within, compiled down to native code that runs on Android, iOS, Mac OS, and Windows. Um, so the key here, um, and the main thing that I want to accentuate is I, we want to do as much as possible to keep you right there in one. That's where you're most productive. That's where we can hot reload all your bits um, and make you a happy developer. And so that's one of the key goals uh, of doing .NET MAUI. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture here um, because this, when I saw Shane uh, present this at the uh, Reactive UI uh, event, and I have a link to it later in the slides here, it's also up on YouTube. This really helped me actually. It really helped things click for me. So right now you've got a button renderer in Xamarin Forms, and that's your native platform. That's in the iOS, Android code, Mac OS, uh, Windows code. Um, and it has a reference to the Xamarin Forms button. It knows about the Xamarin Forms button. That means that it's tightly coupled. And that also means that assembly scanning is happening, which can be slow. And this is a reason, not necessarily the biggest reason, but it is a reason why your apps might be slow to load uh, from a cold start. Um, as well as why you may have heard warnings of, hey, reduce the number of uh, assemblies dependencies in your application so that you're not scanning over and over and over again to look for renderers. Um, people work around that using Fody Weaver to do uh, interesting things, but this is, this is just describing kind of what the world looks like today in Xamarin Forms. Um, it's also really difficult to reach down into the platform. As mentioned, this is that uh, number two from the previous slide where you're writing a platform uh, specific call and then doing something like that. So in .NET MAUI, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to decouple the renderers, and this work is underway right now. You're, we're decoupling the renderers from Xamarin Forms. So now we've inverted things. The Xamarin Forms button now knows that there is this I button. Doesn't know how it works. It knows what it does. Doesn't know how it does what it does. And the key cool thing here is that that I button really just maps everything with that mapper that I mentioned before to the button handler. And the button handler is where all the work happens. There's no reflection happening here. There's no notify property change happening here um, in the buttons themselves. This is all very straightforward. So we're, we're really hoping and expecting and early indications are good that we're gonna see performance improvement there. But what this also allows, because we've now decoupled the actual button from the Xamarin Forms architecture and knowledge and all that jazz, now you can start adding things like, oh, a comment button. That comment button can do all the MVU model view update things that James Clancy dreams up without having to worry about Xamarin Forms introducing some behavior that he doesn't care about um, because it's an MVVM thing or it's some kind of data binding. Um, <laughs> yes, interfaces. Uh, fabulous. Sorry, I'm reacting to a, a comment in the chat from Brian. <laughs> Speaker randomly yells interfaces. Uh, fabulous button, you know. Hey, if the F Sharp team is like, we really want to uh, be able to do some things, but we're kind of hamstrung by the way Xamarin Forms is doing it, they can go directly to the I button. Reactive UI can have their own button. So this is a very uh, exciting re-architecture here that we think is going to energize some, some cool um, innovation within the .NET community, we're hoping. Certainly within the Microsoft.NET teams. All right, so as I mentioned, it's performance-minded, cross-platform projects easily register those custom handlers. So instead of doing assembly scanning, we're going to have a registrar. Um, as a matter of fact, this is already in 
um, in one form or another in the control gallery. So we're already registering controls directly. It's just an explicit registration. You can override them. You can do them by platform using if defs. You can use multi-targeting in your project so that you don't have to ever see an if def. Um, so there are multiple ways you can do it. The samples here that Shane put together, and thank you, Shane, for these wonderful slides, um, are using the if defs because it's clear to understand on the screen. Zero runtime assembly scanning, gotta love that. All right, so what about that nasty platform code that you have to write? Um, and what will this look like in XAML? I don't know. Um, this is something that needs to be worked out. Um, we know what platform uh, specifics look like in XAML today. You add your XML and S. Um, but instead of doing all of this to be able to get to platform specific things, whether they're custom renderers or platform specifics, you can directly in your code access the view mapper and just add a new handler to the view mapper. And it can be specific to a particular control, or as you see here, it's done at the bottom on any iView. So any control that extends from iView, which is all of them, um, you can go ahead and just tie into that and do things or you can get that native view directly from the handler. So in your cross-platform code, using multi-targeting, using if defs, uh, you have direct access to all those things. Now I want to emphasize that this is certainly much easier than a custom render or a platform specific. However, um, I, we still firmly believe that if these things need to be done a lot, then they should be in the .NET MAUI API for those controls. Right, You shouldn't need to even have this knowledge of what a text view is on Android. Uh, you should be able to use the, the label, the entry, whatever. All right, so this is the, the one I mentioned from Shane. Probably just easier to uh, search for shanenewville.net Maui reactive UI in the YouTube UI. Don't do it now though. Don't do it now because we're not done. We've got more to talk about, um, but later, you should totally watch that. Great presentation. He even shows some, some performance. Uh, he shows the dope test, which was a bit of a troll, but there you go. All right, so uh, some of the other things that are coming in .NET 6 for .NET Maui and Xamarin developers is single project. So with single project, this is going to alleviate several points of frustration. Uh, that developers have, in particular new developers. But I think that even for seasoned developers, you're going to find some things here in single project that are gonna be very attractive to you. Um, so today, what you have in that picture over there is like one of my uh, recent solutions. You've got your cross-platform library, you've got your Android head project, you've got your iOS head project. Um, and that's a lot of code, and it's a lot of different nougats that you now need to maintain across all of those things, which can be a hassle. You can easily descend into uh, levels of nougat hell, um, trying to resolve different dependencies and things like that. But couldn't we make this a whole lot easier? And the answer is absolutely we can. Um, so we can render this all down into a single project. And we can still surface all the platform specific things that you need. Like there's an info P list in iOS. We can't just get rid of that stuff. That stuff is still needed, but we can um, abstract it away and make it a whole lot easier for you to deal with these things. So uh, for images, fonts, platform specific code, those are the three key areas that we're gonna be focusing on. Uh, images is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to take what John Dick has done with the resizetizer NuGet package. If you haven't seen that, you can go use that today. Um, and we can bring all your resources together and generate uh, the different DPI sizes and whatnot that you need for all the different platforms that you're supporting. Um, fonts, uh, and much of this work is already in Xamarin Forms today, but we can make it even easier here, where you can embed your font directly into that shared project, and you don't have to worry about wiring it up for the different platforms or where it needs to be located, all that sort of thing, and it just works. Um, and then platform code, you know, again, this is the stuff that we've been looking at, um, whether you're using multi-targeting or if defing. So here's an example of how this might look. And these are custom, customer researches happening here. If you're interested in this and, and you have feedback on how you think this ought to look and work, you can reach out to uh, Jake Kirsch, who is a PM on our team. Oops, oh, I see what the problem is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to move this in case Carrie's chatting at me. 
All right, cool. Um, so Jake, uh, we'd love to talk to you about this, um, but we're also going to be talking to new .NET developers or, or people who might consider coming to Xamarin and .NET. That's a key area for us. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you saw uh, the community stand up from yesterday, we had Theodora on and we interviewed her about her summer project where she learned Xamarin and built out an app. And, um, you know, it's interesting when you talk to new developers that kind of on board with it, they definitely fall in love with Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, uh, mostly. You know, it's not for everybody, let's be honest. But she she fell in love with it. And, uh, and the, but I asked her, I'm like, what were the friction points? And she made a comment that data binding was, you know, kind of a hard thing to get her head around. Um, so anyway, that's neither here nor there for this particular uh, single project topic, but it's these kinds of questions to those kinds of developers where we find that uh, some of the nuances of doing multi-platform development can be really overwhelming and be a roadblock when you're getting started. So um, this is one way that you could separate out your platform specific code. Certainly, uh, we aren't going to tie developers into any of these things. We want to provide a sensible default to start. Um, and then uh, if for your needs, you can certainly uh, take control of the reins. You can go into the CS prod. You can do whatever you need to do um, using the rules of what multi-targeting allows. And then uh, I mentioned fonts and images. So providing a, uh, a reasonable, smart, consistent place for where those ought to exist in your projects. Again, um, this will be kind of a default, uh, perhaps this, but we won't tie you into it. If you really, really, really want to put your images right next to your XAML or your, your view file, uh, we certainly won't block you from doing that. I see no reason to do that. Ben, took you a while to get your head around data binding too? Yeah. Yeah, I remember back in the early days when I first did data binding in Adobe Flex, it blew my mind. I was like, this is what? What now? Because I was so used to just having a loop where I just set my own stuff. Um, and then to go to this kind of more of an asynchronous world of notifying property changes and uh, handling all that stuff, it was weeks of my head hurting. <laughs> Um, and then once you get through it and you start having success, you're like, oh, and then you have amnesia, right? You kind of forget how painful it was. Um, so I think it's it's helpful to get get around. Here's my encouragement. Here's David's encouragement for the for the moment. Get around some new developers. Go go find somebody who knows nothing about what you're doing but wants to build mobile apps and talk to them, learn what their experience is, watch the frustration on their faces. Um, there's going to be frustration, and there's no doubt about it, but um, it's a good reminder of how many things we take for granted as being easy uh, were not so easy at one point. There you go. Isn't that good? That was good stuff. All right. Um, and so, you know, how, how is this going to look when you go to build your application? You've only got one project. How does it know which platform you're targeting? Well, any platform that you uh, are able to run, it's going to give you an option for it. And then anything that you need to add beyond that, you'll have the option to add. Um, so in this particular case, you see that I can run this, this app on Windows, Android, or iOS. And it knows that my phone's attached, which is fantastic. All right. So uh, I want to highlight some things that are really more for contributors. And I think I'm kind of at time, so but I'm close to being done. So stick with me. This is good stuff. So for the contributors, what are we doing to make this more awesome for you? But I think this also applies to developers. Um, so when you come to the Xamarin Forms repo today, <laughs> I just look young, Ali. Ali saying, why does David look as old as me and his daughter got married? Yeah. I, well, I also did marry my high school sweetheart. So, so there's that. Been married 25 years this year. Woohoo. Uh, actually, what is this, October? Yeah, I've got a month and 18 days till my anniversary. All right. Uh, so back to the topic. Um, thank you for telling me I look young. I appreciate that. That's very helpful. So you go to the Xamarin Forms repo today and you're greeted with uh, a rather <laughs> uh, lengthy list of folders and projects, and it can be quite overwhelming. We've heard this loud and clear. And so what we have done, and you can see this now if you go to .NET MAUI, is uh, Shane has worked with the team and done a restructuring. And this is a restructuring based on the pattern of what we see on other .NET repositories. So this, again, aligns with, hey, if you know how to navigate 
uh, the, the .NET Core, the ASP.NET Core uh, repositories, et cetera, then this should look familiar to you. You should be able to find your way around. Uh, we're using similar patterns. So I love that uh, even in the first iteration of this, we've greatly reduced the complexity at the top level. And then as you get into it, you know, I dug down into the source for the platform handlers, and then I went into the source for the um, Xamarin handlers, and then I'm looking at that particular button. So these are the Xamarin form specific pieces. Um, or actually, no, I take that back. These are just the buttons. Yes. So, but you can see that we're using multi-targeting here. All the button code is all in one place for how these things behave across all those platforms. Whereas previously you would have had to um, hunted and hoped that they were named the same across the different instances. Um, so this is a whole lot cleaner. Birthday on November the 19th, Denny? No, no, anniversary on the 18th. Yeah, close, good, good math. Your math is probably better than what I described. Um, so I think this is a whole lot cleaner, a whole lot easier to look look at, and uh, hopefully contributors will will think so too. But we need your feedback. So if you're a contributor and, and you have been frustrated with organization of the uh, solution and the projects, let us know. All right. So with that, uh, I will highlight a couple of the experiments. You probably are mostly aware of these things. Um, Blazor, a very exciting one. Matter of fact, had a call with a customer yesterday who was super excited about this. We we find that a lot of uh, developers and companies that have investment across web and desktop and mobile are really attracted to this idea of being able to reuse their Blazor knowledge, share their state between hybrid web hosted content, as well as leveraging all the native UI and cross-platform APIs that you get with .NET, MAUI, and Xamarin. So in this particular case, you see the top is native UI, the bottom is web UI. Uh, this is the Experimental Blazor Mobile Bindings Project. You can find it up on GitHub. I didn't actually put a link to it here, sorry about that. Um, but you can find a couple of blogs from Alon Lipton up on the .NET blog. And uh, you can quickly get started with that. You know, if you're a XAML developer, but you're interested in Razor and you've often wanted to be able to co-mingle some C Sharp in with your markup, uh, you'll love Razor templates. Um, if you are a, a true born and bred XAML developer, you probably think Razor templates are an abomination. The good news is, is that we are accepting and welp welcoming to all. And uh, you know, there's benefits to, to each and every. Um, and so just because somebody else wants to use uh, one pattern, another person wants to use another pattern, it's all good. It's all .NET, we love it. So, uh, so there's that. And then there's also the Comet MVU experiment from James Clancy, which hopefully he showed off earlier today. I don't know if he did, but uh, very exciting stuff. So if, if you're really attracted to things like Swift UI um, or to uh, Flutter for that matter, writing things all in code and Dart, um, then this may be more up your alley. Uh, it's a unidirectional flow of state. So really this, this uh, view uh, method, which you can't see the top of it there, but um, that, oh, there it is. Hey, look, there's the view method on queue. Uh, that's uh, anytime a message is passed and the state changes, it reruns that puppy. It evaluates the changes to your UI. Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Um, and applies just the changes. So uh, it's very performant. It's working kind of against a shadow UI tree. Um, very performant and uh, nice fluent syntax uh, to be able to use here. So one of the things we hope to see in the Xamarin Community Toolkit with the C-sharp UI extensions that you may use today in Xamarin Forms is uh, kind of a, a coalescing, a coming together of the APIs between what James has been experimenting with here and what Vincent has uh, introduced into the ecosystem. Um, and so uh, would love to see that continue to innovate, which is why uh, actually the community toolkit is the perfect place for that particular feature to land so it can continue to grow and innovate. All right, so just a couple more slides. Uh, in terms of dates, let's see, are these dates all still accurate? Yes, so November 2020. Uh, that's next month. .NET 5 is shipping. Um, very cool. So Xamarin works in .NET 5, uh, but what the, the case is, is that um, you're not going to get AOT, you're not going to get linkers and all that sort of thing. So for mobile uh, development, you don't want to use .NET 5 with your Xamarin, Xamarin Forms applications. You want to be using uh, the current 
bits that you've got. And then uh, when we get to .NET 6, then that's your moment uh, to jump on, the, on that train. Um, so really for your development experience, yes, you'll have to wait a little bit on some C-sharp uh, syntax goodness, but um, it's all coming. It's all good. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to be shipping previews coming up. I didn't actually put that on the slide here. I apologize. Um, so we'll start, uh, you know, the code is up. I guess. So um, the code is up on .NET MAUI. Uh, you can also find it in the main handlers branch right now on the Xamarin Forms repository, which is really where the code is being worked on. And then it's being shipped over. Um, uh, but we're going to do some demos at .NET Comp, which takes me to my next slide. Um, so make sure to tune in to .NET Comp. We'll show off all the latest Xamarin Forms related five stuff. Um, which is really exciting. By that point, we'll, we'll be in stable release. I don't want to jinx it, but we'll be in stable release. And then, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna definitely aim to demo the status of where we stand with all of our .NET Maui work. Show you how things are going with the new handlers. Um, hopefully, have some nice performance benchmarks to share with you. I'm really geared up for that. Um, certainly, that's a big focus for us. Um, and then we'll see how much of the design stuff we'll be able to show at that point. But it's going to be the first time that you'll really be able to see and and you know clone, get your hands on some things. Um, and then we'll actually have uh, bits shipping uh, in Q1 of 2021 is really when the, the easier thing, right? You just go install the new .NET and you do a .NET install, .NET MAUI or whatever and, and do the templates that way. So if you want to wait for the easy stuff, then Q1 is your is your time frame to start seeing previews. If you are a super early adopter and you want to get um, a little cut up and bloody and you don't mind uh, being frustrated, then uh, go on up to the repository and clone it uh, at any point. Um, I have not done that. It's probably a pain right now. Um, I'm not up for the frustration at the moment, so I'm going to wait a little bit. All right. So I do have some FAQs and some worries. So I'll run through these real quick because some of these may have come up in the chat. But uh, now is your time to start throwing some questions in there, and I'll hang around for a little bit longer. Should I use Xamarin Forms now or wait for .NET MAUI? Of course you should use Xamarin Forms now. Of course. Your project will upgrade to .NET MAUI. Don't worry about it. it it'll be fine. Uh, will you migrate my solution to single project? Nope. Not going to do that. Um, you don't need to. Uh, your existing projects will continue to work, um, so don't worry about it. Um, we will migrate your projects to the new common project system and to use .NET 6 for sure. Um, and then we'll provide documentation. If you really want to take advantage of the single project stuff, there's some manual moving of files that you're going to want to do, and you're going to want to be hands-on with that. Yeah, You don't want us trying to provide a magic wand to get everybody's projects into a single project. Um, Multi projects, multi headed projects continue to work. You can continue to use them that way. If you really like that, don't worry. But single project is, is an option, and we think it's going to be a nice option. Um, let's see. Do I need to re rewrite custom renderers? Nope. We're going to make sure your renderers still work, but you're going to want to migrate those um, to, to at your convenience to take advantage of the new performance and the new memory footprint characteristics that .NET MAUI is improving upon. Will your third-party libraries continue to work? Yeah. Um, at a minimum, they'll need to be recompiled to target the new .NET 6 and have the new target framework monikers and things like that so that your, uh, your MS build and whatnot knows that it works with .NET 6. Um, the UI libraries will be able to take advantage of that same migration path uh, to using the new handler pattern. Um, or they can shim and use the uh, old legacy renderers. That's entirely up to you. Um, will .NET MAUI run on Linux? This question comes up a lot. Um, Linux is not a supported platform in this version of .NET MAUI. Uh, we don't have plans in this, in this phase of .NET 6, this wave we call it, to light up Linux and focus on that. There is an unofficial backend. It uses GDK. Um, I've seen some that say that's fine, uh, others that want uh, a different UI framework used. But it is there, and so if that's something of interest to you and you're an open source Linux developer, then please contribute. I think that people would love to see that move forward. What flavor of XAML will .NET MAUI uh, use? The same XAML you use today in Xamarin Forms. Uh, that's our starting point. Now, will we uh, align with some of the syntax things that you get in WPF or in WinUI 3? 
uh, those proposals are out there and uh, we uh, will talk about those things at a later date. Um, but it's not a decision that we are uh, trying to make up front right now. So uh, we're, we're certainly learning and listening. Most uh, Xamarin developers that we talk to uh, would like to see less disruption and more consistency and stability. So that's where our head's at right now. Um, but we're certainly open to it. If there's a key reason for things, um, then we will do it. Where can I follow the progress? Go on up to github.net Maui. Um, as I mentioned, it's refreshed regularly from the Xamarin Forms repo from that main handler branch is the current working branch. You can also see a lot of open PRs. Uh, a lot of Javier's handler work is up and you can, you know, if you're super curious and you've got time on your hands, you can go read what that stuff looks like. All right. What other questions in the chat? Oh my Ooh, gosh. This was fun. I thought I would, you would never stop talking. I know. How's it going, Gerald? Good to see you. So I outlasted Bart and now I've got Gerald. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's gone. He was like, I can't take this anymore. So here I am, you know. Good. All right. Did I, you were, I saw you were in the chat, I think. Did I miss any questions that you think I need to address? Uh, so one thing actually that I'm wondering myself is my, to, to my knowledge, there will be a preview of .NET 6 with the first Maui bits, like around the time .NET 5 lands. Is that still accurate? So the, so let's, so let's basically the question a little is, bit. when can we start using, start digging into a little bit? Right. When you can start digging into builds is going to be Q1, like January, February of 2021. Um, I have not heard other information that they're going to actually distribute a .NET 6 build any earlier than okay. that. Um, but today, there is a .NET 6 repository. Uh, you can clone it, you can build it. Um, we are currently doing that. And there is a .NET 6 samples repository on the Xamarin org on GitHub, where Jonathan Peppers and Rolf and others are constantly rebuilding our samples, identifying problems, reporting them back to the mono.net teams and things like that. So um, my understanding is it's all code that you can clone and use through the end of the year, but we're not shipping installs until right. Q1. Right, right, right. So uh, one important question that is repeated by Dan, when are we getting a logo for .NET Maui? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. For now, I think I know. I'm using the Maui bot, and and we'll put we'll put lays on the monkeys, and actually, actually I've got even got my my right here. We were in a we were in a stand up for the forums team, and See? like two or three of us pulled out pulled out these, and the new engineer on the team was like, "What did I just? Do? <laughs> what just happened?" So there you go. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, looking at the other .NET project, because the whole transition to .NET MAUI is about, you know, um, Xamarin and Xamarin Forms becoming a uh, first-class citizen of the whole .NET ecosystem, right? So, uh, which is great, which shows commitment, I think. Uh, but on the other hand, it will lose a little bit of that um, own identity, right? So we're probably going to lose that. And I'm not sure if we're going to have a separate logo for that because, you know, ASP.NET, all the things don't really have their own logo, right? So uh, to be honest, for me personally, that is something that, you know, look here, we can do all the cool things with the, the Xamarin stuff. Uh, so it's 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 sad to lose those things, but, uh, you know, it's it's for the, the greater good, so. Yeah, we'll see. Hold out some hope. Exactly, exactly. You know, we'll just come up with our own logo. We have the Xamarin Community Toolkit. We'll, we'll make our own. You know, if they can't do it, we'll do it. No problem. Absolutely. And I love that new logo on the community toolkit. I hope everybody has gone over there and starred that re repo and it's Hacktoberfest. I understand there's a little bit of a uh, kerfuffle in the communities around uh, bogus PRs and people trying to game the system for Hacktoberfest, but yep. uh, you know, we'll, we'll just reject your PRs, right? And, and take, take the good ones, but come yep. submit some yep. good PRs. We got mm -hmm. monkeys on the line. We got, uh, we got t-shirts probably. So Blog post coming stuff. out, Stan. Yep, yep, yep. You've heard it here first. There's a blog post coming. Uh, all right. So thank you so much, David. I think uh, you, we're already a little bit over time, but you know, for a topic like this, that is no problem. So I'm just going to let you go. Um, cool. Have a cool uh, rest of your day. And I'm going to round this uh, uh, fantastic day off with the rest of the team. So thank you so much. And I'll talk Thanks. to you later. See you. All right, all right, all right. So that was cool. Let's bring up the rest here. Team Redshirt. Woohoo! Um, that's that's the guys who die first, right? 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ooh, didn't think of that. The okay. away team yeah. is Star Trek. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oops, oops. Well, anyway, I mean, then all the uh, the other speakers because they have the blue shirt, so they will survive, and they they, they are the most important people of this day, right? So, um, I'll happily die for them. So. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for uh, joining us in this day. I'm not going to assume that you've watched the entire eight hours, 18 minutes, and 35 seconds. Uh, but, you know, you probably got the sessions that you wanted, hopefully. Uh, personally, I think there was a lot of good sessions. Um, I mean, just starting with the one from Clancy, uh, we did it in a kind of reversed order. We have like the high overview from David right now, um, and we have the the deep dive from Clancy at the beginning of the day. Uh, but you know, just I don't know if YouTube has an option to watch everything in the reverse order. Although they will be speaking reverse as well. Well, anyway, um, so that brings me to the first topic, which is going to be great. This on this URL, unless you're watching on the live. Well, anyway you should be able to find this uh, entire session stream back on my channel. I will also maybe even later today, uh, cut up all the sessions, put them in a playlist also on this channel so you can find them. We'll tweet about it. So follow us uh, for that. Um, let me just bring up some slides because I already see the mention down here. Don't forget to participate in the raffle. Um, I'll just bring up the slides that we've shown earlier today to make sure that I don't forget anything. Uh, first, share my beautiful background here. There. I won't be able to see your lovely faces when I share my PowerPoint, but that doesn't matter. Come on. Work. There we go. Exam expert day. Uh, so again, thank you, volunteers. Kai uh, is on a uh, vacation right now, but he's done a wonderful job moderating. Luz, Marco, Steven. Uh, thank you so much for keeping us company during this day and and uh, keeping the chat alive and that kind of things. But most of all, thank you, attendees. Um, I mean, I, I shared a tweet a little bit earlier about, you know, I was just down about this whole day going having to go virtual as well. Um, see, I'm even slapping my microphone because of it. And uh, I was like, you know, guys, we, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, maybe, you know, people have had enough with all the on online conferences. I'm not feeling it. Uh, maybe we shouldn't do this. But they said, come on, we should do it. We're going to force you. Um, and I'm glad they did because I really enjoyed it. And I feel, you know, if you have joined us from anywhere in the world uh you don't know how it is well we actually got a lot of people who are willing to fly you into us we ha have people from uh macedonia people from bosnia herzegovina uh the uk we had james montemagno over from the us uh but even just the regular entities who give up a a, a, a day from work to spend it with us and that was the real power of the exam expert day um, uh, the content was great because, you know, it's expert deep dive content. That was what we were going for. Uh, but even more, um, just talking with other people, like-minded people, uh, whether you agreed or not, the, um, um, the atmosphere was always great. So, and I'm glad that we've been able to transfer a, a little bit of that to this online event because the chat has been great. Uh, everyone has been so kind, no weird stuff. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Thank you all for that. Thank you for our wonderful speakers, James, Dan, Hussein, Kodrina, David, Conrad, Alexandre, Daniel, Damien. Thank you so much um, for taking a little bit of your time and spending that with us with your wonderful sessions, wonderful content. Uh, like already mentioned, I will do my best to um, edit the uh, sessions a little bit, uh, paste my head in there somewhere uh, on each of them. No, I'm kidding. Um, and you know you can just watch them back uh, and we'll store them forever uh, for you to watch so that will be great we are the organizers glenn carrie gerald tobias um i'm not sure like how things will be in the world uh the the, the thing is i enjoyed this more than i expected so uh you know who knows what might happen in the future? We might need to rebrand because of the whole .NET Maui story, but um, we'll see how it goes. Um, um, so follow us, uh, reach out to us if you have any questions or plans or just want to say hi. Uh, that's all good. Um, thank you so much for our sponsors. So I already mentioned the raffle a little bit. We have uh, some licenses from JetBrains, I think, uh, some swag from uh, MSG where uh, Tobias works. Uh, Kerry, are you there too? Do you work there? I can't remember. No, you're at the other company. I do not. Uh, 
Syncfusion uh, is also sponsoring some license, I think. Manning has this nice discount uh, on our books. So if you are a book reader, they're probably going to be digital and on paper. Uh, get your 35% discount right now. It probably expires today, so go get it. Well, not right now. Finish watching the stream, then do it. And then watch the session from Shane and then do all the other stuff that people told you to do. Um, Syncfusion. I think we're raffling away some of that. So they have nice controls. Go check it out. I think Syncfusion also, that's a thing that a lot of people are confused about. I think Syncfusion also has um, some kind of community license, which you can use if you're under do. like a revenue. Thank you, Tobias. Um, and you can use their stuff for, for free, excuse me. So you can use that stuff for free if you're not like a bigger company. So go check that out. That's very awesome. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, forgive me that I don't know his last name. I totally forgot that at this moment. Uh, but he has been doing a wonderful job for the past event. Uh, and also for this event, he already put up like a nice readme with all the sessions and the, uh, uh, the descriptions and everything. We already got two slide decks in from uh, sessions. So if it's something that you want to review, uh, you can go to our GitHub, uh, find this one, find uh, something of previous years, and uh, you can all find the information there. Raffle, already mentioned, go to the link. We'll leave it open for just a little bit outside the stream. Um, we'll uh, um, do something offline. When we do this in person, we always have this last half hour where we uh, shout the names and everyone's like, yay, woo, woo, and they go nuts and everyone hugs and, you know, it's crazy, it's crazy. You should join. Best part of the, of the event. Yeah, <laughs> it's the best part of the day. I mean, we could just skip all the rest and do that. Uh, but, you know, we have to do it differently this year. So, uh, again, Again, we are only using your information to do this raffle to contact you whenever you want something. After that, we'll delete all the things, no funny stuff. Uh, but we will uh, do that offline, randomize the whole thing. Trust us. Um, again, big thank you. Um, I don't know what else to say. Guys, how did you like it? Did you enjoy it? Of course. Definitely. Thanks, awesome. everyone, for joining. It was amazing. Thanks, Trevor, for doing the talking. Yes, Jared. Yeah. If there's one thing I can do, it's talk. Jared, there's one thing you forgot. We have a survey. So if please, if you've watched all sessions or just some of the sessions, please fill out the survey. I'll put the link up after this. And um, you can just leave all your comments, uh, individual comments per session or about the whole event. So thanks a lot for, for participating there. Yeah, yeah. So a little survey. Um, like I don't know. I, you whipped it up. I don't know what's in there, but probably some questions about what we did good, what we not did so great, and you know, if we want to do it again, how can we improve? Something like that. So we great. appreciate your opinion there. Um, I just, I just don't want to say goodbye. You know, I just want to. <laughs> Should we get some improvised sessions? Who wants to do a session? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have to go to get some dinner. <laughs> Anyone else wants to say? Else we're just going to wrap this up, let everyone go. Thank you so much. How do you say goodbye in Dutch? Do you? Salut. <laughs> Salut. <laughs> yeah, or it depends a little bit. It depends. You know, do we? Like everything. Yeah, do we? How do? All right. Um, thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.